It is seconds out in Singapore and round two of the T100 Triathlon World Series. And what have we got in store? Well, Fast and Furious is guaranteed. Twists and turns for sure. Would you believe it? Wet and Wild is forecast, which means we may well be in for chaos and carnage. We shall see to all of that. But it's Ashley, LCB and India Lee who lead out from one, two, three. And when that gun goes, well, anyone knows. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a race on our hands. <laughs> and she has just stunned the world. Chelsea Sedero takes the podium. She can't quite believe it. Lisa Charles Barkley, she does not mess around. Ashley Gentle is back. And a very warm welcome to a very warm Singapore, which is thankfully still dry for now. And let's hope it stays that way. But Marina Bay really is a fabulous setting for what we hope will be two wonderful days of racing. And talking of the wonderful, a very warm welcome to our two special guests, both of whom know their way around big days like this, Belinda Granger and Jan Fredino. It's lovely to have you both on board. We have had a lot going on backstage, I can tell you, but we are at the start line. And we are ready to race today, which is what everybody wants. Tell us, Jan, from your perspective, what is in store this weekend in fabulous Singapore? Yeah, it's been quite a roller coaster the last 24 to 48 hours. The athletes have not been entirely certain of race distances. Temperatures have been extreme. It's gone from, you know, thunderstorms and absolute carnage to a beautiful sunny day, slight coverage. And uh, I think the athletes have had the ideal outcome of what we can, what we can really hope for. Talk us through the field that we have today and the type of race that you are therefore expecting. Do you know, for me personally, one of the most fascinating things, we've got some athletes that have raced two, three, four times. Chelsea Sadara, for example, racing for her fourth time this year already. While we have others like Ash Gentle, first race of the year, so there's that little bit of an unknown. So I think that's what's going to be most exciting. You are, in fact, both of you are the least retired athletes, retired <laughs> athletes I think I've ever, ever come across. You spent most of the week on your bike and certainly burgers and lions aren't necessarily on your agenda right yet. But tell us, having been out and about in Singapore, how you think these conditions are going to play a part and how you'd be handling them, Jan? You know, it's quite fascinating watching the athletes the last couple of days. You know, I, I, I like to get out and see the surroundings and feel what these athletes are going through. Also, early morning kind of rides. You see a few athletes out. It's an afternoon start. And, you know, a, a few of us like to get like a 6, 7 a.m. Just turn over the legs a little bit for an early morning jog. And you can see the nerves on their face. And you can see, you know, it's, it's uncertain because these kind of races, what makes them so excited for us as a spectator is you never know how it's going to go. Yeah. Because it's that extreme and for these athletes that's daunting and exciting and briefly you loved conditions like this when you were racing how much of an advantage did that give you now let's just be let's love it might be a little love. extreme okay. all right thrive. <laughs> I, I don't thrive, think i ever perhaps. loved it but I, I certainly raced well in these conditions and i i did my my cr career was based around racing in asia and i raced very well in these conditions Never loved them, right. but uh, tolerated them is probably a better word to use. But they are extreme. And it's, it's not so much the heat, it's not so much the humidity, it's that combination of both. Yeah. And just, I mean, just standing here, we're all sweating. And it's, you're right, yarn about the cloud cover. The cloud cover is going to make a big yeah. difference today. It is a big step up from Miami, which of course was the first event of the T100 Triathlon World Tour. We're in Singapore this weekend, and then they keep coming. San Francisco, London. We're back to Ibiza as well, where we had the European Open last year at the tail end of September. Vegas, Dubai, and then it is all eyes on the grand final at the tail end of November. What a tour it promises to be. Some fabulous destinations. And if you are new to the T100, well, here's a look at the T's and C's and how it all plays out. Welcome to the T100. This season, 20 of the world's best men's and women's professional triathletes will battle it out over the notorious 100km distance, consisting of 2km swim, 80km bike and 18km run, the ultimate test of speed and endurance. Taking place across eight iconic locations around the globe, the season culminates with the T100 World Championship Finals in November. Every finishing position earns points, from one point for 20th to 35 points for first place. The T100 World Championship Finals will offer even more points to keep every athlete fighting until the end of the season. 
The total of each athlete's three best point scoring performances over the season, plus the final, will count towards their points total. The athlete with the highest points total at the end of the season will be crowned T100 World Champion. With a prize purse of $7 million on the line, it means that each race and every point scored will make a difference. Yes, points definitely wins prizes. $210,000 to the world champion at the end of the series. This, as we said, is stop number two. Let's remind you what happened in the opening weekend in Miami in March. D100 Miami in a new era of triathlon about to get underway. The first ever T100 for the women. Lucy Charles Barkley, she does not mess around at the start. She knows that Lucy Buckingham's been sick, so she's going to love that she has a, one of the world's best cyclists with her push the pace. Absolutely ruthless as we see the field getting decimated athlete by athlete. 14 ladies still on course getting down to the wire. We've literally never seen anything like this in triathlon before. What a way to take the series with both hands and rip it and grip it. And she has just stunned the world. She'll walk across and grab the banner. India Lee wins first ever T100. Yes, what a day it was for India Lee. And a quick look at the T100 standings. What you have there are the number of races completed, uh, the points and the current position. So if India Lee goes well again today, she's beginning to put a bit of scoreboard pressure on those around her. Lucy Charles Bartley looking for her first T100 win. No Holly Lawrence, Paula Findlay or Daniela Reef here in Singapore. So chances for others, therefore, and you would expect to see the likes of Ashley Gentle, Chelsea Sodaro, and maybe even an Ellie Salthouse fighting their way onto that come the end of play today. There's obviously always internal pressure for all of these athletes, but who there do you think, Belinda, has potentially got a little bit of external pressure, a little bit of the spotlight on them this weekend? Well, obviously, India Lee, we had, you know, after that race in Miami where, I mean, I've known India for a while. I know that she's capable of that type of race, but even for me, I did not expect her to take that win. Coming into this race with the number one bib, all eyes on her, whereas Miami, she was able to just sort of slip on in. But I, honestly, she, I've been spending some time with her. She is taking it all with ease. She looks fantastic. She's got a big smile on her face. So... I don't know. I think she's really handling the pressure well. And one of the great things about the T100 is that we have this season-long narrative now, which everyone is very much celebrating. Scoreboard pressure is something I presume is quite new to T T100. Well, how would you be approaching the calendar itself? Would you be picking and choosing events? Would you go after each one individually? And would you be watching what's happening in terms of the points? Well, if you look at the points, you know, there's a significant difference between first and second place. And what you need to create in a series is a difference, right? Because at the end, the grand final being scored points and a half, a little bit over that, you need some distance in order to give you a bit of margin. And therefore, you have to approach each race individually, take it and focus, dedicate yourself to it. And it's tricky to rebuild that pressure throughout a whole season, focus for every single race individually and get yourself going again. So the planning is of huge relevance here. Yeah. She's not in the top 10 yet. It's her first race in the season, of course. But <laughs> Ashley Gentle is back. She dominated the top step and the big checks of last year. She is ready to race once again. I'm going to be going into Singapore definitely with a fire in the belly and, and really motivated. For I'd love to be able to start how I finish. So to be able to come out with a really great race so early in the season, try and build that momentum and, and get stronger each race. If athletes aren't worried, I'd yeah, be a little bit offended. I think that I've shown that I am a strong competitor. She is back on top. Athletes know what I'm capable of. I'll fight to the very end. I'm someone that they have to watch on the race course. Well, Ash may be back, but India is still very much here. After a win last time out five weeks ago, India, does it feel different coming here with a 100 title under your belt? 
yeah, it definitely feels different. Uh, just the lineup here. Before Miami, I was nervous about representing myself well and proving that I'd ha had a good, good winter of training. And then lining up here, I'm just hoping to conquer the conditions rather than anything else. <laughs> Very much good luck with the race. All eyes will be on you. I'll let you get back because she's also starting at the end of the line as well. When you win one, you start at the back of the pack. Yes, good luck to Indy Lee. Good luck to Ash Gentle as well. And I just want to bring Jan in on Ash because we've been following her progress for a years. Obviously won here last year, but you just get a sense in the interview we've just seen that she's becoming more and more comfortable being the hunted rather than the hunter. You obviously went on that journey through your career. What are you noticing in the way that she conducts herself now in these big events? I really enjoy seeing her evolution. You know, she's, she's, I followed her journey for her Olympic kind of uh, uh, travels and endeavors, and it feels like the T100 is where she thrives. It gives her enough time to make up her not exactly uh, strongest discipline, which is the swim. And then she just comes into her own, and you can see, I mean, we haven't seen it as a series, but we've seen her perform extremely well over the individual events. And you can see that she's just finding a confidence that she's learning to embrace the pressure and realize that it's somewhat of a privilege. You know, once people start expecting things, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If you can coin that into something positive, it's what's needed. I've always, one of my favorite sayings is pressure creates diamonds and yeah. it, it is needed. And I think it's what's needed for her to get the most out of herself. One minute until we hand to the starter, Take us inside the, mo the, the mind of the goat in a moment like this. How would you be feeling? How would you be preparing? How would you spend the last five, four, three, two, one minutes until it was game on? Look, yeah, I'm getting used to just thinking about it. It is literally the time where all your preparation comes into it. It is essentially the worst time because you are so nervous and you feel this gut so feeling. So you did nerve. Even the great uh, Jan Fredino did big nerves. A hundred percent. The nerves are the most important sign because for me, it was always my mind telling my body that everything is in charge. but everything is going to be needed. And I tried to coin it into something that was needed in order to perform. That doesn't make it comfortable. Yeah. You know, I believe that the greatest things come from discomfort. And these girls right now, they are just begging to get in the water. Because once you jump in the water, once the water touches your skin, then you know the automation takes over and all your training comes into place. Great stuff and fascinating insight as well. We are almost ready to go here in Singapore. It's the second event of the T100 Triathlon World Series. And let's hand you over to your starter. Wearing number nine from Switzerland, Imogen Simmons. Wearing number eight from the USA, Chelsea Sotaro. Wearing number five from Brazil, Pamela Oliveira. Wearing number seven from Australia, Ashley Gentle. Wearing number two from Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barclay. Wearing number one from Great Britain, India Lee. You are now 
in the hands of the starter. On your marks! And we're racing here for the second stop on the T100 World Tour in Singapore. Official water temperatures today, 30.9 degrees Celsius, air temperatures 32 degrees, and uh, the humidity is hovering right around 60%. Because of these hot water te temperatures, extremely hot water temperatures, the swim is officially a non-wetsuit swim. That means athletes are not allowed to wear wetsuits. Historically, this favours the stronger swimmers, of which there are quite a few in today's race. And we see probably the perfect example of that going right to the front of the race here in the pink cap. That's Lucy Charles Barclay, the world's best swimmer in, in female triathlon, definitely here on the T100 World Tour. And she's done exactly what she always does, goes straight to the front of the swim and starts swimming hard from the start. I'm joined here by Belinda Granger in commentary. We'll be joined by Jan Fredeno in a second. Belinda Granger, what do you see here at the start of the swim? Well, exactly what you said, uh, the two Lucy's taking control very, very early on. We see it time and time again. We saw it in Miami. Good thing about this, this race, obviously, Lucy Buckingham, she was unfortunately quite ill going into Miami. We know that she is very fit and very healthy, so it's going to be great to see the two Lucy's and just see how much of a lead they are able to get on the rest of this group. We know Lottie Wilms is also, from the Netherlands is also racing, very, very strong swimmer. I spoke to her earlier this week and she is adamant that she is going to try and stay on the feet of the two Lucy's. Last year here in Singapore, we saw Lucy, in, she was swimming with Sarah perez Sala. And she wasn't quite as fit as she would have liked to have been at the race and surprisingly came into T1 with, uh, with Sarah perez Seller in front of her. But here we are only a couple of hundred metres into the swim course and she's actually established a little break by herself instantly. Now, one of the things Lucy Charles Barclay is famous for is her takeout speed. And you can see right there, she's got about five metres on Lucy Buckingham in second. Then behind them, the two are Rebecca Clark on the left and to the right, we've got Lottie Wilms. I think everyone considers them the strongest swimmers in the field. Surprisingly, maybe for some, maybe not for others, India Lee is next in line, fifth. This is going to be a big part of the race, Belinda, here in the swim. Does Lucy Buckingham get back onto Lucy Charles, Bar Charles Barclay's feet? She's nearly there. She's hovering right around there. If she gets them, she'll be there to T1. If she doesn't, we might see Lucy Charles coming to T1 by herself. And then what happens with this back group? Do Rebecca Clark and Lottie Wilms establish a little group of themselves? Can India Lee sit on it? Does it become a big working group? Look, all valid questions there, and I think the most important thing for today's race is definitely going to be the conditions. Now, while, you know, I, I would love to see Lottie Wilms and Rebecca Clark make it into the front group here, and we have that would be an incredible group of four heading into transition. It's really difficult to, you really need to try and keep that temperature to a minimum. We know that the temp, your body temperature is going to continue to climb as, the longer the race goes on. So really important for these women to be very, very strate strategic with their racing today. And they don't want to get that body temperature going up too quickly, too early, because you know what that's going to spell for the run. It's going to be absolute chaos. A big conversation uh, in the paddock through that for the athletes all week has been how hard do we swim do we push the pace do we race conservatively some people were sort of playing it a bit coy and i would have said that lucy charles barclay was one of them i never really heard her give anyone a definitive answer and i think we found out why it's because she had planned all week that she was going to swim hard from the start even though there was a lot of talk about conserving energy early the water's hot uh, we don't want to overdo ourselves you can tell how fast this swim is because of the single file nature of it. And not only is it single file, but there's gaps between most feet. That's the sign that the pace is very, very, very hot. We're seeing Lucy Buckingham here uh, sitting in second. She's hovering right around where she has been the whole time. She hasn't stuck right on the feet, but she is on the feet, which shows that uh, maybe it's a little bit thresholdy for her and the pace is very hot by Lucy Charles. Uh, we you know what I think, Jack, and it was, I was talking to Jan Earl just a little earlier on, and it's all about not, not trying to bridge those gaps too quickly. It's about having patience. I think today, patience is going to be absolute key. So I think Lucy Buckingham's just taken a time. She doesn't want to exert herself too hard too early because you know what that's going to mean with, with her body temperature. So you can see now, still not quite on the feet of Lucy Charles Barclay, but she is slowly but surely making her way up onto them. Jan, we're seeing uh, Lottie Wilms here in third place, and she's bringing with her Rebecca Clark, two of the maybe more underrated triathletes in the world, but definitely two of the world's best swimmers. 
they're not far off getting the feet of Lucy Buckingham here, who I would say has established the feet of Lucy Charles Barclay right now. Absolutely. It's, it, it's fascinating for me to see the different techniques of these athletes. So you look at Lucy Charles Barclay, who has this fast turnover in terms of how many strokes she's taking per minute. And um, you see the other athletes behind able to slot in with just a little bit of a longer, easier stroke. As we can see right here, this is a very controlled kind of rhythm. And exactly that, she seems to be finding a the right amount of effort needed to sit on the back. Mind you, we are a quarter of the swim down. You know, this is this is early days. And for me personally, the time to make a difference was always on the second lap. You know, you try and sit that first lap uh, comfortably as we see the athletes taking different courses here as well. And navigation is obviously a big part of open water swimming. But we can see the second group around Lotte Wilms taking a much more direct line and Lucy Charles Barkley giving away some of that advantage. As you can see here, she needed three strokes just to get back on track. So, you know, early tactics early on, but it's these kind of conditions that put the pressure on. I think a lot of people would be surprised with just how well India Lee is swimming. India Lee is having the season of her, of her life. We already know that with her win in Miami. But look at her here. In fi she's fifth. She's sitting behind Rebecca Clark, who's behind Lottie Wilms. And then we have, obviously, Lucy Buckingham and Lucy Charles out in front. But India Lee is right there with the four best swimmers in the world. And then there's a very clear, defined break of about 15 metres or probably, you know, four or five seconds to the next group. And it does seem like these five have sort of established themselves at the front of the race. And I don't know how many people would have expected India to Lee to be in there versus back in the Ash Gentle group or Chelsea Sadaro group. Well, look, there's no doubt that win that she had in Miami would have given her wings. You know when you're on a roll, when you've had, you open the season, you have an incredible race, the race of, of your career thus far. It's amazing what that does for your confidence, and I think that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing India Lee full of confidence. She's in a very good place. She's happy. I've been quietly observing her all week here at the hotel, and you can see she's just, she's in a very, very good place. She's obviously fit. She's really, really, uh, mentally, she's in a great place. So I think for me, one of the big things as an athlete, we always talked about stepping up in levels. So you break the top 10 for the first time in your career, then eventually you make your way to the podium. And that step that you take from being second, being a runner up, to taking the top step, to being a winner of a race, mentally is huge it's a huge breakthrough because it doesn't allow room for any error or you have to be on the very top of your game and you see some of those athletes embrace it differently to others and and india lee has obviously gotten herself into a spot of comfort that she's just willing to take every race by the horns so they're coming back towards the australian exit here this swim course is a two-lap swim course technically but it's a, a two-lap swim course with a little bit of a twist the first lap goes directly up for 400 metres, a 50 metre little turn, then back down for 400 metres. They hit the Aussie exit and then they come back for 800 metres into T1. The bike course, it goes over the Shears Bridge. There's three big pinchy climbs there, about 800 metres of elevation throughout the course. It's like the big decisive part of the course. It's a very, very hard bike course and it's hot. The run course, it's three times six kilometre laps, again, around the Marina Bay, a beautiful run course, a little hill at the end of it. This is where we expect the heat and humidity of today's race to really start taking its toll. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think this is where we're going to see the excitement. These kind of conditions make racing as a spectator <laughs> fantastic. They make it very hard for you as an athlete. But as a spectator, you don't know if it's over at kilometer 16. Whoever the leader is at the very end you know, could still be overtaken in these kind of conditions because it's just it's ever so demanding. As we see a first group of three swimmers actually starting to put a little bit of time, time into the rest of the group. So that is Rebecca Clark that has managed to make her way onto Lucy Buckingham's feet. So fantastic swim from Rebecca Clark. She hasn't had a great time of it of late. You know, she was, was supposed to do Ironman New Zealand, unfortunately contracted COVID, had to sit it out, but that might be a little bit of a blessing in disguise looking at her now because she's come here to Singapore in very, very good form and so far having a great swim. Interesting also to see the lines various athletes are taking. I mean, we spoke about sighting earlier, so basically that means you have to lift your head every few strokes to go and look what's around. And 
you know, Lucy would obviously be extremely used to this. We've talked about her stroke many times that it's perfectly adapted to the open water as we see her ripping her jaws apart just to get in enough oxygen. Uh, and, and, and that's something, it's just a physiological demand. The heat, what it is, is the same as altitude. It's the same as any other stress on the body. It's, it's an added stress. It ups the stakes and we can see Lucy Charles working hard. Looking at Lucy Charles' rankings as opposed to everyone else uh, in the T100 Tour, the fastest swimmer, the fastest bike rider, and the first fast, the third fastest, uh, first fast, first fastest runner in this race. Uh, I think something interesting here is just how easy Lucy Buckingham has started to look. It makes me think that the water conditions being so hot maybe have slowed the pace down. Lucy Charles Barclay has a very fast turnover and always looks like she's swimming very fast, but. Yeah, surprising just how easy Lucy Buckingham looks uh, on her feet there. And then Rebecca Clark also looks amazing. She's got a new coach. We don't know what form she's in this year. Um, I, I mean, it looks pretty promising early. Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to Reese Barclay uh, two nights ago, and he was saying that this time last year, with the, with the obviously the first year that the Singapore race was on, Lucy said the hottest part of the race for her was the swim. She felt like her head was going to explode and she was actually relieved to get out of the water and get onto a bike. So maybe Lucy's just taking a little bit more of a cautious approach, which has allowed the likes of Rebecca Clark onto the feet of Lucy Buckingham. But these three, they, they've definitely got themselves a nice little gap to the rest of the field. You do know the pace is hot though, because Lottie Wilms was definitely on the feet of Rebecca Clark. And then when we got to the far turnaround boy, she did break her to get onto this group. So even though maybe it slowed down a touch compared to what the takeout speed was, you still know the pace is very, very hot for Lottie Wilms to not also get across with, Be with Rebecca Clark. Well, Jack, I think it's important to note that swimming, the same as cycling, is much easier when you're on someone's feet, right? And uh, there is a wind draft, but there's also a water draft. And funny enough, we saw Lotte take a different line around both of those boys. So I think she may have been victim more to the thread, as we say, it, it, it just tears, the thread tears, because she took a different line rather than, you know, following the feet and following the slipstream that may have been slightly longer to swim but would have saved us some energy. And it's interesting you say that, Jan, because I was actually watching and Rebecca Clark was on the feet of Lottie Wilms. She noticed yes. straight away, hold on a second, Lottie's not taking the right line here. I'm going to just, I'm going to actually go around her and I'm going to push myself, get myself up, back up onto the feet of, um, of Lucy Buckingham. So great move from Rebecca. So we're approaching the Aussie exit here. It's about 900, 950 metres into the swim. What we've seen from the far turnaround boy to this Aussie exit here, which is about a 400 metre straight, is the field has completely splintered. It was quite close together with the seven women out the front at the turnaround boy, and now there is a massive 40, 50 metre gap for the, from that front three back down to India Lee and Lottie Wilms. What the Aussie exit here gives a chance for the athletes for is to see where they're at. When you're swimming, you're quite blind. You know where you are relative to a few people around you and maybe where you are in the race, but you don't know what's going on around you. You don't know how big a gap you have. What Lucy Charles Barclay, Lucy Buckingham and Rebecca Clark are going to see here is going to excite them. They're going to see a massive gap, way bigger than what they saw last year. It will motivate them to swim hard for the remaining 800 metre stretch into T T T1. So since I'm sitting here with two Aussies, could somebody explain to me why it's called an Aussie exit? <laughs> you know, it's funny, I got the same question all around the world. And look, I think it started back in the day, a lot of our triathlon events that we used to have back when I used to race, the Aussie exit was it was quite a common thing and it's and it, normally it was on a beach, so we, we do a lot of swimming in the open water at our beaches and we often, you, you'd do one loop swim, you'd get out, run up the beach around a, a, a flag and then back in again. So. That's the Aussie exit. I'm sure there is a, a better explanation than what I'm giving you now, but that's what I remember it being. You can see how badly the women are hurting getting out of this Aussie exit. It's quite a steep little ramp to get up. You see how much they struggle. All five, six women who have gotten out right now, they're hurting. They're, they're sort of, it sort of looks like they're laboring a bit. The water's hot. Their heart rate would be through the roof. This is one of the highest heart rate points as we see Ash Gentle just come into the Aussie exit here. I think she's probably a solid 45 seconds down on the lead, if not even a touch more, Jan. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is indeed fascinating to see how nobody's coming out and sprinting. You know, nobody is, has got the extra bit of energy. And this right now is where I think it's the time to make a break because when you get up, basically all that discomfort from your arms slips into your legs 
and you are desperately trying to put one foot in front of the other just to get back. But when you jump in the water, you know, you're trying to make that turnover, you're trying to create the break, and y you have to realize that, you know, these temperatures really are just that extreme. So we have that lead group of Lucy Charles Barclay, Lucy Buckingham, and Rebecca Clark. They're 30 seconds up out, on, out of the Aussie exit over Lottie Wilms and India Lee. Uh, Hayley Chura has also joined that group of India Lee and, and Lottie Wilms as well. Then we had a big group at the back, which had Imogen Simmons, Ashley Gentle, Lucy Byram, uh, Ali Salthouse. Uh, I'd say that's a little group, and probably the first group of chasers that have big favourites in it. Particularly, we've got to keep an eye on Ash Gentle there. 49 seconds down. That's quite a lot, and as Jan sort of hinted at early, it's usually the second lap out of the Aussie exit where the, the lead really starts to build, so keep an eye on that. Ash Gentle never takes anything for granted, and she's definitely not doing that here at the T100 Singapore. You can't just look at years gone by and past podiums and think, you know, those are the favourites. There's so many other women who have been targeting these races and are going to be so strong. And of course, I respect my competitors immensely and I know that um, it's not just a few women that I need to look out for. It's the whole field that are aiming to get on that podium. But I think that yeah, I have had a lot of success, obviously, at the PTO races. So um, my race results speak for that. Every race that I've done over the 100k distance, it just gets harder and harder. I guess um, Indy Lee should be the favourite, right? She's, uh, she's won the first T100 race of the year, so she's clearly in really good form. Um, Lucy was second, not too far behind. So those women, um, obviously already being on the podium this year at one of these series races, and yeah, a lot of girls have already raced this year, and I haven't yet. Of course, it's always nice to get one over the Brits. I know that they'll all be looking to get on that podium again, but if I can be racing in amongst them and, and, and trying, to get, trying to get in there amongst the Brits, that would be nice. So I would really like to add a bit of perspective to the swim temperature just to show or explain just how hot 31.9 degrees is because competition temperature in a swimming pool is 26.9 degrees right and when you jump in it feels a little bit chilly when you go to 25 degrees that's cold for us as triathletes you know lower body fat generally it would be hard to get through a longer swim set whereas if you get to 28 which is just one degree more it's comfortable you're in a good place you're feeling like you can go 6K or, or longer. But add four degrees to that. It is exponential to what you would think outside. You know, outside you feel like you know, three or four degrees doesn't really make that much of a difference. But in the water, it is, it, your spa bath is probably a couple of degrees warmer than what this water is right now. And imagine trying to perform at the very best that you can in those kind of conditions. Yeah, and it's going to be very, very important for all of these women once they exit the, the swim and head to their wards, their bikes, that they get that hydration in immediately. I know when you race in Europe, you normally can have, you know, maybe three to four to five kilometres before you take your first bit of hydration in. It is going to be absolutely crucial for these women to do it from the get-go. As soon as they get on the bikes, they need to hydrate. Wow, look at that. Look at how this gap has just blown apart, Lucy. Uh, just obviously maintaining that course, she, that, that pace, she was coming out relatively to, to her, it was probably not, not as hard as she could, but it seems to be a consistent pace that she's able to hold all the way uh, till T1, and it's, it's good for her to see that she has got companions who can help her hold that pace and try and maintain, if not build a gap on the gun. Uh, on the on the on the bike because they're going to need it by the time the run comes around. And I think she she couldn't be happier with the two women that she finds herself with as well. She knows Lucy Buckingham. They're both great Brit girls. Lucy Buckingham is known as being one of the strongest and probably more crucially most aggressive cyclists in the sport. Lucy Charles Barclay loves nothing more than racing aggressively, but. 
that can be hard to do by yourself for a whole T100 race. So knowing that she has Lucy Buckingham there with her, I mean, I don't think she would have picked anyone differently if she could have picked anyone. And Rebecca Clark's always willing to work. And I think Lucy Charles Barclay, I don't know whether she looks at Rebecca Clark as a threat. So when she sees her, she'll think, great, let's work together. Let's get a big gap. And I think all three of these women would be so happy with the group they're in. I think the lucky situation they're all finding themselves in is that they all need a gap. They need a gap by the run, at least on paper. They want to get away from Ash Gentle. They want to get away from Chelsea Sodaro and the quicker runners in the field. And that's generally what you need to have a magic recipe is a necessity to get away, to have the buffer needed for the final 18K run here in the Singapore Maybe Arena. And Jan, you mentioned the necessity for someone like Lucy Charles Barclay, Lucy Buckingham, to get away from the stronger runners, maybe the Ashley Gentles and the Chelsea Sodaros. We saw that the gap at the Aussie exit to Chelsea Sodaro was a minute 40 to Lucy Charles Barclay. And we can see with the cameras that the gap has extended to everyone here. So we're not going to be surprised if we see that gap at three minutes to Chelsea Sodaro into T1 here. Well, it certainly seems to be going that way. If you look at the time ticking away, you know, these three leaders would be grateful for every meter that they still need to swim. Um, they've got 21 minutes on the clock at the moment. And Rebecca Clark here, no points on the board yet because she, this is her first race. Uh, ranked second in the swim, 12th on the bike and 19th on the run. And as you mentioned, Jack, I mean, it's probably the run ranking. She's ranked 19, um, and that's exactly what Lucy Charles Barclay would be hoping for, because you've got someone who's going to pull their weight on the bike, who's going to help out, and then, on paper at least, not be a threat. On not the be run an court. issue on the run, that's correct. It's advantageous for Beck as well, though, because... She needs a gap in her head. She's not thinking, oh, I'm going to outrun Ashley Dental. I'm going to outrun India Lee. I'm going to outrun Chelsea Sodaro. So it benefits her to work with that group. There's not going to be a single one of these women who sit, in, sit on. Lucy Charles Barclay is the one who maybe tactically it would, it would help if she sits in, but she doesn't do that. We she, know that's not the way she races. <laughs> she's the most aggressive racer maybe that we've ever seen in female triathlon. She loves going to the front of races, swimming hard like she is now, dictating pace, racing her own race, even if people are around her. Lucy Buckingham has never not rode aggressively. Like She was sick in Miami. She like was deathly sick. And she still wanted to work at the front of the race. So, yeah, I, I think all three of these women are motivated to work in this group. It, it really couldn't be a better group of three for any of them. I tell you what, that close-up just then, Jack, you could see Lucy Buckingham almost taking a bit of a break. She slowed her cadence right down. I think this is, is actually a really easy swim for her. I know I shouldn't say it because it, we're still talking about swimming in 30-degree in waters. There's nothing easy about that. But just looking then at that close-up, you could see that she almost slowed down. It looked like she was doing catch up so that's going to put her in a really good place once she gets on the bike well at miami like i just talked about she was sick and she swam with lucy charles barclay she was the only person to do it and then in interviews after the race she said the swim wasn't that fast i think lucy wasn't going that fast but lucy came out and said she was swimming fast and now lucy buckingham isn't sick and she's fit and you've seen it since probably like the the back straight so probably for the last k 1.2 k Lucy Buckingham has looked smooth and easy. And you can tell when swimmers who are great swimmers are swimming easy. Now, that's easy relative to the fact that they're racing threshold, but it's still easy. But look at this on screen now. This fascinates me. You've got women all over the shop here. You've got some over to the left, some over to the right. You've got a nice group in the middle. I mean, Jan, wouldn't it be and a disadvantage for these women to be out swimming solo? Would it be better for them to try and join together and, and join forces? I've, I've ne I haven't seen a swim in a long time where we've got one swimmer off to the right, one swimmer off to the left, a little group here. It just doesn't seem like the smartest thing to do right now. Well, you know, to be honest, I think it's also very difficult for these girls to do the sighting. Under these conditions, it, it just must be tricky. Uh, trickier than perhaps we can see from this perspective to go the shortest way possible, which is what you need in this kind of swim. 
If you're feeling the adrenaline rush watching these athletes conquer the iconic Singapore T100 swim course, then why not experience it for yourself firsthand next year? Entries to the Singapore T100 2025 race are now open, with pre-sale entry saving you a whopping 35%. All you need to do, it's simple. Scan the QR code that you see on your screen right now. That takes you to the link where you can sign up. That was 35% off, by the way. What I'd love to hear your guys' opinion on as well is that I find mentally, you know, you find these top three runners, but Lucy Charles would be going into this race with a different, very different mindset because, you know, I would say that her two competitors right here would be absolutely blown away by podium. They would love it. Whereas for Lucy, anything but a win, you know, is it has got a, always got a bitter bitaste to it. And, and and in terms of that mindset, there are a few runners in this field. You know, India Lee's probably now joined that club. Ash Gentle is in that club. Chelsea Sidaro is in that club. The level of expectation, and therefore tactical play that you have to bring into it would be quite different you know as we see them preparing now for t2 um there's a significant gap that's been created but i think in terms of how you place the swim also lucy looking like she's easy um but but not taking the lead i mean you know this is uh, bucking in my mind of course lucy bucking she looked like she was almost about to swim catch up but she didn't take the lead, so I don't think it's that easy for her. No, and it's also smart racing on, on, on Lucy Buckingham's behalf, but you're right. Lucy Charles Barclay, and that's what I love about the way she races. She races to win, and anything less than that is not good enough. And she's been the bridesmaid so many times. She was bridesmaid in, in Miami. She is coming here, and she will want the win here today. It's not going to be easy for her, but she's setting herself up now to make sure that she's got every chance possible for that to happen. Look at this gap. That is huge. That's huge. I do think this is the biggest gap we've ever seen in a PTO or T100 race, uh, female race. I think actually probably the biggest gap we've seen in a men's or women's race in T100 history. It wasn't the fastest swim ever, which speaks to the conditions. Now, it wasn't the fastest swim ever, and they've got a huge gap. Like, it's over a minute, maybe even a minute and a half slower than what they were at Miami only a few weeks ago. Um, but that, I guess that speaks to the hot water conditions being 30.9 degrees Celsius. Great swim from, from Lotte Willems as we see the two Lucys off the front here. Lucy Charles Barkley already got her eyes down and uh, looking like she's in the zone. Transition about to go. And what we've got, especially here, they've got little cooler boxes where they were able to place fluids beforehand. Just another testament to how hot these conditions are. We see Lucy Charles Barkley put some ice into her suit. And uh, we're about to take on the run course and see the gap right here. That's Hayley Chura coming out of the water right now. We've got Lotte Wilms right on her heels right behind. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly there you go, that gap. A minute and 12 seconds. Wow. It has blown out by yeah, 45 extra seconds than it was at the Aussie exit. So what Jan said early, that the second half of the swim does seem to be where the gaps really establish themselves, is exactly what happens. Jan, we're seeing Lucy Buckingham be the more aggressive one out of T1. She was the, And we see Ash Gentle here ent ent entering T1 as well. And I would say that that was probably around another 20 seconds off the top of my head if we're looking at the times. And this is a good group. This is Imogen Simmons right now, Jocelyn McCauley right behind her. And there you go. We've got India Lee. India Lee's had a tough second half of that swim. Keep in mind that she was uh, about... Uh, 20 seconds ahead of Ashley Gentle at the Aussie exit and Ash Gentle's caught her and gone past her. It's going to be interesting to see these first three. Of course, my mistake was Rebecca Clark who was on the feet of the two Lucys earlier on. But these three are going to be pushing the pedals hard as, yeah, they've made the whole field hurt. And we can definitely see that yeah, the, the conditions are, are quite something. Once you get your body temperature up, it's also very hard to get it back down. And there is a long day ahead. As we see Ash Gentle putting her helmet, she cannot wait to get on land and try and make up the deficit 
she's obviously a, a very good racer and I think these conditions will play to her. What a fantastic transition from Ash Gentle. Look at that, she's coming out with Lottie Wilms out of T1 now with Lottie Wilms and Hayley Chura only just in front. So incredible, incredibly fast transition from Ash Gentle. And she continues that. You can see that she's got what we call an ITU style transition, which is the shorter Olympic distance style racing where, of course, the transition is a little bit more relevant. She actually jumps onto her bike. So she's running and just jumps on where you saw some of the other ladies they take a moment to basically stop the bike put their foot onto their shoe and then start riding um, whereas some of these ladies being far more aggressive and they would have made up a significant amount of the deficit only through a quick transition and i guess that's why we call it the fourth discipline we saw a lot of things happen in T1 there. We saw the three women come in at the lead. Then we saw really what ended up being a big second group with Hayley Chura, Lottie Wilms, Ashley Gentle, uh, Imogen Simmons, Jocelyn McCauley, India Lee, and then a little bit back, Ali Salthouse. I think what was noticeable with Ashley Gentle was her intent. Now, everyone else was sort of hurting. You saw Ali Salthouse really struggling in T1, breathing heavy like the, the heat and the effort had got to her. However, Ashley Gentle was aggressive. She showed heaps of intent and made up about 20 seconds through T1. And now we've got Chelsea Sodaro right in front of her, Els Visa coming out of the water. So that's interesting. We need to see what that gap is between Chelsea. It's four minutes, four Belinda. Minutes. Wow, that four is a Four minutes. Lot of time. We, we know that Chelsea Sodaro's strength is her run and that her swim on some races can be great, on some races isn't quite as good, but four minutes is a massive de deficit to someone like Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham. And even the fact that that's over two and a half minutes behind Ash Gentle is huge here from Chelsea Sodaro. It's not race over, but Chelsea Sodaro's day suddenly became a lot harder and we're going to have to see a strong bike and even and stronger run this from her a, to get back into the race. It is a good group of women though. You've got Katie Kivioya, you've got Els Visa very strong on the bike, Chelsea Sodaro, you can see Amelia Watkinson in the background also very strong on the bike. So it's a good group of women for Chelsea to be heading out of transition with. You can see Els Visa now, helmet done up straight out. There was no mucking around there from Els. She's a very strong bike rider. Despite the deficit, I thought she looked very much in control when she came out. In terms of her facial expression, she looked like, you know, she was happy to have her feet touch land and get this part of the race done and start the bike and start the chase. And as you said, you know, with Amelia Watkinson, they've, they've got a strong group here. If they do some, some work together. Of course, with a 20 meter draft zone, it's limited what you can do, but it'll be interesting. We're seeing here at the front of the race, Lucy Charles Barclay, as she always does, racing aggressively. Lucy Buckingham got that good start out of T1, but up on the, the Shears Bridge. So this is the first climb of the day. It's, a, it's almost a kilometer long, not quite a kilometer. It's the most gentle of the climbs, but that is where Lucy Charles Barclay has gone to the front and I mean this is the time that her and Lucy Buckingham get to work isn't it yeah interesting you speak about the climbs but it's a little bit like in the marathons isn't it as soon as there's a bridge everybody's worried about the times because there is actually a significant amount of climbing going over these bridge which are huge I mean they they connect parts of the island and uh, I think Jack we were talking about it earlier there's a roughly 800 meters of climbing on the course depending on whose GPS you trust and it, that's a lot, over 80K, that, that is significant. It's a lot, it is, it is significant. And you can see just by, the, when you looked at Lucy Charles Parkley having to get out of the saddle just to keep on top of her cadence. And you're right, eight laps, eight laps of this today. So eight times up and over that Benjamin Shears Bridge. And that is Anna Bergstrand from, uh, from Sweden, still making her way out of the swim. So a lonely swim for poor Anna. And I guess this is the <laughs> brutal conditions and the pain that Singapore can bring some athletes. We're, we're talking about Chelsea Sodaro's gap of four minutes being massive and borderline too big a gap. And Anna Bergstrom still had been in the water for over two minutes longer and looking like the effort and the pain of Singapore has just gotten to her in that swim. And it's a tough situation to be in, Jack. You know, you, you're the last out. But we can't counter out. We saw what happened in Miami with Sam Long, second last out of the water and ended up in second place overall. We know Anna is a very strong runner. She ran a 117 at the end of last year, has the run record for Bahrain. She, she can run, however, you know, that is a huge chunk of time that she has uh, just lost in that swim. Lucy Buckingham, uh, very, very uh, tender around that corner. 
But I don't know if you guys saw that on the swim extra. It's never a good sign when you get a cheer from the lifeguard, is, is it? Unfortunately, we all have those days. Last year at, at Singapore, Lucy Charles Barclay came and raced. She finished fifth. It wasn't the Lucy Charles Barclay who we sometimes see the best triathlete in the world. Today, she looks different than she did that day. I don't think she raced as aggressively from the start of that race. I don't think last year we would have seen her come to the front, ride that aggressively up that first hill. And we diff definitely didn't see her take sort of control of the race in the swim like we did here. But you can see, it, just by looking at Lucy Charles Barclay, what we're seeing now, and knowing how Lucy Buckingham races, that if Lucy's deciding to go to the front of the race like this, pushing this intent on the bike, I think this is a really good sign for Lucy Charles Barclay fans today. Jan, you've spent a bit of time around the circuit with Lucy Charles Barclay. How do you think of her as an athlete? You know, obviously everybody loves Lucy. She's the crowd darling and, you know, she's very much a very focused athlete. But in terms of the attitude that you speak to, you know, I feel like, and I'm reading between the lines here, she wasn't happy in Miami. She said she was, and of course, there's a huge added pressure on her because she's, for the first time, a Hawaii champion. And that is something you know that a lot of people, a lot of sponsors were happy about, but that also requires a lot of extra engagement, a lot of extra commitment. And you know, she was probably content with the performance because of her preparation and what she's had, but you can tell she she's having none of it today she really wants to have a go she immediately took care of her cooling she's got a special suit made for this race that is thermoregulation it's a suit she hasn't worn before and she's got the ice packs to keep her cool and you know if these two lucy's can share some of the lead um we can see some some very exciting racing angle right now gives you just some sort of an idea just how steep these climbs up and over the bridges are and as we said eight laps here today eight lots of 10 kilometer loops that they will be doing and you can see very very steep up and very very steep down the other side so great great shot now of Lucy Charles Barclay and she is absolutely flying and you're right you could see that she's coming into this race I think after Miami they would she would have gone back with the team and would have been working on just a few little tweaks we're not talking about many just a few little tweaks that needed to be made just to ensure that once she got to the front of this race that she could stay there all day and, and she really does look good right now on the bike yeah and as we're seeing this close-up shot of her if you are wondering what that yellow thing is slightly blowing with the wind um, in shot right now at the back of her shoe um, that is the rubber band that is used to keep her shoes level so that she can jump straight onto the bike and into those shoes again they're the little things that save seconds and get you to the win And we see Lucy Buckingham here still very much on the wheel of Lucy Charles. I guess what I'm waiting to see and looking at is do they start rotating turns? We've done the first two climbs. We're now on the out and back section. So this is the one really flat section that you see them on now. And if you look at the camera shot, it shows it perfectly. It's a very long, slightly downhill flat section on the way out. And then a very long, slightly uphill flat section on the way back. Sort of like 0.5 and 0.5 each way. Wow, as you see Rebecca Clark going the other way and they have put in a significant amount of time so perhaps she is paying the dividends of going a little bit out of her comfort zone on that swim early on on the bike. It also probably shows that Lucy Charles Barclay is racing aggressively and we talked about it like does Lucy Charles view Beck as competition? I don't think it really matters. She's just going to the front and racing as hard as she can. We're seeing the crossover here, which is the beauty of this out and back section. Ashley Gentle, you saw her. She just completely eyed Lucy Charles and Lucy Buckingham here. It's about a minute and 20, that gap. Ash Gentle now knows that. So what does she do from here? This is a similar predicament to what we saw last year. I remember 
uh, Ash coming out of the water, obviously quite a ways down on Lucy Charles Barclay. And the great thing about Ash Gentle, even though she's still quite young, she's been racing since, since she was 15 years of age. She's got so much experience. And yeah, it gave her a great uh, opportunity to see exactly just how far in front that Lucy Charles Barclay is. But I don't think that would have worried her at all. Uh, she's so level-headed. This is what I love about Ash Gentle. She's so level-headed. She's got so much patience and her years of experience are coming through. She won't do anything silly now. She'll just get back down in the error bars and she will just slowly but surely start taking some time. Something I'm really excited about that we've got here at the T100 Singapore today is the supernova slow-mo. Let's have a look right now. Back at the front of the race here with Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham. Yeah, and those slow-mo pitches, I didn't realise how many different techniques there would, would be from the women diving. Pamela Oliveira probably had the most unique technique, went about three metres in the air higher than anyone else. Yeah, of course. It's always the pro problem with seeing yourself or seeing anyone on camera, and especially in a slow-mo perspective, you just, yeah, you just get to see every little detail. And um, that's why I admire being a triathlete and not a 50 meter sprinter where you have to get every <laughs> single detail perfect. But it looks like uh, Pamela Oliveira could play basketball better than everyone else though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as we see the ladies here going in just about perfect conditions, we, would, we mentioned the slight bit of overcast, how it absolutely makes such a difference to the direct sunlight. But I mean, yesterday, this highway was flooded and yeah. we didn't know, and especially it's not so much about us, but the athletes didn't know if they're going to race. And that kind of predicament they find themselves in, trying to stay in the zone, getting yourself ready to race if you don't know what's going to happen, has definitely been the talk in the paddock. But it's turned out and Singapore has really turned it on for us. As we see just how steep this de descent is by how quickly the ladies are picking up pace. So we're coming to the end of the first lap here. This is the downhill section, the, the, the last downhill section before you get into transition. We look at the other side of the road, that's the climb that they're about to do. So they'll get to the end of this straight here, they'll do a 180 degree turn and they'll come straight back up this climb. The beauty of this course here at Singapore, not only is it a brutally like, hard environment to race in and, and a lot of elevation on the, on the course, but there's so many chances for the competition to eye each other and then for us as viewers to get to see the gaps like for ourselves. So when Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham turn around here, they're going to see Ash Gentle, who's a minute and 24 seconds down, about to get onto the descent, and they'll see her coming down the climb as they uh, come up the climb. So this is where I have to disagree with you, Belinda. I don't see her being very patient at all. I think she's really trying to take things by the scruff here. She's going by herself. She's not waiting for any help. She's realising that if she wants to put her stamp firmly onto the series and, and, and create a gap, She's, yeah, uh, taking it by the scruff of the neck. What I meant was that she's not stressing. I don't think there's any stress in Ash Gentle. She would have known what that deficit was out of the swim. And for some people, knowing that deficit causes stress. But with Ash Gentle and the years of experience that she's got, there is no stress. She is just doing what Ash Gentle does best. And I remember watching her on screen last year for this race, and she looked incredible. I'm seeing very much the same this year. So we've got Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham on the left there doing the U-turn section that's going to take them back out to the climb, which Ash Gentle is descending right now. Ash Gentle's a minute 30 down now, so she did lose about five to six seconds over the last kilometre or two, which maybe suggests that working together, Lucy Charles and, and Lucy Buckingham, and maybe by the fact that they also got to eye Ash Gentle, that little bit of motivation might have just given them the bit of the kick on. Lucy, uh, Chelsea Sodaro here, 
again, also looks like she might be a little isolated. Doesn't look like she's riding quite as fast as what we saw out in front of uh, as Lucy Charles Barclay, but it is very, very early in the ride now. And it is one of those courses where I think because of the four minute gap that she had out of the swim, Chelsea Sadara is really have to, gonna have to go inside herself, pace her own effort, and look at this as a very long day and play the long game. Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it's a testament to what you said earlier to Rebecca Clark falling behind probably more to the pace of Lucy Charles Barclay at the front. It seems like she's doing the majority of it, uh, similar as to how she did in Miami, but it's nice to see her taking those corners a bit more aggressively because you don't, don't want to see her give away that time for the hard, hard effort that she's put in. As we see Chelsea Sadaro heading up the bridge, she is maintaining her aero position. You know, athletes sometimes prefer to put their hand on the base bar just because it opens your chest a little bit more. You're able to get a little bit more oxygen. Maybe we'll see that later on in the race, you know, as the fatigue comes up and the temperatures keep climbing. But again, I think the cloud cover is going to make a huge difference as uh, it just takes the edge off a little bit. We were just standing outside pre-race and as soon as the sun hits you directly, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an uncomfortable feeling. You really want to try and get out, which is what we saw the girls do for all their preparation. Yeah, and it's interesting that most of these women and our men tomorrow, they have all done some form of heat prep. We know that Chelsea Sodaro has done a lot of heat prep in a, in, a, in a heat room. So she was based in Auckland with her coach, Dan Plews, but doing a lot of training in a, in a heat specific room. Leading into this race, Chelsea Sodaro told us that she was feeling good. I feel really confident with my preparation this early in the season. This is kind of the most consistent I've been in the winter off season, maybe ever. So I feel good about how that sets me up for these championship style races. And I haven't raced the 100K yet this season, but I have been working on maybe some things that were weaknesses before and hoping that really translates. Last year was just challenging for me kind of all around and I wanted to take a new approach and kind of get back to the joy and fun of racing and so that's why I decided to start my season in Australia and New Zealand so early. The races were competitive and challenging of course but the pressure was a little bit lower and there wasn't so much media hype around it. I had very few kind of commitments around the racing and just got to go enjoy the process of competing. We're professional athletes and it's our job to race and show up for the big moments and um, my coach will handle the periodization of preparing and recovering from those events. The great thing about Chelsea Sodaro for me personally for this race, this is actually her fourth race for the season so far. So we are only into April and she has already got three races under her belt. Two she won and the other she was second in. So we know that she's in good race form and just I think she, with, with Chelsea, she's the sort of person she needs to be in a really good headspace. When, when Chelsea's in a good headspace, she is an incredible athlete. And, and when you see that, when you've got the, the, the fit and healthy Chelsea along with the mentally uh, positive Chelsea, that's when you get the world champion. And I think that's what we're going to see here today. Yeah, interesting. I, I, I looked at that interview probably a little bit more critically than you. You, but I, I, you always, always do, Jan, you I, I, always I'm, do. I'm probably nitpicking, but um, yeah, it, it's really interesting how Chelsea Sodaro has different, I would almost call them personalities in different mm -hmm. interviews. And as, an, as a competitor, I would probably try and, and, and read into that. But I think the great advantage she has here in these conditions is that she is someone who can do their own race and that will hopefully come to you know, play in favour for her for the later stages of this race. Well, remember, she got off the bike here last year, five and a half minutes down, and she ran herself up into third place. She had the fastest run split of the day. She outran Annie Haug. She outrun this lady on screen right now, Ash Gentle. So we know that the conditions suit Chelsea Sodaro, and I actually think Chelsea's in a better in a better a better condition physically and mentally right now here today than she was for this race last year. So, Jan, you just said that with that interview with Chelsea Sodaro, maybe as a competitor of her, you would read into that a little bit more than maybe what, say, Belinda did when seeing it. We just saw Ash Gentle on screen. What do you think Ash Gentle would have read into it? 
All right, so here we have a pass. This is Chelsea Sabar Sidaro being passed. Um, there was almost some confusion and an illegal pass there because the athletes have been told to stay left and pass right. So that was almost uh, a little disaster. But, you know, this could be great for Chelsea just to get some help to get up the front. Well, that's Els Visa that just passed her from the Netherlands. We know Els Visa. She's been training in China with her coach. And Els was a very, very strong bike rider. But that was, that was, yeah, it was a little bit of confusion there on exactly what way Els was trying to pass around Chelsea. As we go back to that pass, you can see just a little bit of confusion there. Do I go left? Do I go right? Chelsea all the way over to the left. So Els making that pass there on the right. Yeah, that was, that was tight. I think there was genuinely a bit of confusion as to whether she wanted to go around the left or the right. And trying to remember the rules here because it's been set in order to cater for the motorbikes to get around. Um, and this is something that, yeah, definitely the, the technical staff would look at. These athletes have 45 seconds to pass each other. Oh, and look at this. And She's trying so oh, hard and missing. Can't get any of those bottles. And after Miami, this is interesting because we heard this at the briefing that volunteers are no longer allowed to move with the athletes. So normally what you try and hope for as an athlete, we call them the angel volunteers, are the ones that run a couple of meters with you just to create less of a discrepancy between the pace that you're riding at and them standing still. If you're trying to grab a bottle that would have condensation on it, so it'd be wet on the outside while you're hitting at 40k or 45k an hour, it's extremely difficult. And we just saw Chelsea Sadara drop at least five bottles and luckily getting one at the end. Not only drop five bottles, Johan, which I think one, two, <laughs> I think it was probably more like, yeah, five or six, like you said. Uh, she's down five minutes and 13 seconds. Keep in mind, she was four minutes down out of the swim and we're seeing the chaos here of her trying to find the bottles. I don't know if Chelsea Sadara is feeling on top of her form, really, the fact that you know, when, you th when you're at the top of your, uh, your, your performance, those little things like grabbing a bottle seems to be a bit sharper. The little pass we saw with Al's Visa, usually you try and jump on a little bit quicker, but five minutes and 13 seconds down now, that's a minute and 13 seconds she's lost in the first lap to uh, Lucy Charles Barclay. That's, that's, that's a big amount of time to lose early. Well, that's what she lost at the end of the ride last year. So 80K, she was 5.30 down, and now she's 5.30 down already after lap one. Yeah, and I, I actually think that was um, that was Emilia Watkinson, who is somebody who's an extremely strong rider. So it could be tough for her to keep on. But here we have the next pass. This is Ash Gentle overtaking Rebecca Clark. Rebecca Clark, mm -hmm. and it, yeah, they are in a different zip code of pace right now. I mean, a hill always exaggerates this kind of pace, um, but. Bear in mind, Rebecca Clark was a minute and 45 ahead out of the water in one lap to lose almost two minutes. That's, that's a lot of real estate. It is. And one thing I love about Ash Jen, and we haven't spoken about, we know that she's from a short course background, but she is technically very, very good on a bike. And we haven't spoken much about how technical this bike ride is. Fantastic shot there of Marina Bay Sands. One of the longest pools in the world. I think it's about 146 metres in length. Just one of the most iconic looking buildings you'll ever see. And I mean, that picture looks amazing, but it even looks better in person. I, I, like if there's anywhere you can come and check out in Singapore while you're here, Marina Bay Sands is just an amazing place. You, the view you get there of the entire city, there's such, just like such a great vibe up the top. It's one of my favorite places I've ever been in the world, to be honest, the Marina Bay Sands. So yeah, couldn't recommend going there so, enough. So I've never been up there, but I was told the other day that to go up there, you need to have your passport to go up. There, there, yeah, it's a pretty exclusive place up there, but once right. you get up there, amazing. All so right. Chelsea Sadara, who we saw five minutes and 13 seconds down, in this field, relative to everyone around her, the 13th strongest swimmer, the 16th strongest cyclist, and the second fastest runner. We're seeing that, that, that ranking play out exactly like we would expect in this race, with maybe Chelsea losing a bit more time than she would like to the front of the race in Lucy Charles Barclay, who we saw have uh, the first 
uh, the strongest swim and bike relative to the rest of the competitors in this field today. So maybe not such a surprise that Chelsea's losing time, but what we're seeing there, the second fastest runner in the field, only Ash Gentle ranked higher than her in this field today. That's where she's going to have to try and uh, make up a lot of ground in this, in this race today. Yeah, and as we see her navigate the corner here um, quite tentatively, we see Emilia Watkinson has been and gone. She's uh, up the road. And those discs, the two white discs that you saw on the side perspective from the bike, they are, they are, that's the race ranger technology that's used here. So the athletes have a visual cue of the distance they have to keep to the next athlete, which is 20 meters, in order to make sure that they are not drafting, that they're not getting any benefit from the rider in front of them. But uh, yeah, unfortunately for Chelsea, she's way further behind than 20 meters already and that that pass was only a couple of minutes ago so you know i think it's early days it's only the second lap and she can definitely find her rhythm but this looks like anna reichmann if i'm not mistaken it that is. has just come and yeah absolutely flown past her uh let's just hope she keeps finding her legs yeah it's looking very very likely like chelsea sadara is not not feeling very good right now because you could see the ease at which, which Anne Reichman just passed her. And, and even the fact that now, you know, obviously when you get passed by an athlete, you at least try to stay with them for some time just to try and get yourself going again. And I know it's difficult to do, but you use every single athlete that comes past just, just in that hope that you'll, uh, you'll be able to stay with them for just that little bit. Like Belinda just talked about, this is an extremely technical and hard course. Ashley Gentle here, like we maybe saw with Chelsea Sodaro there, a little tentative into the corner. That is almost a complete stop 180. That's not too bad. It's definitely not quite as slow as what we saw from Chelsea Sodaro, but it does show that you need to be careful on this course. That's the point of the year where Gustav Eden crashed last year. Jan, it really does look like Chelsea Sodaro isn't having a good day here today. Sometimes it's hard to tell like with speed as to what you're seeing. Like sometimes it looks like an athlete struggling, but they're not really. Sometimes it looks like they're going great, but they're not really. My eye just doesn't really love what it's seeing from Chelsea Sodaro today. and doesn't seem like she's on one. What are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing a great view of the Marina Bay Sands on screen <laughs> exactly. right now. Whenever I see this place, I think of <laughs> New Year's, New Year's Eve, that's what I see, like fireworks behind the place and just a magic place where everybody is in a lot more comfort than Chelsea Sodaro is right now, you know. It is one of the world's iconic landmarks, absolutely. And that's what makes this, this course so special. But coming back to Chelsea Sodaro, you know, this is what we talked about earlier. She's on the base bars right now, which is what you need to get more oxygen. You open your chest, um, which just physically gives your lungs a bit more space to breathe. But you can see she's playing with her cadence, meaning that she's got more turns per minute and she's really spinning. Um, and all these things are things that you try when you're not in the zone. And you're not feeling and so And you're great. not feeling crash hot, you know. That speaks to a testament, like you've got to fight. You've got to go and put up a fight and, and, and see where you can find some kind of magic. And a little change like that can often make a difference, you know. I've had races where for some strange reason, I always averaged uh, 92 pedal strokes per minute, 92 RPM. But I've had some very strange ones where I could only function at around 80. And it's just, I think, in terms of your overall fatigue, where you are in the, in the season, um, whether your taper, meaning your last preparation going into the race has worked well. But yeah, we can see she's doing what we call micro shifts. You've seen quite a few of those every time we've had a close-up of Chelsea. We, exactly what she was doing just then, she's slipping forward in the saddle and then she just goes back ever so slightly. Unfortunately, when you measure that in a wind tunnel, it's a fairly significant impact on your speed. It looks like a tiny thing, but she's got her head up. She's trying to sight whether, you know, this is, this is a straightforward out and back and what she just did then to relax into the position, I'm personally seeing very little of and I think she just hasn't found a groove yet. No. Again, lap two of the bike, but it is an hour into what will be, you know, an, a less than four hour race, probably. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's looking not too promising for the champ at the moment. Yeah, she definitely doesn't look comfortable.
So Lucy Buckingham, she's out in the front, still with Lucy Charles Barclay. They're extending their gap to everyone. Uh, Ashley Gentle now back to a minute 45. It's good to see Lucy Buckingham fit and healthy, and I can't wait to see what she's doing today. She's also extremely excited and just happy to be here at the T100 and, World Tour. And did you see on the side of the road that was her husband, Mark Buckingham, just giving her a little bit of a cheer? It's such an amazing series that elevates the sport to another level. Um, and I think the T100 distance, like, I think it suits me quite well because um, the run's slightly shortened, the swim's slightly um, elongated. So it's, yeah, I think the, the distance suits me. I get, I get nervous for every race because I think, my dad, my dad always says, if you're nervous, it means that you care. Um, so it doesn't change the way I approach the race really to be honest. Um, I know for some people it might give them like that extra boost or like it might make them feel more stressed but for me it's just like an opportunity and like it's an opportunity for me to be able to race and to, to show my best or my potential. Um, so yeah that's kind of how I approach it I guess. <laughs> I think I'm in good shape um, but it's just I know like with the weather, the humidity, it's going to be tough um, and I kind of have to race my own race um, and I'd love to be able to like go give it some beans right from the, the gun and I normally do that but I just think with the heat I have to be a little smarter with how I'm going to approach this and I'll be checking the heart rate a lot to make sure that I don't overdo it in like the first sort of hour or two um, but I'll definitely give it 100% and we'll see what happens. <laughs> So as Belinda talked about, this is Mark Buckingham uh, giving sort of direction in the form of a time gap. I'm not quite sure who we'll be giving it to. You can't read it. You assume it's to people like Ash Gentle, Imogen Simmons, Ali Salthouse, maybe even India Lee, people that they see as competition to the podium. I mean, look, like we talked about, Lucy Buckingham's happy to be here, but she's also just a competitor. She always has been since she was a kid racing short course triathlon. You never don't see her at the front of races. So, uh, like, she's happy to be here, yeah, but she's here to win as well and, and establish her place in the T100 Tour. She wasn't here at the start of the year. She's now been here for the first two races. She doesn't want to leave. She wants to be here, here all year, and you can see that. The fact that she's got a spotter out on course giving her splits to people in the back of the race it means she's not just here to make up the numbers, Jan. Yeah. You know, I think it might be interesting to know as well, whilst you're out there as a competitor, you don't actually have splits. So uh, triathlon is always non-supported. So that means you have no radio communication. It's not like the Tour de France where you've got a, a sporting director or someone in your ear who's giving you splits all the time. And then the funny phenomenon about a triathlon is that everyone always tells you look good even though you feel absolutely Terrible. awful. And the splits I've received within 100 meters have ranged minutes. You know, somebody tells you you're a minute behind, the next person tells you you're four minutes behind. I'm like, how does this work? So having a trusted person, a trusted face on course is absolutely crucial. Just to give you a little bit of perspective. I mean, for now, the girls are holding a very steady ad um, um, advantage to the second few, to, to the second group, well it's not really group, it's just Ash Gentle who's broken away from that group that she swum with and riding by herself holding, whereas everybody else seems to be lo losing to these two leaders. But similar to how we saw in Miami, Lucy Buckingham is content sitting in second place, whilst Lucy Charles Barkley at the front is doing the majority, if not all, the work. And we can see the blue light just light up it was just a little bit it just flashed red which is that disc that we can see at the back and under lucy buckingham's seat right there and that is a visual indication of whether she's too close and she was right on the limit well you saw her stop pedaling then just she obviously saw that red light start to flash she knew that she was in that just inside that 20 meter draft zone so she stopped pedaling just for a second just to make sure she could get herself out of that but yet, Kyle, Kyle Buckingham, her husband, who was the one that gave her the split, he is also her coach. So really, it's a big advantage to have someone out there on course so that you know exactly where you are. She'd be very, very happy now just following Lucy's lead up front. But just to have that, that an idea of just who, who is behind her and how far that, that gap is back to the likes of Ash Gentle. I find it really interesting that we're seeing the light flash, we're seeing Lucy Buckingham decide to stop pedaling rather than go around. I want to know if it's because she can't or because she's choosing not to. Leading into the race, she was talking about, 
I think I need to be a bit conservative. My natural uh, tendency is to race aggressively and to see what happens. But she was very wary of racing like that today and talked to everyone about how she just wants to be conservative and save for the run because she does fear blowing up. And the fact that she's soft pedaling to stay behind her, to me, says that she's choosing to stay behind her, not that she couldn't go around her if she didn't want to, Belinda. No, I totally agree. And these close-up shots that we're getting right now on screen, which are fantastic, you can see she doesn't look stressed in her face. She's nice and relaxed. She's got a great position on the bike, beautiful and aero. And I think you're, you're dead right. She's doing the right thing here. She's just, she just really looks comfortable and she's just doing exactly what she needs to do right now. She knows that Lucy Charles Barclay is doing what she does best and that's lead off the front. And she did tell me she is a little concerned about this run and the conditions, they don't suit her. She doesn't like racing in, in extreme conditions. So I think she's playing it smart right now. Jan, as a European coming over to Singapore, one of the most brutally hot and humid places probably on planet Earth, and just having come out of the, the European winter, how hard is it to come to a race like this and race aggressively and, and like back yourself and trust yourself in these conditions? So as far as I know, Lucy Buckham has actually been preparing at home and what has become quite a popular way of doing it is heat training. You basically, you think of locking yourself in laundry, turning on the heater and, um, you know, uh, basically simulating these kind of conditions. But it's very difficult to do that long term. The science has gone that way that, you know, you can have hot baths and saunas after training to kind of increase the physical stimulus that you need. But Singapore is a different beast. And Magnus Titliv, the world number one right now in the T100 series. He's unfortunately had a crash during the week, but he is still with us. And he's going to join us for bit of commentary throughout the day today and, and hopefully tomorrow for the men's race as well. We're going to have, have our first uh, little bit of insight from him here with Alex. Jack, thank you very much. Yes, we're down here at the finish line, which is a place that Magnus knows extremely well. I'm embarrassed to say we've actually just come out of the marquee alongside where so far you've resisted the urge to have a double gin and tonic. You certainly deserve one, but we'll come on to the wrist in just a moment too. First of all, just give us a bit of insight. What have you made of A, conditions, and B, what you're seeing unfolding out there today? Yeah, obviously, as you say, it's absolutely brutal conditions. Right now we have a bit of a cloud cover, so it's not that bad, but like half an hour ago when the sun was shining, it was absolutely brutal and yeah. I think it changes really quickly so maybe we will even get rain and that could change the bike completely and regarding the, the racing uh, I think everyone should be oh Oh, we're just yeah. seeing Chelsea. I think that's Chelsea Sodaro, who's, I mean, funny enough, and, and we heard in commentary from, from Jan and Belinda, there are days when you start racing and it just doesn't feel like it's going your way. We have been watching Chelsea throughout. Just give us a little bit of insight when it is a, a race like this, where things are just stacking up against you from, from the very start, how difficult it is to keep going, particularly in these conditions. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it looks like she's retiring, doesn't it? It looks like she's, we could already see, I think, from the swim, she didn't have yeah. the best swim of her, her life, and now, yeah, it doesn't look good. And, and you've had days like that? I mean, do you just have to be disciplined with yourself and say, look, you know, enough is enough, this isn't in any way what I need, or would you try and fight it for as long as you can? Uh, I think it's a fine balance because uh, the inner sportsman, you have to tell you that you have to, like, compete and everything, but of course now we don't know what is actually happening yeah. or if she has been sick leading up and like if she's racing with an injury or sickness she could if she just fights through she could potentially like prolong everything which would risk the rest of the season so it's a fine balance because obviously you always want to finish what you started but health will always come first. Poor Chelsea, we wish her the very best and hopefully we may get the chance to have a word with her a bit later on. It was interesting talking to Jan actually, I'm sure he'll pick up on this pre-race about when it begins to go wrong, particularly with body temperature in these conditions, it can go wrong very, very quickly. Have you experienced that yourself? I have experienced that a lot, both in races, but also experimenting going into this race, for instance, with like uh, sauna sessions and heat, specific heat preparations. So. There is like a tipping point of like a certain core temperature. Once you go above that, then basically the body starts to shut down. And uh, I think that's what the athletes has to kind of balance today. So uh, in my opinion, what's happening now is really important, but I think it's not until the latter stages of the run probably that we will see the decisive moves. I'm sure. One quick question about the wrist. How, how have you been treating it? How close did you get to taking part tomorrow? And um, when can we hope to see you back properly in action? 
Ah, uh, so the treatment is like, luckily I didn't need to undergo surgery or anything, so it just has to heal by itself. And obviously it's difficult to, because you want to race, so you're basically preparing and doing everything you can to get ready. But I think deep inside I probably knew when they told me it was a fracture that it would be very difficult to race. And then I tried to ride the bike on a turbo trainer the other day and it was like I couldn't put weight on it. So <laughs> it would be pretty <laughs> not a really good idea to go out there on a technical course. OK, well, the, the race's losses are gain. It's great to have you with us this weekend and we'll get you back inside for a cold drink and put your feet up in front again, uh, at the telly again. Thanks, Magnus. Thank you. Good on you. So what we've seen there is uh, a lot of happening. Like obviously we're hearing about the chaos from Magnus, you know, uh, in training leading into the race. We saw Chelsea Sodaro that we're going to come and have a big detailed look at after a little bit of a break. But at the front of the race, Lucy Charles Barclay still pushing the pace and we can see that she's built uh, on this gap. She's two minutes and nine seconds ahead of, of Ashley Gentle. Um, Ashley Gentle's holding the gap to the, everyone else behind her. The strong cyclists in Imogen Simmons and Ali Salthouse is very good in the heat. It's important to note that Ash Gentle had the fastest bike ride here last year and Lucy Charles Barclay was in that race. And this course, it does suit Ashley Gentle because of the climbs and the technical nature. But we are seeing a different Lucy Charles Barclay here, Belinda, today. She's extending that gap to Ashley Gentle, whereas last year it was going the other way and Ash Gentle had already almost uh, got all of that gap back from Lucy Charles Barclay. Yeah, I still remember I was watching and, and with the ease in which Ash Gentle passed Lucy Charles Barclay on the course, we are not going to see that here today, I don't think, because Lucy Charles Barclay, she's riding really, really well. And you, you de you're exactly right. We are seeing a different Lucy Charles Barclay. She's in very, very good form. We know that she was in good form in Miami. It took, you know, India Lee to have the race of her absolute life to beat her. And I know that Lucy's coming into this race and she definitely wants the win. Anything less than that will not be good enough. Let's be honest here, guys. This is beautiful stuff. I mean, you see her working hard mm -hmm. and she is, she's just putting all her chips on red. And you've got to love that. Honestly, like, uh, this is high stakes because if it goes wrong, it could be spectacular. But honestly, you can see her working hard and, and that's what the T100 brings to triathlon. It's the ultimate challenge of speed, and endurance and it's such a tough mix to find in these kind of conditions you know previously we've seen these kind of races but not with this depth of field no i mean you got to see of the world's top 20 uh, you, we have such a depth of field that you know it's it's unprecedented in terms of what we've seen in other races previously and lucy charles barclay is just at the front putting her head down hammering it confidently aggressively and that's when you listen to the interviews, when you see her around, it's what I was referring to earlier. It just has a different feel to it. It just has an air of confidence. You know, between her and Ash Gentle, I kind of think these two are making this series their own. Oh, no, absolutely. And Anne Houck's probably sitting at home <laughs> hating me right now, <laughs> which is also great because, you know, that's what spurs on the greats. You have all these predictions, we have all these pre-race talks and the ones that get angry when people underestimate them they are the ones that are going to come out on race day and just come hell or high water put their best foot forward well, i saw i saw a, a post from annie the other day and i think she does have a little bit of fomo not being here this week i know that she would love nothing more than to be here So we're coming into the fourth lap of the bike here. We've got Lucy Charles Barclay in front. Lucy Buckingham still sitting with her. That gap is sort of, it's, it's just yo-yoing between 20 metres and 30, 40 metres, but Lucy Buckingham is staying there nice and strong. Like Jan just talked about, Lucy Charles Barclay is riding super aggressively. Some people talk about Lucy Charles as not being the best technical rider, but today she's riding these technical sessions amazingly. The one thing that we've been talking about today is the, the race of Chelsea Sedara, and we, we saw the footage just before of her stepping off the bike. Um, it looks like...
pretty close to her hotel. That's almost like it's a tactical decision to get off the bike right near where her hotel is. Um, like she made that decision a little bit earlier. We do have the uh, tech pit there where you can get spare wheels and stuff as well. So she's looked at it. I can't see anything there that says to me technical. I'm not sure if you can see anything here, Jan. Can you see anything technical happen? To me, it just looks like maybe it's something going on with her physically or, or mentally today. Yeah, and, and you know, the first thing she looked for in this situation is, is the camera. She looked around to see whether, whether someone was there. And, you know, another important thing right here is that she heads home. That's, um, that's you know, she's talking to Patrick, who is one of the head referees here, and he's taking her off the course, which, which is strange, in my opinion. I think as an athlete, you should come back you should face the music. It's part of the pain that you need to go through in order to grow from it. At this very point in time, if I'm very honest, I think she's hiding from the emotions, which is understandable, but it's not the right move as a professional athlete. You need to grow from the adversity and you do that by facing the music um, rather than doing what you want to do, which is what everyone wants to do. You want to go back to the hotel and see no one. We just got eyes on Ash Gentle here, who's two minutes 20 down from the lead. She has actually just slightly extended her gap to Image and Simmons and India Lee, where it did look like it was coming the other way. Yarn, very interesting points you make about the mindset of a professional athlete there, particularly the stuff you were talking about with Chelsea Sodaro. What's the difference between an athlete when they're at the top of their game, maybe like we're seeing here with Ashley Gentle or Lucy Charles Barclay out the front, and an athlete who's not at the top of their game like you saw there with Chelsea Sodaro. What's the differences in mindset throughout the race? Well, I mean, every athlete goes through every high and low, right? Even I can guarantee you that Lucy Charles Barclay right now is not 100% confident that she's going to win this by two minutes. There are ups and downs and thoughts are natural. It's how much you can pull yourself back into the situation. A lot of these athletes would be using mantras to just have practiced phrase that basically reset their mindset, bring them back to the here and now and to the things that they can influence, which is their own performance. But, you know, in terms of what we saw from Chelsea Sodaro, in triathlon, I think it's important to know that much of the sense and much of the spirit of the sport is actually finishing. Finishing is such an important thing. It's what the whole sport, that's so much more connected to the age group part of the sport than any other. Um, but it really makes sure that, for me personally, it was always something that made sure that I don't have an out. It always made sure that even if I feel really bad, I have to embrace the suck, as we like to call it. I have to embrace the horrible situation and bring it to a finish because that's what makes you come through even the worst situations. And don't you find, Jan, once you do it once, it makes it a lot easier to keep doing it again and again and again. As soon as things aren't going your way and you don't feel so good, you step off the course. I think you can often see a pattern with athletes. I know Peter Heimrich went through it a couple of years ago where he had a couple of really bad races back to back and it just seemed to be an easy thing for him to do, to just pull out. And I think it's a, it's a bad habit to get into. It's, one, it's a hard habit to break. I mean, I really feel for Chelsea. She's, she's a fantastic athlete. You don't become world champion. Uh, you know, it's not a fluke. You're a world champion because you are the best. So I, I really feel for her right now. But it, 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 it is, it's a tough decision to make. And you know as, as well as I do, when you're racing, you don't race with your entire brain. You really don't. Sometimes you make decisions that you don't really... You, you, you look back later and you think, why did I make that decision at that particular point in time? So we're just getting eyes here on, it looks like the Lucy Byram India Lee group. So Lucy Byram here in the red, white and black and India Lee in front of her in the blue and white. And just off in the distance there, uh, you can you can see that the, 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 they're not far off that group of Ash Gentle and Image and Simmons. Lucy Byram, she's one of the youngest people in, in the T100 series. Um, she's happy to be here and she's ready to learn from the best. a little bit more about Lucy Byram now they're in sixth at the moment the same position she finished in Miami only five weeks ago I've got her partner Sam next to me uh, Sam why has she clicked so well with this 100k distance and she's becoming misconsistent at it too 
I think it's just, you know, it, she's quite young, so it suits the sort of step up from short distance to, you know, she's not tried an Ironman yet. So I think it's a good halfway house and she's quite good at racing and enjoys racing as opposed to like, I mean, today's a battle of attrition with the heat, but she just really enjoys being stuck into a race. So it creates good competition. And also you've been out in Phuket in Thailand as well, trying to get used to these conditions. How similar? Was Thailand to here and how, do you think it's helped? It's definitely helped. Uh, I reckon it was hotter in Thailand than it is here, which is nice. It sort of taught her her limits and knows, you know, how hard she can push. Uh, it's definitely a bit more humid here and hopefully it rains on the run. That's all I'm after. <laughs> Everyone keeps saying they've been kind of training in Thailand or Malaysia. How important do you think it is to actually try and replicate the conditions like going to Thailand or some of the athletes have been doing it at home? Which one do you feel is better and why did you choose to go to Thailand? I think you could get it right either way. You know, for Miami we did a lot of like hot baths and did it all at home and it went it went pretty well. So, you know, we spent a lot of time in Thailand at Christmas. Lucy really enjoyed it, really, you know, responded well to the heat. So so it seemed like an easy option to come there before going here but you know you can do it either way and it can be quite successful in terms of races watching it on the screen as well just behind india lee was that the plan yeah she said to her before the swim i'll let you go in front of me i'll get on your feet unfortunately they didn't come out the swim together but you know they're back to where we wanted it to be and hopefully they work together and have a good race she said after miami tactically she didn't get things right what did she mean by that just a bit of positioning on the swim and a bit of positioning and you know when to use her effort on the bike you know she had she was working with a group of people and there was times where she potentially could have pushed it a little bit further and sort of created a bit more pain and you know dropped them or you know made them work a bit harder to catch up because they then evidently ran past her but it's just learning you know there's eight races this year to choose from and you know if you learn something every race you'll you'll get you'll get good at it eventually so a long way to go in this race as well remember as well lucy's best result in a 100k distance is fourth let's see what she can do thank you sam So for the first time the whole race, are we seeing Lucy Buckingham come to the front of the race and make the pass on Lucy Charles? She's coming to the draft zone, so she has to. I wonder why at this point, we're about halfway into the bike when she's decided to make the lead and uh, make the, the move and come into the lead of the race. We sort of said this, Belinda and Jan, that it did look like she was choosing to sit, on, sit in, not like she couldn't go to the front if she want. Is she going there to work or is she going there to attack Jan? Really, you know, I think it's really fascinating to see that she has taken the courage because I think it is also a thing of courage to go out when you're sitting on a world champion. It is a thing of respect very often, and for a young up-and-coming athlete, there is kind of a barrier that you have to break mentally in order to be like, okay, she's a world champion. I can go around her, and I can take this race. And I think what would also be encouraging is for her to see that the lead is growing. They are growing from, from the back. And of course, that plays into her card. We talked about the necessity of you know, the trio that was away, now it's a duo, duo at the front. And I think Lucy Charles Barkley would just be absolutely reveling at the fact that she's got some help here. It did look like Lucy Charles Barclay was working hard there up that climb though, and Lucy Buckingham looks smooth and easy. As we look here at the beautiful landscape that is Singapore, we've got the gardens there. That's just one of the most magnificent places in Singapore as well. You can see the boardwalk that you can go and walk in and you sort of atop the tree line. Just an absolutely magnificent part of the city, really green. And I think pretty much all of us have been there this week and loved it. We're getting our first real look at, is this image in Simmons here that we're seeing? Who is just a little bit behind or behind Ashley Gentle Yarn? Yeah, it looks like it, it looks like Imogen. Um, and, you know, she, yeah, she's definitely got her in sight, which would be very helpful. And she's having a fantastic ride here. I, 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 from memory, they, they got out in a similar spot together on the bike, but they've definitely created a gap to the other riders. She's, um, yeah, about 10 seconds ahead of the group. And looks like she's having a, a solid ride while she's holding on to a bottle which is a bit of a worry because that bottle does not fit the aero cage that she has so it's a different bottle cage that she has in her frame and 
the space where she normally would put a bottle behind her seat is empty. It looks like even the one between her arms is taken and she's not allowed to take it uh, into her suit. So we've got some heart rates shown right here where contrary to what we were seeing in terms of facial expression, Lucy Buckingham is actually at her max heart rate right now. <laughs> and Lucy Charles Barclay is sitting in a fairly comfortable 80% of 86% of her maximum. But very interesting to see you know, where these girls are sitting in these conditions. I think interesting there that Lucy, um, that Imogen Simmons and Ashley Gentle have the exact same percentage of their max heart rate and riding on the same climb. So that sort of indicates that maybe they're pushing the same kind of power. This gap here that we're seeing with Lucy Charles Barclay to Lucy Buckingham, it's bigger than the gap ever was from Lucy Charles Barclay to Lucy Buckingham when the, when the roles were reversed. To me, that suggests that Lucy Buckingham didn't just go around in front to roll a turn. She went around in front and she pushed the pace. Belinda, is the mindset there when you go to the front, hey, I've got to break them now, and is this a big moment for Lucy Charles where if she can just hang on and get back on that it might sort of stop Lucy Buckingham from attacking, whereas if she doesn't quite get back on, Lucy Buckingham will really push off the front by herself? And look, this might have been the, the strategy that Lucy Buckingham had, Buckingham had all along. We're over halfway through the bike. She's been on the back of Lucy Charles Barkley the entire time, and maybe it was her time. Maybe that's, this is something that she'd spoken about with her team beforehand, that, that this was her opportunity, that when she was finally going to go to the front, she was going to really put, put that power down, and we saw that by the 100% heart rate, and really try and create that gap between herself and Charles Barkley. And look, it, it's not going to be that easy to get, to get rid of Lucy Charles Barkley. She is a fantastic rider, but it does look like that's exactly what Buckingham is trying to do right now. Feisty move if it is though, isn't oh, it? Honestly, to I sit on it. someone that she sat on for half the bike, which is 40k, and then as the heart rate suggests it, she just goes and blasts Boom. past to get a gap. <laughs> so we're going to get a bit of a more in-depth look at some of the heart rates here that we're seeing out on field. And like Belinda and Jan have touched on, that 100% heart rate from Lucy Buckingham really does suggest uh, a, a massive attack that she's put in at Lucy Charles Barclay. And we saw that gap get up to nine seconds. It's back down to seven seconds. So it does look like that gap is teetering as maybe it might get a... If that elastic does snap, it will snap. Lucy Charles Barclay hasn't quite let it snap yet. Her heart rate, 89%. It says she's a little bit more within herself than Lucy Buckingham is, maybe not quite willing to go to 100% of her max heart rate to get the gap and choosing to do it more gradually. Well, that's one thing as these two girls getting very close. Lucy Byram very close up the back of India Lee, which we can see by the red light flashing. Lights flashing. On the back. I mean, you back know, if that boy. happens in a racing situation, especially in a turnaround, that can just be if you're taking the corner slightly more aggressively. Um, but, you know, in general, I think one of the keys to this race is going to be to close gaps slowly. So what we were seeing at the front, uh, what we're seeing here as well, you slowly back off. And, you know, something like taking a turnaround slightly quicker than the athlete in front of you just allows what I would call a micro rest. You're able to just pedal a little bit softer and you don't have to push out the corner quite as hard because you need to let that gap grow uh, if you don't want to overtake. We're seeing two really definitive, clear groups establishing at the front of the race here. We've got Lucy Byram at the back, India Lee next, Image and Simmons, and just up at the very front of camera, you can see Ash Gentle. That's four of the favorites leading into that race, into today's race. I would say everyone would have picked these four to be in their top five or six. Then we've got Lucy Buckingham and Lucy Charles Barclay out in front. Belinda, with this group, now that they're working together, does it advantage them? or does it advantage Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham out in front in their group? Oh, that, that's a, it's an interesting question. Look, I think this is a very dangerous group. They still, you know, we're looking at over three minutes down on Buckingham and Lucy Charles Barclay. So these two women up in front have got a clear lead. It's actually a lot bigger than what I had anticipated for this particular moment of, uh, in the race. But uh, it definitely an advantage for Byram Lee, uh, Simmons and Gentle very dangerous group we know that all of these women well particularly lee simmons and gentle very very strong runners we know gentle's the fastest in the field so yeah it, it's a dangerous group but th i mean yarn three minutes it's a lot of a lot of real estate to make up well i'm wondering right now i mean we've still we're basically halfway down the bike 
But what do you guys think is the gap that's going to be required or how much, uh, asking the other way around, how much can, uh, can Ash Gentle, for example, close down, India Lee, how much can they close down? Well, on paper, on paper, we know that Ash Gentle, three minutes, I think it's around the three minute mark that she needs, she can't let it blow out much more than that, around that three, where it is right now on Lucy Charles Barclay to take that win. So th that's what we've got on paper. But let's be honest, uh, boys, we know that on paper means nothing here in these conditions because if you have a bad day or that heat starts to get to you, three minutes can all of, all of a sudden become five minutes, can become six, seven, eight minutes. So we do know that, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure Ash would not want too much more than around that three minute mark. And if you look at this group, so this key group that we've got here, Lucy Byram, India Lee, in Image and Simmons, and then Ash Chancellor out in front, if you look next to their name, they're all in the green, and they've all got a pretty big number next to them because they've made up a lot of positions. That's the, the strongest cyclists and climbers in, in this field. Yeah, they're establishing themselves at the front of the race, and that's why they've gone past Rebecca Clark, who was with Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham out of the swim. You can see she's lost a huge seven places. And we did talk about that. Maybe uh, her being there wasn't seen as, as a massive threat by Lucy Charles Barclay, and that sort of played out exactly like that. Jan, to ask you, answer your question, I would have said that no more than four, maybe four and a half minutes is what Ash Gentle could run down and Lucy Charles Barclay. It's at 2.53 right now. I'll ask you, what would you have said uh, before the start of, the t of today's race? Well, it's a tricky one. I mean, we know Lucy Charles Barclay is a superstar in the heat, and that's just exactly like you said, Belinda. I mean, when the race is on, all bets are off for this exact reason, and that's why this kind of makes it so exciting. And I feel that the whole series element of this type of racing adds a little bit more tension because you know in the back of their heads they're looking at one race but they're looking at the overall standings as well how you know lucy wants to get a gap out the front um, ash gently wants to be off to a flying start and ashley Gen ash gentle doesn't have that much wiggle room having missed one race already in terms of having scratch results down the line and you know, we saw there's a seven point gap between first and second place. So all of a sudden that's a new dynamic that we have. It's not just prize money. It's not uh, something that has previously been factored in. We're having a, I love these head, head to head shots that we've seen. We've seen them a couple of times already today. Lucy Buckingham versus Ashley Gentle. If you have a look at Lucy Buckingham, fourth fastest swimmer in today's field, Ashley Gentle ninth. Lucy Buckingham, 10th strongest cyclist in today's field. Ashley Gentle, second. But Lucy, Ch Lucy Buckingham is actually putting time on her, maybe suggesting that she's not actually the 10th best cyclist in this field. She might even be the second or first best cyclist in this field. And today she's taking the chance to show this. The big differential though, she's the last ranked runner in today's field. Ash Gentle is the first ranked runner in today's field. So at three minutes, I don't know, first versus last ranked runner, three minutes, probably not enough for Lucy Buckingham. To me, Jan and Belinda, that suggests she needs to go to the front like she is now and put down the power and extend this gap as far as she possibly can from the best runner in today's field in Ashley Gentle. It just comes back to necessity, what we were talking about. She needs that gap. I couldn't agree more. And the fact that she's actively seeking it out, you know, as a, as a young, understated athlete, she keeps, you know, playing down her own kind of uh, am ambitions. But you know, she wants to be there. And, that's the beauty of having such a strong caliber of athletes in a nation such as Great Britain. If you want to shine, if you want to stand out, I mean, it would without a doubt be one of the toughest Olympic squads to make. But even here for the T100, you know, to shine and, and, and feature uh, as, as a British athlete, you just really need to stick your head out and, and have a go. And there's nothing more inspiring to see. We see Ash Gentle trying to grab some water. Oh, 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 grabs it. Yes, second time around. And, you know, there's a lot of this going around to uh, into the cooling, into, um, yeah, trying to just get a little bit of a break. But we saw, of course, that litter zones here are being enforced very strictly. So once you're stuck with that bottle, this is a change that we have seen in the rules since Miami. Athletes are no longer allowed to store that bottle in their suit. So that means it's considered an aerodynamic flaring and advantage. 
and therefore athletes have to make sure that they take on the water, drink it, and throw it away. Hence why we saw Imogen Simmons climbing the bridge with that bottle in her hand. She's not allowed to get rid of it, it's just so she, she cannot discard it. And like you said, she cannot put it down her tri-suit because that is against the rules and that's uh, obviously not allowed either. So she will have to hold on to that water bottle till she gets to that next aid station. All those aerodynamic gains, hours and hours in the wind tunnel, and then All you end up nothing. holding, uh, you know, a, a two-dollar bottle in your hand that just wrecks your CDA, which is your <laughs> aerodynamic ratio uh, as determined. But those are those are the realities of racing. You know, you plan everything meticulously, and then there's a situation that happens. It's fast. You're under pressure. Your heart rate is somewhere between 88 and 100 percent of your maximum and you don't make the clearest decision. And that's why live sports is such a beauty as we see Lucy Charles Barkley here holding onto the back and, and I think doing things smartly. I mean, let's be honest, she's not used to having someone sit in front of her either. Like for her, having an athlete sit 20 meters in front of her would be a very foreign kind of sensation the way she races. But I think it's nice for her. It's, it, all she has to do now is just follow. And you know, being on the front and having to be the person holding that pace, dictating that pace, that's, that's, that, that takes energy out of you. So having some time now to sit behind Lucy Buckingham, make Lucy Buckingham hold the pace, it's actually a really nice place for, for Charles Barclay to be. Nice is a funny word because it would also be extremely hard. But this year, this climb, the steepest climb on the, on the field today, on the course today, 12% gradient, it gets to max out. So you can see on the camera, when a climb looks steep on a camera, you know it's climb, uh, you know it's steep. I think interesting of note, we just saw Ashley Gentle on camera before, we're now back to Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham. 3.15 is the gap now. That really does show that Lucy Buckingham went to the front and made a move because she put in 20 seconds into them. We saw Lucy Charles, she got out to nine seconds. She's now back on the wheel. She had to fight to get back, but like we talked about when we saw the max heart rates, Lucy Buckingham's was 100% of her max heart rate. Lucy Charles Barclay's never spiked that much, and we said that it looked like she was just holding her tempo and was gonna slowly get her way back up to the front of the race. Jan commented that that's essential on today's race. She's done that. Lucy Buckingham has not managed to break her with that attack. Sure, it's hurt Lucy Charles Barclay, but she's managed to stay there while the gap to Ashley Gentle, Imogen Simmons, India Lee and Lucy Byram and everyone else in the field for that matter has extended. Fascinating also here seeing the speeds. I mean, they're going up the bridge and according to the graphics that we've got, they're still going 23 miles an hour. I think that may have been from a little down the road to make it a little bit more comparable because of course you have some athletes on the flat. You know, you see um, uh, Joyce McCauley going over 31 miles an hour. Uh, that would be on one of the flatter, if not even a downhill section. Um, I'm, however, not too familiar with miles per hour, so I don't actually know how fast that is, but it, it's very quick compared to everyone else. And that's natural, as we see this course is far more undulating than you would expect from Singapore. I think one thing to note here with Imogen Simmons that she's made the decision to go the aero calf sock. Now, that was a big conversation with everyone leading into the race. Obviously, there's the loss of time in transition one to put them on, but also, is it just too hot for it? And is the course too hilly for it? You get a big advantage with them on the, fat, uh, the flat, fast sections. You get that CDA benefit that Jan just talked about with the hours you put into the wind tunnel. But because of this hot conditions, this really hilly, climby course, a lot of athletes have just opted not to do it. We saw that Lucy Buckingham, Lucy Charles, Ash Gentle, they've all opted not to do it. Jan, you, you, were, you were meticulous with your optimization. You, I don't know if anyone um, changed the game of triathlon more than you when it came to that. What would you have done on today's course and do you like Imogen Simmons' decision to wear the calf sleeves? Well, you know, it's an interesting call because it is tactically very relevant. We saw, um, um, we saw Sam Laidlow take that same decision in Miami where he came out with a second pack just behind and he lost uh, a time that took him 70 kilometers to close on the bike, right? And Imogen Simmons maybe would be working together with Ash Gentle right now um, if she wouldn't have chosen the, to take the time and put on those socks. Of course, that makes a big difference in the second transition when, the, when she then goes and puts her run shoes on and everybody else will be putting socks on simply because the conditions here are hot enough that otherwise there is such a large risk of blistering that you would definitely go with socks. But it is interesting, you know, as you see India Lee here 
working together and working her way back to Imogen Simmons. We're going to hear from Rachel and Mark Buckingham now about how today's race has unfolded. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I've actually got Mark Buckingham, like you just mentioned, uh, husband of Lucy Buckingham there. I just was looking at the race and I said to Mark, it looks like she's doing excellent. She's out there in the lead. You were a little bit muted in your response to me. Why? I'm a, I'm a bit reserved just because we're now hot ears here. Um, Lou's a redhead. She's 5'9", not one of the smallest of athletes. And, um, you know, the conditions don't really play into her hands. I mean, it looks great now she's leading the bike. We know she can swim and ride well. Um, but for me, this race doesn't start until about 10K into the run. We also were showing a little bit earlier on um, where we thought she ranked on each of the disciplines. And in the bike, it had her ranked as 10th. Have you been working on that? And do you think she should be ranked much higher now on the bike? Um, yeah, I, probably, yeah. Uh, I think a swim bike, she's probably, yeah, probably top five in the world, I'd say. Um, but she hasn't done many races at this level. Uh, if she gets around this one, this will be a first PTO uh, uh, race completed. So um, she wanted to come here. It was a really tough decision to take the wild card or not to take the wild card. But ultimately, for Lou ranked, what, 40th in the world, the wild cards aren't going to come that easy. So she kind of wanted to show by coming here that she could impact on the race, which I think she's shown she can do. Um, and hopefully that'll help her with future races. But this is the one wild card that we were both really yeah, worried about taking. Yeah, exactly. OK, well, let's have a quick look then as well. We have an overtake over here. India Lee is now overtaking. Uh, so she will be just going up now, overtaking Ashley Gentle there. So she'll be moving up to third. Uh, Mark, I had another question as well. Just want to go back to Lucy. This has got Mark Buckingham here. Um, in terms of Lucy as well, wild cards, explain to us how that works, how you get them. Wild cards. Oh, yeah. So wild cards, um, it's basically done on your ranking. Um, and uh, the, the, well, the last one, she found out three weeks before that she had got one. This time around, she got a bit more uh, advanced warnings. That was really good. It meant she could prep properly and use the heat tent at home and stuff. Um, but there's only basically a handful of wild cards each race. If all 20 contracted athletes wanted to race, there'd be no wild cards. Um, but yeah, luckily for Lou, not all the con contracted athletes are here. So those wild cards become available. Um, I'm not sure of the situation going forward, if it is done purely on ranking or, you know, from our point of view, hopefully it's athletes like Lou that can add to the, like, the race. and. Um, yeah, fingers crossed she'll get starts again. I also want to give a bit of insight as well. Uh, Mark's not only husband, coach as well, and I said, we're tracking the athlete's heart rate. I was looking at mine. I said, Mark, what's yours at? 110. He's an athlete himself. That's quite high. Is that nerves? What is that due to? Yeah. I think it's just anxiety. All week, I've just, yeah, I've not slept well. I've tried to keep it away from Lou, but uh, like I said, like, once she gets past 10K on the run, I maybe feel a little bit better, but Lou's got a tendency to overheat and overheat quite quick, especially on the run. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. We've already seen like a couple of real good athletes pull out of the race. Um, Ch Chelsea Star um, and Marjolaine Pereira. Um, and yeah, anything can happen. What's her game plan for keeping her core temperature down? Um, not do things like this, <laughs> not go off the front. No, I, we, we said like try and ride the, uh, the climbs. It's a really hilly course. It's nearly a thousand meters of climbing on this course over 80K, which is a, a lot. Um, and um, we just said she needs to smooth the power curve like going up the hills so basically the same power that you ride up the hill you want to be able to ride along the top and then down the hill as well um, that stops you like overheating over revving um, and then similarly on the run Lou's like she's got a super strength it's a swim and the bike but a, a big weakness would be like going out too hard on the run and getting too hot too quick so uh, in a yeah, few minutes time I'm going to start heading down the run course to try and catch her um, you know in the, in the first kilometer just to tell her to to cool, to cool things down slow things down I mean at this rate like she still could run fairly conservatively and maybe get in the top 10 which for her in these conditions would be a good result so we'll see well, let's be confident Mark uh, Lucy Buckingham at the moment is leading this T100 here in Singapore go and find her on the course thank, thank you, you.
So while we were with Mark there, we saw a couple of things. We saw India Lee first go past Imogen Simmons up the climb, and now we've just seen her go past Ashley Gentle. Interesting to see whether that's because Ashley Gentle has faded a little bit and come back to the group, or whether India Lee is just deciding that now's the time to make a, make a move and try and you know bridge a bit of time back here, or even put pressure on Imogen Simmons and Ash Gentle, who, and Lucy Byron for that matter, who she sees as her competition. I mean, that gap, it's now at 3.42 to this group. So 3.42, keep in mind it was 2.42 only about 10, 12 kilometres ago. So that gap really has extended. Belinda, we just heard Mark Buckingham talk about the heat here and the unknown of the heat. So he's he's just anxious and he's unsure and he's 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 not confident to, to make a call on how today's going to play out, even though she's Lucy Buckingham's nearly four minutes up the road from this group. You've lived and trained in hot conditions and raced in them your whole life. Just how hot is it here and just what is like how does it affect the the thoughts going through these women's uh, heads as they race? Look, I'm from Noosa in Queensland, Australia, and obviously I am very, very accustomed to the heat and humidity. We've had one of the hottest summers in the last 20 years, but there is something about Asian heat. It just hits differently. The, it's a combination of the heat and humidity. It's, it's absolutely stifling. Jan and I were outside earlier before, and as we said, when the cloud cover was over, it was just the humidity that we were dealing with. But when that sun comes out, when it peeps out behind those clouds, it literally feels like your head is about to explode. It's not so bad when you're on the bike because you've got that the, the, the wind sort of cooling you down, but once you hit that run, that's when it really explodes. Uh, all right, so I think it's very important to note here, India Lee, is the only one choosing to wear an open helmet for cooling. Well, that's a really important point. So what we saw on the screen there were several interesting things. That India Lee is the one choosing to wear an open helmet, a cycling helmet. This would be aerodynamically optimized, but it's not an aero helmet like all of the other girls are choosing, which often have a visor at the front. They're much more closed in, so she's getting a lot more cooling. Interestingly enough, I find as well the timing of what seems to clearly be an attack. She did bring Imogen Simmons with her over to Ash Gentle, but Imogen Simmons seemed to have dropped off soon after. So I do think that India Lee has had a clear race strategy where, you know, somewhere around 40 to 45k would be her time to make an attack if she feels good. And these are little details. And of course, I mean, the time is growing. Let's let's not forget you know that it's almost four minutes to this group now but they are smart tactical decisions and for now India looks looks good to me we saw down that climb moments where India Lee was choosing not to pedal that could be because of two factors Yarn, she did make an attack over the top of the climb and you did see it was quite a, a decisive little attack at the top of the climb so maybe choosing to rest her legs and, and and shake them out a little bit but also gearing choices has been a big topic around this course like because it's so climby but there's also so many fast flat sections and the climbs are steep it's do we use a 56 do we use a 58 a 54 and so the gearing choice is very interesting where you can choose some gears and maybe you climb better but you don't descend or as well or ride on the flat as well what have you heard much of this chat throughout the week about what equipment should we use what gear and which should we use and why would it affect the race yeah i mean there there are definite different different setups that you would use here um a 58 chainring which refers to the amount of teeth that you have on the chainring at the front is absolutely humongous so that means you need a huge amount of power it allows you to keep pedaling when the speeds go right up to speed but i don't think anybody here is going quite quite that extreme i think especially now with technology changing um the ratio is obviously relevant to what you have on the back as well and with 10 speed uh sorry with 10 being the smallest cog at the back that you can have these days. It just allows so much wider of a variety in, 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 in kind of setups. Um, interestingly enough, I don't think what has been become a fashion is a one by, meaning that you only have one gear choice, one big plate at the front versus the traditional two. I don't think anybody's running that here. Everybody's using it to make sure that they can keep a fluid kind of pedaling style on the climbs because we're talking about 10%, 8 to 10%, I believe, on, on the steepest parts of that bridge. And that's significant. I mean, 8 or 10%, that, that's steep. And it's not just a little pinch where it's 100 meters. No, it's more like four, 500 meters. And you want to make sure you keep 
a fluent style, a fluent pedaling style, so that you can actually have run legs afterwards. Because what it does, this kind of strength, it's a very effective training method, but it's not the best thing in terms of what uh, you can do in terms of having running legs. We are seeing that uh, there's been a very clear break there with Image and Simmons now back almost 10 seconds uh, from uh, India Lee and Ashley Gentle. So I guess now coming out of this transition zone, we'll really see whether this gap extends or whether uh, Image and Simmons can pull it back. We are seeing some really extreme weather conditions starting to roll in here uh, overhead in Singapore. Lightning is only 15 kilometres away. Now, keep in mind, if it gets much closer than that, within 13 kilometres of any point on the race course, we're not allowed to race here. We've just measured it at 15 kilometres away. It's becoming dark and overcast uh, above us. That means the humidity is up. What that says is if that lightning stays away, it means it's going to be so much more humid towards the back end of this race, particularly on the run, which makes run conditions so much more brutal. We are now ex expecting to see absolute carnage on the run. Again, I think a lot of these athletes would actually be hoping, we heard it from Mark Buckingham earlier, that a few drops of rain would definitely help just to cool things off a little bit. But of course, we've got 25K and that's for the leaders left on the bike. You know, if you look at Marjolaine Pierre, she's got an extra uh, 10 minutes at the back of that. And yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's nail biting stuff. I mean, that's what we've been going through, all of us for the last 48 hours here. You know, what's the race? Is the swim temperature gonna be just enough so that we can have a full swim course? And these are all obviously world health guidelines. And that just plays to the toughness of these athletes because we are on the very borderline <laughs> of what's internationally legal to race. And it's tough out there. But I couldn't believe the difference. I went for a, a run yesterday in that torrential rain and it was actually quite pleasant. I went for a run this morning in the hot, steamy conditions and it was a whole different ball game. So if it does start to rain on this run, I'm with you, Jan. I think it's gonna be a blessing in disguise for, the, for these athletes today. If it starts to run before they get off the bike, then that could be chaos because it is a very technical bike ride. I would not want to be riding this bike if there was if there was a torrential downpour. And it's also, if it gets to that point where it hasn't quite rained, but it's about to, that's about the point where conditions are at their absolute hardest. So it's such this knife's edge. And like Jan said, we are like teetering on the verge of this race, just not being able to go ahead because of how brutal the conditions they are. Like they're right below that point where we're still allowed to race. The water temperature, it was only allowed to be 31 degrees. It was 30.9. Lightning, it's 15K away. It's only allowed to be 13K away. All of this, it just speaks to how crazy this, this place we are is. Welcome to racing in Asia. India Lee here taking charge and, you know, she's worked herself onto the virtual podium for now. She's in third place, uh, taking Ash Gentle with her, uh, creating a little bit of a gap to the ones behind her. And again, um, she would definitely be appreciating the cooling that she gets around her face and neck right now, simply because her helmet is, yeah, just a, a little bit more open and designed for airflow versus the other ones just being 100% aerodynamically optimized. I think it's an incredibly, incredibly smart move on behalf of India Lee. And it's great, she's slowly but surely made her way through the field. And like you said, third place right now, and looking, still looking so incredibly strong, if not looking stronger than she looked at the beginning of the bike. So she's, she's looking like she's actually getting faster as this bike ride goes on. And the others are literally trying to, to stay with her. You can see now that group of four, you've got Lucy Byram on the back, you've got Imogen Simmons just in front, Ash Gentle, and India Lee really driving this train right now. Only two women ahead of the two Lucys. As we see Lucy Byram here, well and truly within the zone, she was sitting on the on the red flashing light of Imogen Simmons, um, which just indicates that she's sitting a little bit too close. Or oh, she takes that corner a little bit too early, heading the apex just a little bit too soon and not getting a smooth run through it. Well, that will um, put her right back into the legal limits. And we see this group of four. Oh, Ash Gentle also sitting very close to this technical section, which just speaks to how much she can get a rest and yeah. 
Lucy Byram yarn, as we, we just saw, she looked like she was hurting through those corners and like getting back up here is hard. And you can see her heart rate 95% in the red zone. Funnily enough, the women out in front, Lucy Buckingham and Lucy Charles Barclay, 89% and 85%, and they're putting time into this group. They're 415 ahead of this group right now. And you see the heart rates of all of these women in this group. India Lee, the lowest did 90. Ash Gentle, 92. Imogen Simmons, 91. Lucy Byram, 95. These girls are working hard, and Lucy Buckingham and Lucy Charles out in front are working easier, but bridge, building time. And it's always hard when you're the last on the group where we can see Lucy Byram at 95% heart rate because when you, when you go around the technical uh, parts of this course and you're on the back, you know, you come around for, out from a corner and you've got to get out of the bars and sprint just to get back up there. And that's why I think we're seeing Lucy Byram's heart rate starting to get up around that 95 and above mark. But you're right, Lucy Buckingham, Char Lucy Charles Barclay, they are in control, they are in their groove, they're in the zone, whereas these other women are all chasing because they probably, I'm sure they know what that limit, what that gap is, and they are trying desperately to get it back down. Jan, we talked about how big a gap does Lucy Charles need, and I guess we can throw Lucy Buckingham into that equation now. She's, they're four minutes and nine seconds ahead of India Lee, four minutes and 12 seconds ahead of Ash Gentle, four minutes and 17 seconds ahead of Imogen Simmons. Where's your head sitting about how big a gap they need and how big a gap they can chase down now? Well, if I look at uh, Lucy Charles Barclay's body position and how much her upper body is starting to sway, she's really looking like a boxer in the late stages um, of a fight. You know, she's, she is definitely going to the limit and, and, and taking a lot of risk here as well. I think Lucy Buckingham is obviously just pushing the pace so relentlessly that maybe she's creating some kind of fear of missing out. <laughs> you know, she, Lucy Charles Barclay just definitely does not want to be bridesmaid uh, on, on, on this part. But again, that's what is so exciting about these conditions. You can literally come to a standstill because you're getting a cramp so much easier than any other race. And it's difficult to judge because, you know, there are exceptions. We don't race in this all the, all the time. And if you have a cramp and you're standing there, that could be, you know, uh, 15 seconds, but it could also cost you a minute. And that's why we see the athletes right here, Ashley Gentle, we had the shot earlier as well, taking in gels, taking in nutritions. Some of these would contain an elevated amount of sodium, although I find it very interesting <laughs> that Ash Gentle, for all of her aerodynamic optimization and choosing a helmet that's fine-tuned, has her gels taped to her top tube, um, that's something we see less and less of because, you know, most of these bikes allow for storage that is also aerodynamically optimized. But yeah, she's getting in the calories, she'd be getting in some salts and making sure that, yeah, she keeps being prepared for what is surely going to be a brutal 18k run. As we see the ladies heading over to, uh, towards the Marina Bay Sands uh, once more, the pace is honest. I don't think Lucy Charles Barkley has come closer than 30, 40, maybe 50 meters. I mean, she's sitting very conservative. Obviously, you want to avoid getting a penalty, but generally, you know, referees speak out a first warning. I mean, she is definitely playing it very safe from that perspective. But we see her working hard, and that's sometimes, you know, you, you, you can't be 100% sure in terms of heart rate readings, and you can't also be 100% sure that heart rates are going to be the same on race day every time. You know, the thing is that you come in well rested, which means that very often the testing you would do in order to provide your maximum heart rate would be during a training phase, which is generally when your body's suppressed and, you know, those heart rate beats might be a few beats off. But it definitely, in terms of body language, her effort looks far more than the 85% we're getting shown on the heart rate graphics. But that's, again, the beauty of racing, that there is still a lot of merit. But despite all the new technology and despite all the wearables that athletes have, more and more data and more and more information, um, there is just a purity to this that you know, you got to know your body and you have to know it well, you have to be able to judge your feelings, you have to be able to put it into perspective. And in the end, a win is as much a thing of self-control as it is of a measured effort. And yeah, I'm looking on screen now, obviously, with the two Lucys. Both of these women have raced this year. We know 
that India Lee also has raced, Lucy Byram has raced, Els Visa, who's riding very, very well now up into seventh place, has also raced. But then you look at the, the likes of Ash Gentle and Imo Simmons. Neither of these women have raced this year. This is their first race of the season. Would there be an advantage, obviously, for Buckingham and, and Lucy Charles Barclay? Because you know as well as I do, you can do all the training in the world. You can have race-specific sessions. But to actually race, to get out there and, and put it all on the line, there's a huge difference. Uh, to be honest, it's a fine art. I mean, that, that's the beauty of this kind of, um, of this kind of racing. It just really is something that more experienced athletes obviously nail over a long period of time where you get to know your body and you get to know your few key sessions that you kind of, you can judge what kind of feeling you're at. But I think less and less of this is being left to chance because it's not just a one-off race. There's a lot of effort traveling to Asia all the way. You want to get into a race and you want to make sure you capitalize on that because it's a lot of preparation that goes in and there's a lot of time that goes and that's why you know we're looking for an overall champion as well as a T100 Singapore champ. Jan, given that there were so many briefings this always oh, we just quickly have a look here at the time gaps given to Lucy Buckingham and uh, Lucy Charles Barclay so now they definitely know that Ash and Indy are 4.15 back that's such good information for them and positive affirmation for them to keep on pushing as they are going, growing that gap. It's actually at 4.30 now, so that's an extra 15 seconds. Yeah, because of the, the week that we've had, the, all the race briefings we've had about the conditions on course, no, these women, they now know that if there is lightning inside, if you see it, and when you come to this top of this bridge, you get a full 360 degree view of the entire course. You can see the, the sort of thunderous lightning looking rain clouds out the, the back of them. If they see a lightning strike, would any of these women go, okay, now's the time, let me go and get out the front of the race so that I'm higher up, just in case the race does get canceled today? Well, to be very frank, I'm not familiar with the situation of what would happen to the points. I don't know if it actually would be considered a finishing standing. Um, also, bear in mind that we've had a lot more detailed information than these ladies have had. I've, I've spoken to a lot of them. And the fact is that, for instance, the water temperature gets taken one hour before the start. And they are not being confronted with the literally... 40 measurements that have been taken daily to find out whether we are 0.1 degree within the limit or 0.5 over it, which has actually been the case. It's, it's been changing that much. And of course, you know, the officials try and keep that information from the athletes because you don't want to go stir crazy either. So, you know, we'll have to go and look in the rule book and see what happens if a race is actually cancelled this late into a stage. But, you know, I've got my fingers crossed. It's turning a, yeah, to be a bit of a nail biter in terms of the actual performance. But it's turning out, you know, to be to be tied in terms of uh, the conditions as well. As we now see beautiful sunshine on this bridge, the sun just burning down on these athletes. And what a fantastic shot of our two lead women right here on screen. And and just to clarify, the rule now it has changed from last year with in terms of lightning. It's lightning within 13 kilometers of the race venue. So it's not from where they are on course, it's from the race venue where we are here in the booth, which is at the race venue, it's 13 kilometers. We're just having a look here. Lucy Buckingham appears to be cramping potentially. Oh, no. Something's going on here. We need to get a bit of a close up of this. It looks like she's trying to stretch out a glute or a hamstring or a quad, particularly maybe on that right hand side. Jan said it before, at any moment you can cramp on this race and you have to go, oh, it's the left, it's the left hammy. Left hamstring has cramped on Lucy Buckingham there. We saw Lucy Charles Barclay go around in front of her. It's exactly like you called, Jan. This is, I mean, this is the jeopardy of racing in Singapore. It looks like everything can, can be going well. Everything looked like it was going perfect for, perfectly for Lucy Buckingham. Her, her partner, Mark, Coach Mark, refused to say anything before 10 kilometers to go in the race. We're seeing now why. But look at that, she's just, it, it can happen at any moment, at any time. You, we've seen it happen with Christian Blumenfeld here before. So, but all she needed to do was just stop pedaling, stretch it out, be patient, don't stress, don't get upset about it. And look, she's already back on track. But you saw that Lucy Charles Barclay took that opportunity immediately to take the lead, to keep that pace going. But it looks now like she's got it back under control. But yep, as Jan said, welcome to racing in Asia. Yarn, there's two reasons why you can cramp. One of them is because of salt loss, sodium loss, 
because of the heat and the humidity. That one's tough to come back from. There can be some others where the position's just maybe a little bit off and you're not used to it. Do you think this is because of the conditions or because of the position? You know, I, I would say the simple reason is fatigue. Muscles cramp physically when, when they are empty, when, they, when, when the muscle is overused, when there's uh, too much stress on the muscle. And we've seen this with other competitors. But I'm going to throw another one at you guys. What do you think? Maybe she was just pro throwing a tactical move. She's attacked. <laughs> she's created the move. She's like, look here, Lucy, you, you, you take the lead. <laughs> I've done my bit. I'll go sit on the back. <laughs> Yarn, if she's done that, she's a tactical genius. genius. I mean, she's like her husband said, she's a pale redhead from Great Britain. I mean, it... <laughs> he <laughs> is sleeping in the doghouse tonight, <laughs> for sure. Uh, she looks like she's come back strong, like she you does. said, though, Belinda. You yep. said, like, it looked like she's got on top of it. I guess the true test of this will be the run. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's two, it's two laps to go. I mean, on the bike, it's also the easiest to, to shake out that kind of cramp, um, especially... You know, because you can alternate. On these pedals, of course, the shoes are attached firmly to the pedals. And that means that you can pull up, which would definitely be the, the stress on where she's had a cramp. Like we talked about earlier, if you're enjoying what you're seeing, if you want to take part in this brutal race, this epic race course at this picturesque location here in Singapore at the T100 World Tour, come and join us in 2025 scan the qr code that you see on your screen right now when you scan that it takes you to a registration page where you get 35 percent off your race entry for next year yeah but she uh definitely looks like she's on a mission as uh we see the water feature here one of the many tourist attractions in the marina bay sand I think that's the best thing about Singapore yarn is like the race is amazing. It's the most brutal course we have, but you come here for a week and you just have so much fun all week. There's so many fun things to do and great things to see. And I mean, culminating with a race like this where we're already start starting to see a little bit of chaos unfold, this group of Lucy and Lucy bridging the gap to, I mean, extending the gap to 4.30 to the women behind them. Now Lucy suffering from the effort. We saw her heart rate go up to 100% before when she put in the attack. Clearly it's taking its toll on her. Yeah, Singapore, it's just a great week and, and watching the athletes put it on the line here in these brutal but beautiful conditions is, uh, it's just fun. Yeah, I think the athletes would be veering away a little bit more from the food markets, the local food markets that we've been <laughs> able to enjoy and indulge in. Maybe but too uh, tonight, I can tell you what, there's going to be uh, some spicy curries and local food indulged on and, uh, and probably binged on. But <laughs> I come back to my claim, I mean, I mean, obviously, I say this in tongue in cheek, but Lucy Buckingham is right back. She's sitting at a draft legal, but you know, more aggressive kind of zone than than Lucy Charles Barclay was. And I think this may be a little bit of a blessing in disguise as well for them overall, because the pace was hot. We could see the time gap just blowing out to the others. And of course, they're very strong athletes and they're on a mission. But physically, there is just a limit in terms of well, how much of a gap you can actually create. And that gap, it is nearly up to five minutes still. So even though Lucy Charles Barclay has gone to the front, they're still extending and it's nearly five minutes. And again, another great shot of downtown Singapore. Beautiful buildings. I have, I've had a good chance to have a look around and I just, I love for such a big city, it's so incredibly clean and so incredibly organized. The roads are spectacular. Great coffee scene now. I haven't been to Singapore for quite a few years and you know, wonderful coffee scene. We've been lucky enough, but you can see now, Lucy Charles Barclay still out in front, Lucy Buckingham. I was looking her facially at her when she suffered that cramp and, and apart from the cramp itself, she still looked like she was really in control. It's, I don't think, I, I think it's just unfortunate she got that cramp. Maybe she needs to get a little bit more salt in, but it doesn't look like she's pushing the envelope too far.
No, you can tell her definitely she's she's what we call soft pedaling. She's leaving out yes. and taking a half-hearted pedal stroke every now and then just to make sure she doesn't get too close. She does have the visual reference. We saw the red light up, so we know that she was very close to being within the 20 meter zone. And I think it's probably just given her, given her enough of a fright to play the game a little bit more conservative you know, she's gone out and now she's probably taking the first bit of nutrition she has because she was just yep. flying so high, you know. So great to see Els Visa. We know, I, I spoke about her before, really strong bike rider. She sometimes gets a little bit left out of, of races just because she's not the strongest of swimmers, but she is a very good bike rider. She's technically very good as well. Strong Fantastic runner. In the heat. And does and can handle the heats. Come from China, she's been based in China. She did spend a little bit of time in New Zealand. She was second at Ironman New Zealand not so long ago, but has been based in China since then. But great position on the bike. And look at that, she has caught that group in front. So she's now riding in that group with Lucy Byram, India Lee, Imogen Simmons and Ash Gentle. So she has done a really superb job in catching these women up front. Well, seventh out of the water and 17th is her rate uh, is her swim ranking so she's obviously made up a good few spots we can see actually she's made up seven spots on the graphic right there and you know that's what you want to see i mean from the lady who's probably got the most interesting backstory in all of the field and it's interesting while we see els Vizan not content with sitting on you know it's funny she's just worked all the way up to this group and she's like well i'm not sitting here i'm going to go straight past lucy barham she is not content to just sit there she's a very aggressive rider Great to see you having a good race today. And another one worth mentioning on screen, you can see just on screen with our graphic below, Visa is Anne Reichman, also renowned for being incredibly strong on the bike. And she's moved up 11 spots. So both Els Visa and Anne Reichman really riding very, very well on course. And she takes the next victim here with India Lee. And interestingly enough, she chooses tactically very smart positions. So you could see that the overall course was veering to the left the athletes have to stick to the right and she, that allowed her to cut through the corner and basically make that pass without overexerting herself. So if you're trying to do a pass within 45 seconds, it normally means you have to put on a lot of extra power. And Els Visser is ripping through the field here currently. As we have a look at Els Visser attacking up here up the climb, she went straight past India Lee there. And it's funny, because she went around her and Lucy Byram stuck with her, we saw that sort of drag her past India Lee as well and India Lee be the one to fall back. This group here is now really interesting as to whether Al's Visser goes to the front of it and actually helps them bridge the gap and Alice Gentle and Imogen Simmons therefore get a little bit closer to Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham out in front or whether she just goes straight past them and they can't hold on. Interestingly, I just got a message actually from Mark Matthews, who's Cat Matthews' husband, and he has been telling me that uh, India Lee, along with Cat Matthews, have done some testing in the meanwhile as well uh, on terms of um, getting some more data. And actually, that helmet it was only perceived to be 30 seconds slower over the ADKs really? versus other helmets that would be far more aggressive in that department. She's dropped back so much there up that final climb that we've just seen of this lap. You can see that gap is probably 150 metres and that's all because of that move of Al's Visa, which Lucy Byron was able to sit on the back of. India Lee is now teetering off the back of this group. We've, she's got the long downhill stretch and flat to get back on. But this could be a decisive moment for India Lee's race and whether she can get back up to this group or whether that was the moment and Al's Visser has really hurt India Lee's race here. Jan, I told you earlier, I love the supernova slow-mo shots. I love them. I cannot get enough of them. I want to see more.
Imogen Simmons definitely my favorite out of that sequence, just coming in hot through <laughs> the Walking right through hand that corner. corner. Yeah, gotta love a supernova slow mo. We love the supernova slow mo. <laughs> this gap's at five minutes now, Jan and Belinda. Five minutes they've got over Ashley Gentle and Imogen Simmons, and now Al's Visser and Lucy Byram. I'm gonna throw to you again, Jan. Five minutes. Is it is it enough? Is it too much? Well, you know, I'm renowned to be particularly bad at making predictions, but five minutes, we're starting to get to a point where Lucy Buckingham is in a position to hold perhaps a little bit more than what Mark said, if that cramp doesn't exaggerate things too much. But five minutes, you know, we're looking seven and a half minutes to stay within the top ten. I mean, it is that, that, that's a big gap, and if you would have looked at any of the pre-race kind of predictions no one would have said that Ashley at any stage of any race would be five minutes behind the leaders especially not without Taylor Nip here I think we can see it the, if you look at the live leaderboard now India Lee did get broken by that Al's Visser move worth noting between Miami and Singapore Lucy uh, India Lee she, she won Miami she was sick for two weeks following Miami maybe the come down from all the extra pressure and media evolved with it but might be something to keep an eye on here And I think that just speaks to the nature of the T100 tour. We're seeing Lucy Buckingham out in front again, just like she was in Miami. This time she's healthy. In Miami, she was sick. We saw India Lee win at Miami. Now she's sick and sort of fading back towards the end of the, the race. The T100 series, it is a brutal tour where you just have to have everything right, right if you want to win. But welcome to the world of uh, being a professional athlete, Jack. That's just, it's part and parcel. You know, we talk about you know, the training, we talk about nutrition, but treading that fine line between pushing your body to its limits, but not over the top so that you end up sick, it's, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do. I don't think there's one professional athlete on the planet that can actually say, I've nailed it. We've all been in that situation before where we've just, we've just done that one extra session that we probably shouldn't have done. We haven't got enough sleep or we've stayed out late or we, we've had some alcohol when we shouldn't have. You know, there's all these things that we, you know, would have, could have, should have. And it's a very difficult game to play. And no one, even the great king sitting beside me, Jan Fredino, I mean, we know that you've been in the same boat. It's, it is probably, in my eyes, it is the hardest part of being a professional athlete is to stay, one, uninjured, and two, not getting sick. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a true. The older you get, the, <laughs> the more the injury management becomes a huge factor of time because, of course, that means, you know, you're training, say, 30 to 35 hours a week, but then all of a sudden you have to add another 10 hours of physiotherapy. And that, you know, I was fortunate enough for a long time to have a physiotherapist that, that, that stayed with me, but otherwise you have to consider that every time you go there, it takes probably two hours of your day by the time you've gone there and got your appointment and gotten out. So, you know, injury management is absolutely key because consistency is just so much import more important than it ever was. You know, athletes used to take a mid-season break. Athletes used to be able to, you know, just lay off for a little bit. But the season starting relatively early in, in March, that for us is, is, is early or, or, or April, and then going all the way into November. I mean, these are long seasons and, you know, that becomes a huge factor for all these athletes to consider. Jan, Lucy Buckingham has 17 athletes in this field who are ranked higher than her on the PTO World Rankings, and yet she has the bravery and the courage and the ability to be at the front of this race. Do you remember a time in your career where you were just establishing yourself, you weren't the best in the world yet like you ultimately became, and you are in Lucy Buckingham's position, and just does it is it courage is it talent what makes her you know be able to be at the front of the race even though she's the 40th ranked athlete in the world well there's several elements to this i mean to be very honest it's also the only card she can play i mean she is a swim bike specialist and that's what she does really well and needs a bit more time to refine her run i think but yes of course it's what her husband also uh, uh, mark was also hinting towards that she wants to leave a mark she wants to prove herself she wants to show the world that she deserves to be here and she's doing exactly that. And, you know, I find her overall kind of the impression that she leaves here 
something very inspiring, something wonderful. Oi, as we get pictures, the first pictures of Els Visser, who is coming in and the last lap of the bike, working her way right up and overtaking Ash Gentle. And look at the difference in cadence right between, between these two athletes. You've got Ash Gentle, much, much faster cadence. Look at the grind, look at the gear that Els Visser is pushing, right, staying down in those error bars, but she must have a cadence of around Oh, I don't know, 70 to 80 right now, but a really slow cadence when you compare it to Ash. So cadence is a little bit more relevant in terms of the revelations, the, the, this, the, the turns that you do per minute. In terms of, you know, the general logic says that if you have a fluent cadence around 90 to 100 perhaps, it's ideal for your run legs. But of course, what a lower cadence does is it requires more strength but it does keep your metabolic demand down, meaning that your heart rate stays lower, which is ideally what you want in these kind of conditions because muscle fatigue is one thing, but really the biggest problem you're dealing with is your system overheating. It's, you can consider it like a fever, and you know athletes these days have trackers that can tell you body core temperature, and once that gets within 40 degrees, it's very, very tricky to get it back down. Looks like right now we have an, a, a lapped athlete. On this particular course, it doesn't matter if you get lapped, so even though they are now lapping one of our athletes out, she will not have to go off course. She'll be able to stay on and, and continue with the race. And the reason that's relevant is, of course, that everybody who finishes here Gets makes points. prize money. Prize it's, money and points. You know, it's a little bit like at the tennis majors. If you're a first round loser, you, you get a you get a paycheck. Of course it's it's small relatively com compared to what the winners make. But everybody who comes here and finishes gets at least two and a half thousand dollars to take home. And that's relevant for some of these athletes. And we saw Anna Berkston be the one to get past there. She was who we saw come out of the water seven minutes back and yeah, the pain of Singapore was just clearly getting getting on top of her. She was a um, a 70.3 champion as well. So she's a 70.3 champion as well, I should say. So it just goes to show you that she's 10 kilometres behind on the ride now, but she's a 70.3 champion. It does show the level of these races here at the T100 World Tour. As we just see Lucy uh, Buckingham here teetering again, she, you can tell she wants to go past. But the other thing that this graphic right now is showing us that Marjolaine Pierre has also pulled out uh, of the race. She is a DNF, so there's 18 ladies left fighting for the T100 crown, and we have a third and fourth place. Els Visser taking, you know, this race as, as good as she can. I think she would be one of the most experienced athletes in the heat, preparing in China, something I haven't really heard of, but I guess that's due to her coach. And Ash Gentle trying to go with her, probably grateful that she's got somebody to pull her a little bit closer to the top two. Well, it's what we talked about at the top of the climb yarn when Als Visser did go past um, that group with Ash Gentle. Would she take any of them with her or would she just go to the front and they drop off? It turns out Ash Gentle was the only one who was able to come with her and Imogen Simon in fifth here and Lucy Byram in sixth weren't quite able to go with the move of Als Visser. Ash Gentle the only one able to. That suggests that Ash Gentle's legs are feeling a little bit better than Imogen Simmons, Lucy Byram's. And it looks like Els Visser and Ash Gentle are, you know, they're the ones who might be the threat to Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham out in front. We know Ash Gentle's one of the best runners in the world. Els Visser, not renowned as one of the best runners in the world, but for the last six months, that's the big thing she's been working on with her coach. They've been putting tremendous amount of work into her run. A lot of run volume, a lot of running in the heat, a lot of really hard sessions. She has shown it in the last six months in races that her run is better. I guess today is going to be the real test of that though, Belinda. No, absolutely. And, and Jan and I were talking earlier about what's the best what's the best athlete for these conditions. And the one thing that we came up with, with it, the fitter you are, the easier that you will be able to deal with the conditions that are that are on display here today. We know that Els Visa is in really, really good form. Uh, she's very, very fit. We know that the, the sessions she does with her coach are ridiculously hard. She's been with her coach now for the last few months in China. So she's been used to these conditions, but she's also been putting out some, put it, doing some really, really big sessions. So I know that Els Visser is coming into this race very, very fit. She's made up 11 places. Look at that on the graphic now. You can see that she's made up 11 places. Top mover along with Anne Reichmann, who's also worked her way into the top 10. And, you know, uh, if you looked at the predictions, that's, that's very good as it stands right now. But I think her whole physique 
generally would be complementing these kind of conditions. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, you know, if this was a cold, rainy race in Kitzbühel, uh, I probably <laughs> would be a little bit more concerned about it. But it's just something, you know, that speaks to the uniqueness of this series. Because we have eight races and they are all over the world, plus the grand final that we're going to have. And it just demands a complete athlete. I mean, these... Comp these so you can see now Lucy Barham overtaking Imogen Simmons. So these two were dropped from that group once Elsvisa caught them and went flying through them all. So these two riding by them. So you can see just up the road, you could see Ash Gentle and Elsvisa, but these two riding well together. But Lucy Barham obviously not content with sitting back there. She wants, doesn't want that gap to open up too far. Yeah, and interestingly enough, I mean, these days fabrics are so much more sophisticated and all these suits, they have cooling technologies and, and fabrics that dry particularly quickly. Um, but the fact is that uh, Imogen Simmons is racing in a black suit or in a dark blue suit. And that's something when the sun comes out here, um, yeah, personally a choice I always made differently in my life. But Els Visser is definitely timing this ride to perfection. I mean, she's left her surge late and she's working her way to back to the front. And you know what I love about Els Vizzo? She has such a, an incredible, fascinating story. We know that she's a shipwreck survivor. So back before she even knew what the sport of triathlon was, she was on a, a ferry in Indonesia that sank. I, I still get goosebumps when, she, when, when I, she tells me the story about how they were drifting around in the middle of nowhere not content to just stay out there you know her and a friend made their way to an island they swam their entire way to the island they were obviously finally rescued but absolutely incredible and to think now she's also a doctor as well yeah she was a practicing doctor before right and absolutely, came yep. to triathlon thinking this can't be everything in life but look at that swim of 17 17th best swimmer ranked 11 on the bike and 14 on the run. Now those, those statistics we're seeing on screen now are definitely not what we're seeing with Els Visa. She is well ahead. So, you know, coming into this race, her ranking was 17th best swim, 11th best on the bike and 14th best on the run. But she's showing us of this particular field racing of the 20 women racing, but right now she's showing us she is top three on the bike. Uh, and, and maybe even better because she is riding so, so well. So I can tell you that uh, w we have someone called Torsten Radder. He gives us all these stats and he has Excel sheets to calculate all these things. But I can tell you that he was one of my most infuriating <laughs> motivations as, a, as an athlete because he always had me ranked fairly poorly as a cyclist. I think I was never, yeah, I was probably at my peak third best cyclist in the world. And I made a point of it when I could to try and ride off the front just to prove him wrong. You know, it was one of those things that, yeah, he has his numbers, you know, but numbers mean, no mean nothing when the gun goes. Well, particularly when you when you factor in the conditions that we've got out there today. But Els Visa doing exactly what you would have done and proving Torsten Rader wrong today. Look at the grind there on Imogen Simmons as she's making her way up at this climb. You know, we are on lap eight of eight. So this is the eighth time that these women have been up over this bridge. And you can see much slower cadence now than what we saw at the beginning of this ride. She is really grinding, just wanting to get up over this hill. And you can just see that white line on the back of her suit. Uh, you know, the suit has evaporating cooling with it. But that means that when there's so much evaporation going on, eventually there's just salt coming out and you have these salt lines and that's generally an indication of very, very hot conditions. But this lady on screen now, Lucy Charles Barclay, still looking really, really good, flying back down the other side of the bridge. Only 2.1 kilometers to go for Lucy Charles Barclay before she hits T2. And that's when the real race will begin. And you can see that that lead is already out. And this is interesting. I mean, we're, we're, we're within two kilometers of the transition zone. And it's probably the first time Lucy Charles Barclay is freewheeled. But this is one of those typical tactics that you use. I mean, in the last, in the last lap, you generally 
create less of a gap than you would simply because you're trying to get yourself to a point of being ready for that run. You know, you have to change its different mechanics and we see the graphic right here, um, which is a little bit confusing because the time splits on up. But um, yeah, Lucy Charles Barkley definitely getting ready for transition here and uh, taking her brand new prototype a racing suit for its first. Looks like successful outing. So like you talked about Belinda, Als Visser, not even close to the, the fastest cyclist according to the rankings leading into the, today's race. Right now she's had the fourth fastest bike split. She's very close with Arne Reichman. They're basically riding the, right, the same speed. But we are seeing she's almost single-handedly the, the only person able to uh, keep up with the pace that Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham are putting down. Lucy Buckingham has faded a little bit, so I don't think that cramp was fake or a, or a tactical ploy. I do think the pace they've just been holding is crazy. They had at that point ridden two minutes faster than anyone else on course, even including Als Visser and Alan Reichman. Lucy Charles Barclay here. She's got her feet out of her shoes. She's entering T2. She's broken Lucy Buckingham that little bit at the back end of the ride. Now she probably in her head isn't thinking about Lucy Buckingham. Thanks for the thanks for the, the companionship, it was great. Her head now goes to when can I see Ash Gentle? When can I see Els Visser? When can I see Lucy Byron, Imogen Simmons? She's gonna hit T2 here. She's gonna like really try and aggressively attack T2. We know she always does. She did at Miami, she's gonna do it again here. Then she gets out onto the, the Marina Bay Sands. She'll settle into her race pace, not far into the run. She gets her first look at her competition. I just saw Jan, big shake of the head there as Lucy Charles Barclay came into transition. You did notice that she came to a complete standstill. It is the rule that you are not allowed to be on your bike when you roll across that, that uh, red line. Obviously, that is the dismount line. You must make sure that you are off your bike before then. But Jan, you were not happy with, with the Lucy Charles Barclay's dismount, were you? Well, yeah, I mean, let's be honest, the, the two ladies are transitioned in the, same, in the same moment simply because, you know, she chose to stop and then lift her leg over the saddle, whereas Lucy Buckingham would have probably jumped off her bike. But, you know, they're, they're little things and I just, I love the effort she puts in and I really enjoy how hard she fights for it. And then there are little things that, you know, that will be five seconds that, or it feels like five, maybe it's only one second. Um, anyways, I complained about this in Miami in terms of a cornering. She's co cornering fantastic. So by the time we get to San Francisco, she'll have that transition. We'll be sorted. seeing all those extra seconds add up. And um, you know, these first steps, I think, right now in the athletes' minds, they are very telling. You are scanning your body. You're scanning your calves. You're scanning your hamstrings and quads, making sure there are no cramps. Because if there are, you've always got some kind of margin where you can adjust your run step. But right now, both of them looking very fluent actually, using the cooling, using the ice. And we see Lucy Charles Barkley putting on her watch in terms of getting her pacing a little bit more accurate. But she's flying. She, she looks great. She looks she very, looks very like good. She looks like she's in the zone. Something to note. 78% humidity when they've started this run. <laughs> the race started at 58% humidity. Third best runner in the field according to the rankings with a five minute gap. I mean, that's, that's going to be interesting. I do feel like the chase pack is going to need the conditions to come crashing down on Lucy Charles Barclay at the moment. But we've seen her take many races by the scruff and across the scruff of the neck. And Right now, she's playing it smart. She's getting in all the ice. She's getting in all the water. There's special nutrition right there. So that means at the end of the first aid station, every athlete has the ability to put their personalized nutrition and put, um, yeah, kind of like their, their, their own preferred drinks, which in these conditions, again, makes an even more exaggerated difference. Because if you're drinking what you used to, you know, we say you have to practice what you put into your stomach because your stomach staying together staying in one piece not getting cramps is another huge factor at a heat oh, it's race. exacerbated for sure in these sort of conditions but lucy looking very much in control she's 
managed to really open that gap between herself and Lucy Buckingham. It was interesting, uh, we had a really good look at Lucy Buckingham leaving transition just to see if we could see any uh, remnants of that cramp that we saw that she suffered on the bike and she looked great, her stride was good, it was even. So no signs of cramping for Lucy Buckingham at this stage, let's hope it stays that way. But you can see just how important it is as Lucy puts, make sure that she gets all that hydration, not just in her mouth, but over, over her head, over her shoulders, to try and keep cool. And interestingly enough, I haven't seen all gold glasses on Lucy Charles Barkley before, making maybe a bit of a statement here. I do think I like there are little things that, you know, at least I always thought about them. You know, very all gold glasses are definitely a sign of confidence. You don't go out <laughs> wearing bling eyewear <laughs> if you're not feeling confident. Unless you're serious. And I mean, the first steps of the run, as to be expected, you know, the third ranked runner over the last ranked runner, creating a difference already. But yeah, for now we see the first stages of the run. So we're, we're seeing Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham. They're the only two females who are on the run yet. The other women are still out there on the bike. I think a really interesting note is that last year on this exact same run course, Ash Gentle ran five minutes and 35 seconds faster than Lucy, Barclay, Lucy Charles Barclay. She's now sitting at five minutes and 32 seconds behind Lucy Charles Barclay. I guess what we're gonna see is, are we seeing a much better version of Lucy Charles Barclay today? And that's too far for Ash Gentle. Als Visser has managed to get away from that group that we saw her get past on the bridge. Ash Gentle wasn't able to hold on at the, at the end. She's again, Jan's probably not super happy with that. It was a little better than Lucy Charles Barclay though. I guess the big thing now is, is Als Visser actually a chance to you know, win this race? Can she, can she run up to second? Can she run up to first? Not many people pick, predicted her to do that, but she does look to be on one of the races of her life right now, Jan. Well, you know, the interesting thing here is the trend, right? The trend towards the end of the bike, whether you're moving forward or whether you're coming backwards. Because, I mean, an 18K run, that means we're still going to have an hour, 60 to 70 minutes, as we see Ash Gentle coming into transition two. Um, of effort and of course if you know at the end of the bike you are making up ground you're feeling good then I think that's an extremely good sign and Elsvisa knows that she's with Ash Gentle and Elsvisa is going to try and shake her because that's what she has to do in terms of you know getting a bit of a margin um, as she takes her drinks out of the cooling box making sure she stays hydrated investing a little bit of extra time that look on her face it was a look of determination and one of the things that we haven't mentioned is, is obviously you can see in transition they each have their own box they've got ice in those boxes and did you see Els Visa taking the time like you said taking a little bit of extra time in transition to put ice down her chest because anything you can do to try and cool the body down to make you feel better while you're out on that run makes a huge difference yeah and again if we look at the run the amount of time they're going to spend running you know as an athlete, when you're under pressure, when you're standing in that transition zone, you think every second feels like a minute. And it is so important to stay cool, to stay calm, but it's so difficult at the same time. And I am certainly no one to tell anybody how to do a transition zone, as many of those that I've mucked up in my life. But these girls are flying out. Um, Look at Ash Gentle. Ash Gentle though. looks Absolutely great. You have to incredible. say, she's coming straight around Elsbissa, making her mark on this race. Um, but I think, you know, between these two girls, there's certainly a strong chance of, well, one of them's definitely going to make a podium, but uh, maybe even both of them, we'll have to see. Like we talked about, Alzvisa has been working on her run. You could see she's carrying running sticks there, uh, a little technical cue to make her run a little bit more upright, with a little bit of a faster cadence, open that chest up. Uh, all about hand position, uh, relaxed elbows. So that's interesting. That's a sign that she definitely has been working on her run behind the scenes. They're, they're sort of indicative of that. But we have Ash Gentle, who's just run past her, who's you know, one of the best runners the sport's ever seen. She has been for the past decade. So I guess that's an established runner versus a, a runner who's trying to make it and trying to get those gains. But we've seen Ash Gentle go past her and you know, running with a little bit more speed. And did you see the difference there? I mean, even though I know Elsvisa has been working on a running and running with running sticks is something that her coach uses a lot, but look at the difference in their shoulders. Ash ran past, her shoulders were nice and relaxed. Whereas Elsvisa, the, the shoulders, they're up a little bit high for my liking. So they, it's almost like you needed to just 
relaxed a little bit, whereas Ash Gentle, nice, low shoulders, beautiful arm movement. I mean, we know Ash Gentle, she's the best in the business when it comes to the run. I think Lucy Charles looks great here. You can sort of tell when Lucy's on a day and when she's not off on a day on the run. To me, from everything I've ever watched of Lucy Charles Barclay, she looks great, much better than she did here last year. So I don't expect her to, to run as slow as she did last year. You can see out the back to the far left, ominous <laughs> thunder clouds. <laughs> Keep an eye on that. India Lee here into T2, out of T2, a little bit further down than we would have expected, Yam, especially compared to Miami where she was on the charge. You just mentioned, how does someone come into T2? That's usually indicative of how they're going to leave T2. Are they making up positions? Are they making up time? India Lee was losing time. She had the fastest bike and fastest run in Miami, but it does look like we're seeing Ash Gentle here running a little bit faster out of T2 than we, we saw India Lee just then. Yeah, absolutely. Ash Gentle has always been a, a strong runner, even in her days when she was, you know, fighting for Olympic spots. That was definitely her strength. And that's one of those things, unfortunately, you know, a natural runner will always look a little bit smoother. You know, for them, it's a question of fitness, whereas everybody else is actually trying to work on form and fitness. Um, but yeah, again, our number one T100 ranked athlete with India Lee coming out of transition there, we would not have expected that much of a deficit I think but yeah uh, interesting to see because this makes me very optimistic about kind of the the excitement we're going to have on the left on the on towards the end of this run it is not a flat run it is despite being a city run they've found some undulations we actually run up to a bridge at the end of it and that's four times I believe so uh, sorry three times three times, three times my bad um, where they have to go up. And, and all those things, they make a difference. As we see Ellie Salt, Salt House here, uh, just getting changed. Oh, a, a bit of a walking start. There's all kinds of tactics. I can tell you right now, the sun is out. It's hot. And athletes are, well, are going to find our, this uh, that's a Lottie, hard run. Lottie Wilms right behind her, Amelia Watkinson. So these women, quite a long way behind. You can see Lottie Wilms in no rush to leave transition really tough day for these women so far they're almost 10 minutes behind Belinda so Lottie Wilms and Ali Salthouse in 11th and 12th yeah the best part of 10 minutes back we are seeing even though they are quite a fair way back this whole top 10 maybe minus two women it's just it's people who train in the heat live in the heat are great in these conditions and I mean, that's what we've been talking about all day, how brutal it is. And it won't show itself any more than what it will on this run. Like Jan just said, the sun's out. It's still 30 degrees here, and it's, I don't know what time it is. I think it's about almost 5 p.m. Uh, local time right now. And it's still 30 degrees Celsius with almost 80% humidity. So even if you can't see it on the television, it's just brutal out here. Brutal and beautiful. And one of the greatest things about this run we talked about it being three laps. It isn't flat. The best part about this run is that... One of the best things about this run is when they go past the Marina Bay Sands shopping centre. It's a, it's a very, very long shopping centre. And when those doors open <laughs> up and you feel that air conditioning... It's the best. It's, oh, it's like a dream come true. And I know these women right now they just want to make it back to that Marina Bay Sands shopping centre so they can get some fresh, cold air. It's almost like those fences you have to keep the outside people out. But I think it's more to keep the athletes in so they don't <laughs> run over into the shopping centre where it's a 90-degree a, a uh, kind of uh, very pleasant to, to climate. But we've got... 30 seconds made up in the first K by Ash Gentle. Wow. If you do the maths on that, we are in for a show. And look at that, Ash Gentle, doing what Ash Gentle does best. It's really difficult. I mean, Jan, you'd know this. Coming into a race as the defending champion, you know, you've got so much pressure. I've been, I've been talking all week that I think it's Ash, Ash Gentle's race to lose. 
How difficult is it to come in as defending champ when it's not just the pressure you put on yourself, but it, it's the pressure that everyone else puts on you. We know that she's 10 times Noosa Triathlon champion, so this woman is no stranger to defending titles. But coming into this race, one of the, one of the biggest races of the year with a field as strong as it is, what's it like? You, I've did, never you didn't it. just put Noosa Triathlon in the same oh, league no. as the T100. <laughs> no, no. I love Noosa Triathlon, honestly. On. These are the best girls in the world. I'm, but I'm not saying that. The 30, fact that she's done it 10 times is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, yeah, fair enough. But I mean, th th this is the epitome of sport. It shows that she's been around for a long time and she's got a lot of experience for sure. As she just rips that ice sponge. Honestly, I mean, 30 seconds in 1K. It is the first K, which is always very indicative. But I mean, over 18K, again, that's, that's nine minutes. Um, and Lucy Charles Buckingham does not, uh, Lucy Charles Barkley, sorry, gee, it's, a, it's been a long day, um, <laughs> does not, <laughs> uh, does not look slow. She's no, out there and she's, she's moving well. Um, but Ash Gentle coming through, as we see shots of India Lee, just, um, you know, she's having a strong run, she's having a solid run, probably what we saw of her in Miami, um, early days yet, but she's definitely doing what she does best, best and that's, that's trucking along, putting a, in a solid performance. And, you know, very often that, that's all that's needed is consistency because athletes do tend to fall apart. She has almost lost a minute on Ash Gentle in the first kilometre of the run. She's, yeah, she is actually bleeding quite a bit of time to her there. But, I mean, everyone is to Ash Gentle at the moment. Ash Gentle, clearly the fastest runner out on course. And Reichman. Funnily enough, if we get eyes on hers running fast and Lucy Charles Barclay out in front is is, is sort of running a similar pace. To, but uh, Ash Gentle, 25 seconds faster than the next fastest mover uh, per kilometre right now on course, which is super impressive. And like you said, Jan, if she does keep that up, she will win this race. I sort of thought coming into T2, oh, that might be too far. But the conditions, Ash Gentle's run pedigree, this could actually happen. And that's the beauty of these races, you know, we, we've said it, I mean, it's the ultimate test between speed and endurance. And right now we've got the speed of Ash Gentle, which is obviously special as we see the transition times right here. Um, and even there, you know, there's 15 seconds. Yeah, and you made a big deal about that step off. Uh, maybe that time didn't quite count because she hadn't crossed the line yet, but she did make it up when she actually got into transition there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, time is measured from line to line. So, looking at uh, at Ash Gentle right here, she doesn't look like she's laboring either. Like, this is the first time right now that we see her mouth opening a little bit wider, but she looks focused, she looks determined. She's probably looking forward to the next aid station by now because you know, it, we have a lot of aid stations, I believe it's four per lap, but that definitely can be a long time in terms of feel. If you do the math, that's one and a half Ks per between aid stations and getting some ice, getting some water down is absolutely crucial and yeah, she'd be longing for that by now. One of the great additions we've had at today's T100 Singapore race is this pylon we see on screen. It shows us the positions of every athlete in the top 20. It's just gone off screen there, but we did get the benefit of seeing it for a little bit. What it did show, the main story it was painting, is that Ash Gentle is only 4 minutes and 38 seconds down on Lucy Charles Barclay. She started the run 5 minutes and 28 seconds down. I mean, we're not even 4K into the run yet as we see them make the pass. Ash Gentle's going to see that she's gained that minute. She's going to be able to tell that she's, she's bridging that gap to Lucy Charles Barclay. And Lucy Charles Barclay yarn is going to see. Look at that. You saw that Ash Gentle just eyes on her. Prey versus predator type stuff going on there. Lucy Charles Barclay would have seen how fast Ash Gentle was moving. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the beauty. I mean, the old saying in triathlon says uh, you bike for show you run for dough i mean that's one of the old classic old school triathlon saying and right now we're seeing the run course where ash gentle is definitely putting on a run for the dough a run for money because uh yeah she yet has to make up a lot of time but this is the uphill section of the course where she actually has to go up um and a little bit of a technical left right left right there which she's mastering 
perfectly. She's going through the apex every single time and they're all good indicators to judge whether an athlete is being aggressive or not because when you get tired, you lose concentration and sometimes, you know, you can just clip one of those pylons and, you know, things get a little bit more complicated. But Ash Gentle being aggressive and showing us that she really does want to re retain her crown here in Singapore. We can see that now, Ash Gentle down to four minutes 30. Interesting to see the difference in cadence. We've got a great shot here of Lucy Charles Barclay, a long, slow, loping cadence when she runs in comparison to Ash Gentle, a lot faster cadence. India Lee, we talked about her yarn. She's had a bit of a cold between her Miami victory and this race here today. She doesn't seem to be on the race that she was having only a few weeks ago when she won her first T100 race. And we're joined by Team, uh, Team Lee right now. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, we'll chat to Ruth now, who's down here with me, uh, just to get a bit more of an insight into India Lee and what she has been going through the last month. She's had a bit of a cold. Is she okay? 100%? What kind of percentage would you say she's at right now? Um, I think it's really hard to say percentages, uh, but you know, she was really on the fence as to whether she should come out or not, um, but had a couple of good sessions before coming after probably like a week to 10 days of really not doing very much. So yeah, not ideal, but I'd say prior to that, she had done some really good heat sessions. But yeah, she wanted to come, she wanted to do Singapore, she wanted to, you know, keep experiencing the T100. So for her, I think just getting through this race, especially in these conditions, is like massive bonus. Can you read into anything in terms of her body language right now? We saw her coming out of transition and she clocked you and just didn't look the best. She always like was trying to convey something to you. What do you think that was? Uh, probably I'm really effing hot. <laughs> Please get me out of here. Um, no, I think it's really hard to tell body language with a lot of people and I'd say with like you know, with Indy, she generally always looks pretty similar, whether she's really suffering or not. Um, yeah, I don't think she was feeling her best, but I'm not sure she expected to either. And with this run now, it's gonna probably be the last 5K who's still moving forward and who's not walking. So it's a long way to go. Would she be chuffed if she could stay in and around this position of seventh at the moment? I honestly think, yeah, with how the like preparation went, I think just getting some points on the board with this race, is better than nothing and it was just yeah tick one off while she knew that she could actually come and race you're also the girlfriend of alistair brownlee he'll be competing tomorrow i'm sure as a perfectionist he is he's been texting you quite a lot asking you a number of things about how today has been planning out has he uh we've had a few chats yeah uh probably more me being like <laughs> it's really hot <laughs> please don't do what you did in miami um no I th obviously yeah we've been out here for a couple of weeks so we spent a week in malaysia we know what the conditions are like. It's a different ball game to Miami. Like it's, you know, it, it doesn't look that bad because it's quite cloudy now, but as soon as that sun comes out, as soon as the wind stops a bit, it's like sweltering. So yeah, like tomorrow with the men as well, conditions will play a massive part. The heat definitely took a toll on Ali in Miami. How much has he improved in terms of his heat preparation? since then as someone who knows him the best and who's been in Malaysia with him for the last couple of weeks? Uh, I mean, I think Miami, he did like three heat sessions, so he's a lot more prepared. Um, yeah, he's basically had like a month of heat now, so much better prepared, I'd say. And how much does he want to win one of these, Ruth? We've seen him win pretty much everything there is to win in triathlon. Is this very much now the next goal, the next thing that Ali Brownlee wants to win? I think he wants to win any race he ever does. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, yeah, like he's a racer. He loves racing. He loves winning. Um, but again, I think after the last few years he had, actually, he also just wants to be able to race and race throughout a whole year. So see how it goes. Absolutely. Well, we're still very much focused on the women's race down here. Men's is tomorrow. Ali will go in that on. Ruth probably won't talk to me tomorrow. She'll be very much focused on giving him some messages on the course. For now, though, guys, back to you. And now we've got eyes back on Lucy Charles Barclay. And the battle really has, like, it's just taking off uh, while we were talking to Ruth Astle there. Four minutes now, Yarn. Four minutes. Uh, that's, you know, a minute 30 closer than what uh, Ashgenta was leaving T2. 
and if that trend does continue, she would win this race. Now, that's not how racing works, but if it were to continue, she would win. So although Lucy Charles Barclay is out in front with a four minute gap, this race is so far from over. Absolutely, I mean, it's not quite the trend we saw at the beginning because we have run five Ks by now and 5k with a minute and a half that means you know mathematically it's it, it's close it's definitely close but it's not 30 seconds a k like we were seeing what we did see is lucy buckingham she almost lost a minute in the last k um she's definitely struggling but you know still i mean there is a lot a lot to be had and i think a lot of athletes will start to struggle as we progress in this run you know we're not even yet yeah, we're just a third of the way in and the fireworks are still going to happen uh, that is going to be without a doubt but for right now these two front runners uh, well sorry um, Lucy Charles Barclay and Ash Gentle who's currently still in third uh, delivering a huge spectacle whereas I'm still impressed with Lucy, Lucy Buckingham holding holding her own you know she just really needs to keep marching on because as Mark has said she hasn't finished one of these yet and we saw on that graphic there that just bounced off screen that Ash Gentle was running significantly faster than everyone else out on course. Lucy Charles Barclay, comparatively, running fast compared to everyone else as well. It's just that Ash Gentle is running that much faster. Uh, and yeah, she's, she's now ran a minute and 30 seconds faster, like you said, yarn over the first five or so kilometers. And, and that does make it a down to the wire battle. You touched on Lucy Buckingham. So impressive what she's doing right now, considering what we saw with the cramp on the bike. The fact that she could still hold on to a podium here, that's a career-changing uh, result for her. This, this battle out in front, it's, um, it's exactly why we watch T100 Triathlon, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you consider this, you consider the overall aspect of the series. Um, you know, it's, it, it's absolutely unique. As we see the first bit of laboring from these athletes and yeah I mean it's one of three run laps and that's also mentally you know I think there are certain ways that certain athletes cope with it I used to break down everything into mathematical percentages so for me it was a big deal to get the first third done you know it's one out of three then you get to two out of three and that's always the tricky one because it's a little bit of no man's land you know you're not fresh off the bike but you're also not on your last lap where you can sort of summon a little bit extra strength um, but there are different different coping techniques i know some athletes that actually commentate on their own performance <laughs> so <laughs> everyone to their own looks like we might be back with a supernova slow-mo here with lucy charles yarns now a converted fan of the supernova slow-mo and he is a bit critical of her transition sometime particularly how she starts them but we did see she had the fastest t2 today and and she has left T2 with that same aggression. Can I be facetious and just uh, say that we probably didn't need a slow motion for that first bit just before <laughs> transition? Oh, <yeah. laughs> no. Come on, come on. We all know we're, we're a big fan. You're lucky you're um, loved by so many. You've got to have a bit of tongue in cheek, I reckon. <laughs> A little update on conditions uh, following that. It the feels like temperature here I've been following all week. Right now it feels like 36 degrees Celsius. It's only 30 degrees Celsius, only in inverted commas, but feels like 36 degrees Celsius. Another factor, 80% humidity, but with a 21 kilometre wind factor. So that's just crazy, crazy conditions. And no one really expected Lucy Buckingham to handle these conditions as well as what she did. And there was a lot of talk about it from her own team that she, she sort of struggles in these conditions. We saw in Miami, she was sick. The heat, heat and humidity got the best of her because she was sick. She had the, the stomach bug. She's now here healthy. It was only a three week, week gap though. So for her to have this quick turnaround and you know not only not be pulling out of the race, but be running in second with 11.7 kilometers, kilometers to go is, <laughs> Completely crazy, considering she wasn't even part of this series to start. Uh, so super impressive performance here from Lucy Buckingham and just holding strong. Almost a little bit of a mistake. She went to go down to the finish finish line, but uh, realised, whoop, need to just fix myself up there. She's got two laps to go now. She completes lap one, but yeah, very impressed. 
little bit of confusion there whether she needs to go straight, but she's made it through. And she'll now head out on lap two of three, but still looks really good. Obviously not running as fast as the likes of, Char of Lucy Charles Barclay or Ash Gentle, but an Ash Gentle, look at that. Yeah. Absolutely. She's poetry in motion. She really is. That's such a contrast, isn't it? Yep. Seeing how Lucy Buckingham was running and we're talking about how impressed we, we are with her performance, which we are, and it's, it's world class. But then you just get that camera switch to Ashley Gentle and yeah, they're, they're in different leagues. They really are running completely different races here. And Ash Gentle is going to make that catch soon enough and, and move away into second position. And then the real battle begins for Ash Gentle is trying to help, hunt down the other Lucy, Lucy Charles Barclay. I mean, Ash Gentle's had a lot of rivals in her short T100 career. I'm, I think most people look at Taylor Nib and Ashley Gentle as one, two, and, and, and the main rivals in, in female triathlon. But Lucy Charles Barclay, she's the Ironman world champion and she's one of the best in our sport. And she's sort of putting her hand up, like Jan said, with the gold sunglasses and saying, what about me? Well, it is interesting that you say that because the only two women racing here today that have actually beaten uh, Ash Gentle, Lucy Buckingham and Amelia Watkinson. So they are the only two women racing on course right now that have ever beaten Ash Gentle over either this distance or longer. So Lucy Buckingham still in front, but I think it's only a matter of time before we see this young lady on screen overtake Buckingham for a second. And like we've been talking about throughout the day, if you want to take part in this race, this beautiful race here in Singapore, one of my favourite countries I've ever been to, brutal conditions, hot, hilly, just a, a race course experience you're not going to get anywhere else in the world, come and join us in 2025, grab your phone, scan the QR code, scan that QR code, 35% off your race entry for 2025, come and join us. So looking at Ash Gentle here, I do want to come back and touch on Lucy Buckingham for just a second because, you know, it's, I think, I feel it, it's the start of uh, what could be a fantastic career. And if you look at her relevant data, she's three minutes and 11 seconds ahead of Els Visser, um, according to the graphic we have right here. And that means she's probably, she would have lost, uh, she would have lost two, something like two minutes on the first lap. Um, Again, it's two laps to go. If she would get a podium here, that would be absolutely mind-blowing. I would be so ecstatically happy for her. And yeah, it seems like a tight fight for the first spot, but also for the third spot on the podium. And it's funny because Lucy Buckingham, you know, it's not like she's just bursting onto the scene. She's been a very good athlete for a long time now. We know that she competed in the 2012 Olympics in London. She's also won quite a few uh, middle distance races. She was the champion in Samarin, uh, the championship a few years back. So <laughs> Lucy Buckingham is a very good athlete. Definitely, you know, if she was able to podium here, that would be one of the best races she's had. But let's know, she has been up there at the pointy end of, of, of many races for quite a while now. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would see that, like, would think of her as younger than she is, but she's 32 years old. She's established, and yeah, if you followed short course racing or middle distance racing, she's been yeah, doing her thing for well over 15 years now, I, I would say. Um, so, not a surprise to, to most uh, who have been around the sport for long enough to see her at the front of races. But the one thing she's never been able to get right is she's never been able to get her run to the level she needs to. Short course, middle, middle distance racing. She's been in the front of so many races at T2, it's not even funny. That's true, but not of a race of this calibre. I think in some of those other races where the fields haven't been as strong, but it's this woman let on screen right now, Anne Reichman, having one of the fastest runs on screen. So Anne Reichman really racing well. We know that she's a, she's a solid runner, very good bike rider. But both Els Visser and Anne Reichman, I think these two women are definitely a chance for the podium. As you can see that... Ash Gentle now just overtaken Lucy Buckingham. We knew it was inevitable, but it has finally happened. And now we know Ash Gentle is on the hunt for the only Lucy left in front of her, Lucy Charles Barclay. Wow, that's five and a half minutes over less than 8K, 7.5K. She is uh, motoring, absolutely flying along here and, and still looking very composed. She doesn't look like she's gritting her teeth yet. She looks within herself. And that's kind of what you need in these conditions. You know, you can make up so much time, even in the last kilometer. And we see her here on this pass. It's just, yeah, 
poetry in motion. She is absolutely flying and very comfortable. Little tap, symbolically, um, kind of well done, but I'll take it from here, girl. <laughs> Jan, the time that Ash Gentle is pulling back here is pretty incredible. 6.6 kilometres into the run, and Lucy Charles Barclay covered that in 27 minutes and 10 seconds. Ash Gentle covered it in 24 minutes wow. and 42 seconds. Wow. Wow. So on this pace, the projection, this is, this is Ash Gentle's, like, she can win. And not only can she win, but if you look at this split, split screen, at the pace she's running compared to Lucy Charles Barclay, we do expect to see her catch her towards the last two kilometres into this 18 kilometre run. Literally, it feels like my body is splitting in two. Like one, one half wants to just shout and scream for Ash. The other one is kind of like, oh my God, please, please, Lucy, not again. <laughs> oh, as she has a fan moment there, somebody catching a bottle or something of hers. I uh, couldn't quite see what she was throwing, but uh, she can, obviously had a shared moment. And you can see Lucy Charles Barclay taking everything on offer through those aid stations. Sponges down, down the chest, water over the head, doing everything possible to get that temperature down. And look at the difference in the style and the power. We know that that, that turnover of Ashes. I know Ash has been doing quite a bit of track work back home in Brisbane in very, very hot and humid conditions. But look at that, absolutely beautiful. Really, really controlled, fast turnover. Whereas you've got that loping style of Lucy there on the left, completely different run styles. Both of them in brand new shoes. I know there's a lot of uh, shoe nerds out there. Lucy Charles Barclay in her brand's uh, Paris Olympic shoe and Ash Gentle, not for sale this shoe yet. Uh, that's, uh, that's a Paris Olympic one as well. I mean, that just shows that both of their brands expected them to do well here, and we're going to be we're going to be seeing a lot more of both of those pairs of shoes. But Ash Gentle, less than three minutes down, and you can see it. Lucy Charles Barclay looks like she's running great for her. I guess like it's not just comparing how they're looking to the other, but how they're looking compared to when they're at their best versus at their worst. Uh, this is Lucy Charles Barclay looks great compared to how she does when she's running uh, the best she runs, and Ash Gentle also looks great compared to how she's running when she runs the best she does. So they both look like they're having really great days. It just shows the difference in running between Lucy Charles Barclay and Ash Gentle. Ash Gentle really has cemented herself over the past six months as the best runner in female triathlon. There's no doubt about that. And I, I guess we're seeing that battle unfold. You know, the, the aggressiveness in the swim bike and consistency in the run for Lucy Charles Barclay versus the ever improving swim bike of Ash Gentle, but just absolute best of the best world-class run caliber. Yeah, there we go. As they match up pretty evenly, uh, the graphics showing us 170 a spot on both of them. So that's again shows you know sometimes you see running styles when we see over long di longer distances we see Anne Haug versus someone like Daniela Reef, right? And Anne just looks like she's floating and absolutely flying. Looks like a perfect almost track style runner, but she's not actually gaining any time on Daniela, which can be quite deceiving. But right now, this looks a little bit like a T100 versus an Ironman pace, almost visually, visually, obviously. Um, and it is it is mind-blowing to see. I mean, I don't want to really know what's going through Lucy Charles Barclay's head right now, because she's like, if I've got five and a half minutes, what do I need to do to win one of these races? Um, and hopefully, you know, the doubt isn't creeping in. And yeah, again, we're not even halfway into the run. So a lot of a lot of things can still happen. 8.4 kilometers into the run we are for Lucy Charles Barclay Yarn. And she's only gonna have just just over two minutes on Ash Gentle at 8.4 kilometers into the run. So that's three and a half minutes in eight and a half K. So you know we've got the better part of, of ten kilometers to go, nine and a half kilometers to go. And if that trend if that trend continues, then yeah, this this is now potentially becoming Ash Gentle's race to lose. If she blows up, that looks like it might be the only way that Lucy Charles Barclay can hold on. And it's been remarkable seeing Ashley Gentle throughout the week. I feel like wherever she was, she was bubbly, she was confident, she was happy. The interview, I think Rachel said it earlier, uh, just exuberated a kind of confidence that we really feel like she's coming into her own. You know, it's the T100 series. 
she seems to have found her place in the sport, which is wonderful for an athlete that's, you know, seen all the highs, but also seen a few lows of the sport. Uh, she definitely had some struggles with her federation and um, seeing her find a place that she obviously feels at home, she feels happy, and she seems to have found that perfect mix between speed and endurance. Yeah, she was it's definitely after the Olympics, the last, uh, last Olympics that she was uh, competing in in Tokyo, was a little bit uh, not sure where she wanted to go from there, whether she wanted to continue with triathlon. I think her husband, Josh Amberger, had a lot to do with it, uh, telling her that she really needed to keep pursuing, just needed to go a little longer. and. We can thank Josh for that because uh, she's been so exciting to watch and she really, as you've said, yeah, she really has nailed this distance and is absolutely one of the best. I think Josh just wants the new Land Rover. <laughs> He's not silly, is he? Of course, we'll be seeing Josh Amberger racing it tomorrow, given a call up at the last minute. So he was always coming here to support his wife, but now also able to race tomorrow. So it'll be exciting to watch that men's race tomorrow. I'm sure he's probably still maybe out on course right now in an air-conditioned part of the course cheering his wife on, but he would be very, very happy with the way that she's racing. Jan, it's interesting that you brought up Ash Gentle throughout the week. She was. She was one of the few athletes who was always at breakfast, talking, hanging out, sitting there for two hours, having fun. And I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know if you were there, Jan, but she was having a conversation um, with a group of us where she wanted people to stop talking about her as the favorite she thought everyone had already given her the race and she was nowhere near as confident as everyone else she she actually requested that on commentary commentary we tell people she's she's not the favorite and she's not confident she's going to win and just talk her down a little bit usually when athletes do that they're either telling the truth or they're hiding sensational form and it does look like we might have uh, seen that Ash Gentle was doing the later and taking the pressure off her knowing that she was in sensational form and, and not wanting people to see her as the big favourite that we clearly should have been seeing her, her as and were seeing her as. Well if it was tactical and it was indeed planned by her well then good luck because from now on I don't think we're ever going to talk of her as an underdog again. <laughs> she was already the, the most winningest if that's a word, PTO athlete of all time, multiple podiums, multiple victories, the only athlete to do that. Uh, and she's going to add another one to her list today. She does not finish off the podium at PTO slash T100 races. Uh, misses consistency and the queen of the T100. Absolutely. As we see the difference in pace right here, I think this is uh, minutes per mile. And it's uh, definitely impressive how she's almost half a minute quicker. And maybe the surprise packet of today's race, Arne Reichman, known for her sensational bike leg. One of her fellow competitors called her one of the most underrated and best of the rest triathletes in the T100 Tour today. And she's what showing that today. Yeah, I mean, she's not just the best of the rest today. She's sitting in fifth position and she's actually running a, a lot faster than most, most other athletes on the course. I think a lot of people would have expected her to have one of the, the better rides today, but I don't know how many people Belinda would have said she was going to have one of the best runs as well. Well, to put it in perspective, this time last year, this race, she was 15th across the line. And she is now all the way up into fifth place and hunting down those in front of her. She's got the same coach as Imogen Simmons, so she's coached by Rito Brownlee, and she's just spent the past few weeks with Imogen Simmons training in Phuket. So doing quite an extensive heat program over there but has come into this race in very, very good form. But it's great to see her having a breakthrough race. And that's what I love about racing in general, but particularly with these T100 events. We saw it in Miami with India Lee. We know India Lee is a very strong athlete, but no one predicted her to win that race. And I always love it when we see athletes like Anne Reichman come through. Lucy Charles Barclay, she started the, the run five minutes and 30 seconds ahead of Ash Gentle. It's now at two minutes and we're joined by Team Barclay to give us the update from their end. We are indeed, eight kilometers to go. I've got Evan here, her manager. We were just talking off camera. We just saw the stats as well. Lucy at the moment, 408 per kilometer. Ash, 340. I'm gonna put you right on the spot with a hard question. Is Lucy gonna hold on? Is she gonna win? 
I think Lucy's going to hold on for a top two, but uh, when you've got a runner like Ash coming at you, dropping 20 seconds plus a kilometre quicker, you get nervous. So if this was the third lap, I'd be feeling good. Second lap, a little bit nervous. We keep talking about conditions though, they can come into play, there's 8k still left. Will that affect Ashley in the knowledge you have on her? No, Ashley's from Brisbane in Australia, a lot of heat and humidity there. This is a, a perfect condition for her. but. Lucy loves the heat as well. As we saw in Kona, it doesn't bother her so much, but she's not as fit as what she was in Kona. So she's building into the year. Uh, this is a phenomenal performance so far. So let's see how we go. If it does though, come down to a sprint finish, who's your money on? Uh, as manager, Lucy, um, and as, as someone that's watched Ash over the years, I, I think Ash has, has got it. Yeah, but it'll be tight. That's what the fans want to see. Something else, though, that actually Jan was talking about is the new suit that Lucy's kind of wearing. How much of an edge do you hope that's going to have? And it, I guess it just shows the mindset of Lucy that she wants to win at all costs. Yeah, after Kona, the decision was made. It's, you know, you don't have the perfect race. So, you know, going after technology is, is one of those angles. And so we've been testing in the tunnel all different suits, all different manufacturers. And so this is now about the real life testing. And so this is a new material, different, uh, different producer, so we'll see how it goes. And we'll have a debrief after the race and Lucy will tell us how it is. And she'll probably get back into the tunnel as well. One final question, because she never tells me, I don't think exactly how she's feeling. How much did second in Miami hurt her? Uh, in Miami, she was actually quite happy. Lucy never likes to come second or third. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's coming back from a, a brutal race in Kona, uh, injury to the calf, and she's still very early stage in the year. So it was a positive outcome, and today is another step forward. Well, here we go, 7.7k to go. Can she hold on? That is the question, Evan. Thank you so much. And we are seeing for the first time in today's race, since very, very early on in the swim, the gap is under two minutes between Ash Gentle and Lucy Charles Barclay. And every 100 metres that goes past, Ash Gentle is covering. The percentage of max heart rate's very interesting here. Ash Gentle is one minute and 43 seconds down behind Lucy Charles Barclay after 7.5 kilometres, and she's running at 90% of her max heart rate. Lucy Charles Barclay, very similar at 87% of her max heart rate. That shows that both of them are working very hard, almost as hard as they can. On the run, this late into a race, very, very hard to, to get your heart rate up to 100%. It's just, it's just a battle of attrition at this point, and, and often a suppressed heart rate uh, is the result of races getting harder uh, and not the opposite. So, yeah, this is, this is probably pretty much as close to the, as high as they could get without them just doing a full 100 metre sprint for their max heart rate at this point in the race. Jan, what are you seeing on screen here and the difference between Ash and, and Lucy? Well, you know, the first thing we see is the, sh the long shadow that Lucy's drawing behind her. Uh, it was a half an hour ago, I feel like, that we're talking about the thunderbolt and lightning shutting down this race. Uh, right now, what we're seeing is Ash Gentle <laughs> trying to do everything to shut down this race. I mean, it is super <laughs> impressive to see where she's going. Percentage of max heart rate, as you exactly said, later on, due to fatigue, it's very difficult to raise your heart rate close to an absolute maximum, which would be measured off a short effort, you know, at say a 30 or a 30 second or a 60 second kind of effort. So let's not be kidding ourselves. These ladies are on the river. They are on their absolute limits. And they, they, they are fighting, you know. Ash Gentle doesn't see the stats the way we do. She's trying to run as fast as she can because, you know, she, she doesn't have the same information. She's not pacing herself right now. She's going to where, the sh where she thinks she's going to pass out and then backing off just a little bit. She's going all in, all risk. And I maintain, of course, everything is pointing to Ash Gentle coming to the front. We do see her breathing getting a little bit more labored. There's a little bit more bobbing going on with her head. And again, these conditions could be detrimental until the very last kilometer. Like, this is why I love this kind of race. Normally you have that in Kona. You just don't know what to expect. And next thing you know, it's similar to Lucy Buckingham. Somebody's walking because they have a cramp. And right now, this is a bit of a nail biter. Like, I'm, I'm loving this. One minute and 28 seconds. Ash Gentle is behind Lucy Charles Barclay now, Yarn, with 6.2 kilometers to go. 
In saying that, Jan, I have never seen Ash Gentle crack under the pressure of these conditions. So it would be an absolute first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> you know, you two guys go to the pub. I'll keep up the suspense <laughs> right here. I honestly, I think this is a bit of a nail biter. And yeah, of course, like I said, I feel like a split human right now. You know, I'm, my my heart is somewhat beating for Lucy Charles Barclay, who's just gone out and taking this race by the scruff of the neck. But then again, that's what we see from her every single time. It's what she needs to do. And the racing demands obviously show that it is tricky for her to be winning races despite that large of a margin. And did, you, did you just Beck see that Clark. then? Yeah. Beck Clark walking. So while we have Lucy Charles Barclay leading the race, running really, really well, in the opposite direction, we had Rebecca Clark from New Zealand actually walking. And that's what, I mean, if we go further back, that is the sort of carnage that we are going to be seeing towards the latter stages of this run today. We haven't had an update of it, but the big DNF next to India Lee's name is something that uh, oh, we wow. haven't talked about. The defending champion at Miami. Yeah, that sickness leading into it. You can't be sick leading into a race this brutal. So something's happened. She's obviously, I think, made the decision to pull the pin, knowing that it wasn't going to be her day and saving herself. Uh, she wants to win the T100 series. She's not really shying away from that. So save her legs today, save her body today. There's still, uh, still six more races to come after this. Yeah, but I, honestly, I think there must be something more. Because if you've got 10K to go and you're taking your own chance of a paycheck, which every single finisher gets, I think there's probably more to the story that, you know, if it's early in the bike and you've got something serious, you know, you've got something, well, maybe, okay. But India Lee, I really hope it's nothing grave and it's just the very extreme conditions that seem to be affecting everybody except for this lady right here. And it is interesting that you look at you look at some of these women that were quite a ways back on the bike, like Amelia Watkinson now up into seventh place, Kaidi Kibioya in eighth place, Haley Chura. I mean, we don't talk about Haley Chura that much, but she is the most consistent racer, still in the top ten. We've got Ellie Salthouse now in tenth. But great to see these women who were quite a long way back off the bike, and they are clawing their way into that top ten. Lucy Charles Barclay coming in with the golden shades. Will they prove golden today? It's again, this is one of those things. For me, it was such a relevant thing as an athlete to come out because gold is a statement. It really is, you know, you can have other lenses, you can have all these things, but these are bright and shiny, they're out there and we know why she came here. It's a minute and 10 seconds now, Jan, with 6.3 kilometers to go. One minute and 10 seconds. We are coming to a little bit of a turnaround point soon where Ash Gentle and Lucy Charles Barclay, it's not too far away, they will get eyes on each other. And Ash Gentle's gonna see just how much closer she is. And I guess there's this thing, you can you can sort of be motivated by the carrot or the stick. And generally speaking in triathlon, you, you see athletes motivated by the carrot. So if you can see yourself getting closer to someone, it's very motivating. There's a positive reinforcement cycle. Whereas if you can see someone getting closer to you, the race and the day does get a little bit harder and harder and harder. Is that your experience racing these big races, Jan, both on good days where you're the carrot and bad days where you're the stick? I'll tell you what, if I would have gone into any lap with a minute and 10, that was the last lap, I would have been, you know, I, I would have been fairly it confident going in. I mean, it just shows you of the extreme performance that Ash Gentle is putting in right here as she's coming in to transition for the last time before it'll be the finish line. I mean, it's remarkable. A minute and 10 for a last lap of three is normally a healthy margin. I mean, it's, it's kind of what you dream of. It's what you want. The last thing you want is for someone to be coming, breathing down your neck the last 200 meters. Because really, that means it's gonna come down to a sprint finish. And even Ash Gentle taking that turn a little bit more tepidly, let's just call it that. Um, but a minute and 10 normally is, it, it is a lot. One minute and one second with one lap remaining. One minute and one second with six kilometers, one lap remaining. That's 10 seconds a K where, you know, normally you feel, yeah, 10 seconds, there's no way anybody's running faster than me by 10 seconds per each kilometer. But right now, Ash Gentle is making light work and she's probably caught up double that in the first two laps. Um, it truly is, it truly is quite something to see.
That almost looked like Ash Gentle was uh, looking over for a, for a squim of the view. <laughs> Maybe looking for a celebration location for tonight. <laughs> no, not quite yet. I think she's, again, she doesn't have those stats as we see her husband, Josh Amberger, just on the side right there, cheering on, and he would probably be the one giving her a realistic stat. Absolutely, and I knew Josh would be out there on course somewhere, even though he's racing tomorrow. He is Ash Gentle's largest supporter. To his credit, he's not standing in an air-conditioned tent either. He's, he's not, out there he's in the out there, course. <laughs> yep, he's out there in the heat and humidity. It's great to see. And you know what is great? Looking at the crowds, every part of this run course is lined with spectators. Fantastic to see Singaporeans out in force here today. Speaking of Josh Amberger, who we're going to see in tomorrow's men's race, we've had a fantastic race and it's not done yet. Tomorrow, the men are racing. I can't wait. You may All right, well, this is heating up, and personally, I'm quite happy. We've got uh, 24 hours until we have the men's race because uh, <laughs> it'd be hard to build the suspense. I mean, this is getting a bit of a nail biter here. I know, you know, between the two of you, um, you're quite, uh, quite decided, and we've just heard it's 43 seconds the difference. As we see Lucy working, she's laboring right here. Let's be honest, she's uh, definitely starting to struggle. The heat, if you've if you've got it under control, you're not running with a bottle over an 18k distance. I mean, the littering rules here are very strict, but Ash Gentle would be coming into the very side of the screen there, maybe. There we go. Yep, we, we can, can see, see her. Now. 39 seconds. She can see her. And just look at the facial expressions on Lucy Charles Barclay. She really is suffering. I think she's probably in the mindset that it is only a matter of time. Been there, done that many times in the past before, and it's it's... It's, it's not that you're waiting for it to happen, but deep down you know it's about to happen. And you know, once Ash Gentle gets eyes on the prize, there will be nothing stopping her. And you can see now, look at that on screen, you can see that Lucy Charles Barclay only just around that corner, Ash about to make that corner. But this is what we want. This is the sort of racing that we, we, we want to see. This are the 20 of the best women in the world. It should come down to the wire. So we see Els Visser still moving fluidly, still moving well. She is, she has not completed the second lap yet, so, you know, the differences, the time differences overall are blowing out, and we are seeing quite a fight for the podium. I'm not sure where she stands just yet, I think she's in fourth, yep. so she hasn't made her way to the podium yet, which, if you think of Lucy Buckingham, is epic. I mean, she's got a minute gap at the moment as things stand, and that would be, yeah. Yeah, honestly, I, I think such a well-deserved gap. I don't know what's a bigger result. Els Visser finishing third or Lucy Buckingham finishing fourth. Like, either way, whoever gets the podium, whoever finishes fourth between those two, or if Anne Reichman can catch them, even then, top five for these two these two women in Lucy Buckingham and Els Visser is huge. Like, without question, one of the best performances of both of their careers, if not maybe the best, very close too. Yeah, what a performance, and Mark Buckingham was speaking earlier, you know, he'll start getting psyched at, at, at 10k, and I know we've still got a little bit to go, um, you know, the podium, you should definitely never celebrate before before it's over, but yeah, they, they are fantastic results, but it does come back a little bit to the mindsets that we spoke about, you know, for either of these two front runners, a loss would be a setback. Honestly, they would be going back to their hotel room and being somewhat devastated over not winning this race. Whereas exactly like you said, Jack, you know, between Lucy Buckingham and Els Visser, either of them, it doesn't matter what happens, it's champagne and oysters yep. tonight. <laughs> top, top five for, for any of those women. Oh, oh, here we go. 20 the seconds coming in. 20 seconds it is between Ash Gentle and Lucy Buckingham. We were talking at the start of the ru run. Is five and a half minutes enough? There's not. It's five kilometers to go. Four point six kilometers to go, and she's she's there within within striking distance. 
Here I am saying it's coming down to the wire, the wire plus four kilometres. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, look at that. Unbelievable. Look, my heart of hearts, I knew that Ash would catch her. I just know the calibre runner that she is. And we see Amelia Watkinson going in, in the opposite direction. Wow. In hindsight, of course you knew. No, come on. We know. Ash Gentle, she did the same thing here last year. She's doing it again. She's just uh, an incredible runner, but hats off to Lucy Charles Barclay because she really did take this race, bull by the horns in this race. And I know Lucy, she'll go back to the drawing board. They've just got to tweak a few things. Both of these women here today have had incredible races. So it's, it's not like, it's not as if Lucy's done anything wrong. It's just that Ash Gentle is just such a good runner over this distance. Yeah, absolutely. As we see a shot from Ash Gentle here, if you're wondering what that is behind, uh, in between her shoulder blades, um, that is the GPS sensor that all these athletes have to wear so that we get the most accurate and best splits. And right now you can count the number of cones between these two. It is absolutely ecstatic for Ash Gentle who's coming around and I'm not sure she can believe her luck just yet. What do you think she's going to do, though, Jan, once she catches yeah. what, 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 Let's have some bets, boys, before it happens. Will she put a surge in? Bum tap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, will there be a bump tap? Is it coming? No, will there I be think a surge? Ash Gentle's not... I think sometimes she's not the biggest fan of the bum tap. I think she's a bit too uh, win it all cost like for, for that. I, I, I'm going to put my money. She runs straight past her. I'll, I'll take the bet if you think she's going to bum tap. Yeah, I mean, of course, she's going to run, run right past. At this pace, she, she'd, have to, she'd have to throw the anchors just to hold the pace. I mean, she is absolutely flying along here. Will but it, I am also wondering about the tap. Will it's it just be a such surge? a statement. It yeah. is a statement. It's demoralising. When you get tapped, it's demoralising. Hey, Jack, it's a little bit like that tap that Sam Long oh, gave oh. to Sam Laidlow. Is there going to no be one? No love tap? lost. Nothing. Not no a thing. love lost. Wow. That is just all business from Ash Gentle. 4.1 kilometres to go. She makes the decisive pass of the day. In triathlon, in conditions like this, you usually make the pass and they do not cut, they don't go the other way. Once you make the pass, they're usually done. Ash Gentle didn't just make that pass, she made the pass and she pushed and she just turned her head back and had a look. That's a sign she definitely put in a surge and you saw it. That's 25, 30 minutes already. Of course, as the series goes on, it's, it's one thing, you know, Ash Gently, Gentle is still trying to close the gap. She's missing a race. She, you know, uh, Lucy Charles Barkley has got two races in the scoreboard right now, as it stands. And um, she will get 28 points times two, so she'll be on 56 points. Whereas Ash Gentle would get 35 points. This is as it stands right now. Uh, a little look over, but I think as the day stands, she can't believe... At 4K to go, she's leading this race, and she is within herself. I'm actually I, I surprised that she is. She's. That's twice now we've seen Ash Gentle look over his shoulder, and I'm quite surprised that she's doing that because it is. It is abundantly obvious that she is running so much faster than Lucy Charles Barclay. You'd think that once she passed her, that would be it. No looking back, just looking forward. But you know, Ash is. It, she's such a professional. She knows she still has 3.9 kilometres to go, and like you said, Jan. Sometimes cramps appear from nowhere, and even though Ash is looking fantastic, she's not laboured, she's still beautiful and relaxed in the shoulders, great turnover. Sometimes things happen that are just out of your control. Sneaky little look in the mirrored <laughs> glass over there. Yep, looking good out oh, on good. my Saturday stroll. Uh, I don't think it's quite as, as controlled, but I mean, it is a beautiful feeling when you're leading one of the world's toughest races. You know there is a high high caliber of ladies here you know before the t100 series we would see this kind of race maybe once, once a year, a year. Yep. at best yep. and right now we've got this on a regular notice and she's out there she's leading and it, it's beautiful i mean that's poetry that, that that is sport you know that feeling of when you're out there and you're dominating a race um i hope she doesn't take it for granted you know i can tell you those days become rarer eventually and this is why Ash just seems to have found her place in this series, her zone of being in a happy place to perform on a world-class level over and over again. And Singapore is becoming such a happy hunting ground for her. So she obviously won last year at the, the debut PTO Singapore Open, Asian Open. 
she won that in such a different way. She led into T2. She had a minute and eight seconds lead uh, over Arne Haug into T2. She had a, uh, a, a big lead in, uh, over Lucy Charles Barclay into T2 last year and then ran away and, and won the race. This year, she had a deficit of five minutes and 30 seconds into T2, and we've seen her establish herself at the front of the race with all but almost five kilometers to go. As we see the next pass, Els Visser has finally caught Lucy back at Buckingham. But as we say, you know, this is a situation, everybody here is winning in this shot. Everybody is still going to be ecstatic over it. I think Els Visser getting a podium is, is absolutely huge if that remains that way. Lucy Buckingham, of course, you know, she's at this stage probably got 5k left to go. So she's still got to bring it home. But she's having the race of a lifetime. And, you know, that's that's what's coming together here in this series. You see athletes specialising for this kind of distance and, uh, and others not so much. Well, saying that, I mean, Els Visa, obviously, yes, very, very, as she takes now onto the podium, so she has overtaken Lucy Buckingham into third place, so that final spot on the podium. But if you if you ask me, I would I would say that Els Visa's, she's better over the full distance racing. That is what she's renowned for. But to see her racing so well over this distance, uh, incredible. She definitely is better over that long distance. But interestingly enough for Els Visser, this is the first of three races that she is doing back to back to back. So after here, she is heading to the Philippines and then the weekend after that to Taiwan. So she has got three middle distance races to do. So it'll be very interesting to see how she uh, can back it up. But she's getting the good one, the big one, uh, out of the way first of all. And a podium here today would definitely, definitely the best race that she's ever done over this distance. But speaking of that, uh I don't know how you guys feel, but I think Ash Gentle here putting in such a statement, is that not a testament to the fact that perhaps nobody can any longer afford to not specialize on the T100 distance? Because everyone else here in the mix is kind of going between Ironman and this race and that race, and they might try to do this. And we've seen a five and a half minute deficit be crushed within 14 k's of running how does that make you feel do you, do you want my own personal opinion here i'm going to give it to you anyway whether you want it or not i think ash gentle saw what taylor nib did last week and i think she's she's making a point here she's trying to say you know what because we know taylor nib is going to be part of this series as well as once the olympics are done and taylor nib is a real threat to ash winning the the series this year we know it and i think ash is putting a statement out there to say yeah yeah i know taylor nib's good she crushed the field last week, but you know what? I can do the same, and I'm going to show you all today. And so I think she's really putting out a statement. I agree with you. I think you really need to do well at this. You need to specialise at this distance. But I also think that there's a little statement there made from Ash uh, about the series, because at the end of the day, Ash wants to win this series. She's made it abundantly clear to, to me and to others that this is her series, and she wants to win it. Well, we saw Taylor Nib win by 15 minutes only a week ago against Paula Finlay and Emma Pallant-Brown, two T100 contracted athletes and two of the top five or six contracted T100 athletes in the world. She beat them by 15 minutes. Ash Gentle wasn't there. Ash Gentle was watching at home, knowing that she had Singapore in a week, knowing that Taylor Nib wasn't going to be there. There's no way she didn't see that. Taylor Nib and Ash Gentle, they are, everyone knows it. They're one and two. They're the big rivals. Lucy Charles Barclay's fighting for that. India Lee's fighting for that. Arn Hag's fighting for that. But Ash Gentle and Taylor Nib, they watch each other. They know, they know what the other person does. They know how the other person's going. They know they're each other's biggest competition. Ash Gentle's been saying to people, you told me this, Belinda, that she needs to get wins on the board before Taylor Nib gets here because she considers her her closest competition. And with five and a half minutes off the bike to, to Lucy Charles Barclay, she cemented herself as probably the best athlete racing in the T100 series right now as it stands. Can Taylor Nib come and, and you know, compete with her later in the year? Maybe, but right now Ash has the runs more, on the more, board more, more. based on today. And of course you have to remember that the grand final is going to be over Again, points and a half. So there's 55 points up for grab, which is 20 more than right here. So in terms of creating a difference, it's going to be significant and you know, it, it really does make for a nail bite. I mean, we're, we're two races in and already discussing, kind of <laughs> philosophizing <laughs> yeah, about what might happen. That's but, right. that, but that's the beauty of, of having a connected series, something that we've never seen in the sport. The true, you know, kind of renovation of the sport, if you want, is that, 
yeah, there is just a whole new element that we haven't seen before and that these athletes are also going to have to collect some kind of experience over uh, in, see, in terms of the next few years as to how they place themselves and where. And with two kilometres to go, Ash has extended that lead to 41 seconds over Lucy Charles. So she didn't just slow down once she made the surge and, and, and make the decisive move. She's extending that gap quite crazily. Hal's Visser, she's holding third place. Lucy Buckingham now, I guess, in a battle with Amelia Watkinson and Anne Reichman to see if she can hold on to fourth. But Hal's Visser, what a, what a performance. And did you see that? Amelia Watkinson just overtaking Anne Reichman. Amelia is really flying through this field. I knew that these conditions would suit her. She's been training, training at home in Noosa where it's been incredibly hot and humid. We've had a lot of rain. So I think for sure Amelia Watkinson can make her way up into that top four. Radka Karlefeld being the other big mover in the field, coming up four spots. Um, let's see if she can work her way to the top ten. And just based off what you were saying there, Jan, about Radka Karlefeld, and then what you were saying about Amelia Watkinson, Belinda, I mean, the Australians, we have a, a couple of good athletes, you know, Ash Gentle being one of the best in the world, but it just does show that conditions really do play a big factor in races because Amelia Watkinson, she's not going to come fifth in, in every race she does. There's some conditions that don't suit her, but this, this, this place here at Singapore, it's so close to home that it suits her. She came, I think, sixth year last year. She's now moved up into fifth. Ash won last year. She's now won again this year. We saw the Great Brits last, last uh, time out at, at Miami where it was a bit cooler to be able to hold on, but then maybe suffer a little bit more today when the conditions got hot. The diversity of the T100 tour, it really is important and it does give a lot of different athletes from a lot of different places around the globe chances to shine. And just, just to, Amelia Watkinson is actually from New Zealand, we do know that, but she does reside in Australia, in Noosa, and has been living there for quite a few years, so we have taken her on as one of our I, own. I asked her the <laughs> other day, it was a few weeks ago now, maybe a couple of months ago, whether she considers herself Australian or New Zealand, and she was actually sheepish and didn't she give needed me to, an answer. She had needed to think about it didn't for a little give while. Me an answer, I love so it. I, I took that to mean that she now considers herself Australian. There we go, as we see another close-up in this case of Ash Gentle's calves. Um, funny enough, we saw the one of El's Visser early before, and you know it had number 17 tattooed on them. And one of the things that we always used to have, especially in the junior ranks as an athlete, when you start making it, was the thing of beating your number. Right? You have a decent <laughs> race if you beat your number, because your number is according to your ranking of where you are seated in the overall. Um, Ash Gentle obviously not being seated, not having a result on the boards yet. But uh, Els Visser certainly smashing her ranking by a podium finish coming in here. Yeah, not too far off the final few kilometers. As I think just then it looked like Ash Gentle for the first time eased up a bit. She looked over her shoulder and I feel like... Couldn't see anyone. That little kicker, yep. she took a little bit less aggressively than she has been. Yeah, it was like Lucy Byram passed on the other side and it was like she sort of had a quick look over, oh, who was that actually? And turned around, had a look, and oh, I mean, you hate to say it, but it does look like Jan, yeah, she has eased off and is not taking it easy, but enjoying this last little bit. It's it's a brutal thing to push onto the finish line at that threshold that you talked about, Jan, of right to the point where you're going to pass out and just drop it off a little bit. She clearly did that to catch Lucy Charles. She went above that, where if she had have held that pace where she surged past, past Lucy Charles Barclay, she would have passed out. And then once she's established herself in the lead, it does look like she's eased off and maybe in her, in her own head is soaking in this, this last K and a half of the run. And as she deserves to, I mean, at the end of the day, it's who crosses the line in first place. She's not getting extra points for winning by a certain margin. She just needs to cross in first place to get those 35 points. So she's not going to do anything silly now. She's just going to keep it nice and controlled. She knows she's got no pressure from behind right now. So why do something that you don't need to do? You can see she's still taking on plenty of nutrition through the aid station. Especially considering that she's going to San Fran. That's not that far away, only, uh, oh yes, yeah, very close really. Not, not, not far enough away that you can put in another big dedicated block, taper off into it. So any energy that you can save, you're gonna do it. So Absolutely. that you can get back into training a little bit earlier and come into that next race in the T100 Tour. As we saw Josh ahead. leaning over the fence again and he was shaking his head, uh, telling her to back off. I, I think that, I mean, I can't read lips, but it definitely looked like he was telling her to back off because you do want to make sure 
that you can start your recovery, it just does help. You know, you're getting on a long haul flight again, and these bodies are finely tuned machines. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, uh, despite you know backing off or not, the next day you're going to be walking with a bit of a limp. A little, you know, little, little bit of a limp, just to you remind you sore, what you did the day before. In, yeah, exactly. Especially in these conditions, mm. because um, it's just hot. You lose a lot of salt. They've got ice baths provided for the athletes to cool down straight afterwards. But you know, it's um, it's it, it's not easy on the body. And despite her being in control right here, I think she's going to be sore. Uh, rightfully so, because I mean that's that's the beauty. That's There's kind of Joshy. what you get to carry. See, Joshy oh. just gave her a little high five there. Big he's smile on his face. He's moving very quickly. <laughs> he's moving well around the course. Someone he's needs figured to tell it out by now. He's got a race to do tomorrow, but yeah, he, he he as I said, he's a number one fan. He would be very excited. A real trademark of this Singapore course is the crowds. Last year oh, there was big incredible. crowds here, and you can see it. There is a huge crowd here, even compared to last the last race we did at the T100 Tour. Maybe maybe people are hearing the news that, that you know, the T100 Tour is growing. Come along and watch. Well, we saw some of the up-and-coming athletes, the development athletes yesterday that came around the course here, and they said how it's just picking up popularity in Singapore. Of course, a huge expat community living here, but also a lot of the local community discovering triathlon, and that's actually one of the reasons I brought my bike, is to discover the local area, because you see a lot more on the bike. They're great conditions. They've got fantastic pools, bike lanes, um, and, and running tracks all around here. So, surprisingly enough, Sing Singapore delivers on, on, on many levels. Well, I've been coming to Singapore way back, and we're talking way back now, my friends, when I was a triathlete, and uh, yeah, I've been coming back back to Singapore ever since but I've done a lot of training here in the past but what I've loved about this year with the race with the athletes and and you know big thanks to PTO the community engagement that the athletes have had uh, with school kids there's been school visits there's been triathlon club visits uh, all of these athletes you know we look at the athletes now and we we expect them to be at their best but they've had a, a full commitment this week visiting schools uh, and local tri clubs I know quite a few of the riders went out with the Anzac uh, riding club and they took them around but yeah, it, it's been incredible to watch and I, I love it when the athletes give back because at the end of the day we are shutting down a major city for a good chunk of the weekend and so great to see that in commu that community engagement take place this year almost a little look of disbelief uh, she looks like she's she's tearing up right there I mean you know you play it like the cool cats and conf confident and all these things but it's emotional absolutely it's emotional and right now, this is a beautiful moment. As the smile hits her face, she, she's on the finishing straight. Ashley Dental, a two-time PTO Open champion. Her debut T100 World Tour race. As she gives some high fives, tears up, crosses the line. Her Be first ever T100 World Tour Series victory. Five minutes, 30 seconds down Woo! out of T2. She's done it. And what a smile. You know, you were right. Right before, I think, when it just hit, you did see that wave of emotion come over Jan, and there were, there were almost tears. But then when she came into that finish shoot, when she saw that tape, high-fiving the crowd on the way down, and that big, beautiful smile of hers. And I'll tell you what, that's probably one of the most uh, preferred bottles of water she's ever had. Uh, this is beautiful stuff, honestly. It, what an athletic performance, closing that gap. I honestly, I had my doubts, but... Uh, very, very impressed. She just wants to open that suit, get the ice water in. She's definitely going to be looking for any of those ice taps that they've put up specifically for the athletes here just because the conditions are that extreme. And what a performance by our reigning champion. The conditions were brutal out there today. 109.10, 3.51 per K average pace for Ash Gentle by T100 World Tour standards. That's not that fast, but compared to everyone else there today, that was flying, and that speaks to the crazy, brutal conditions here at Singapore. Lucy Charles Barclay approaching the finish line now. Ah, oh, Jack, what does this woman have to do to get first place at one of these races? Second, again, she was second in Miami. She's going to be second here today, high-fiving the crowd as she makes her way towards the finish line. Still a fantastic race from Lucy Charles Barclay, but she just wasn't fast enough on that run with the fleet-footed Ash Gentle. Grateful for every supporter that's out there to come and cheer her on. I mean, she is definitely one of the crowd favorites, but I can tell you what, she will be happy to finish this race and get that hug. Second at Miami, 
second here at Singapore. Two races in the T100 World Tour, two second places. By anyone's standards, that's as good as it gets. But for Lucy Charles Barclay, no doubt she crossed that line with a mixture of happiness, relief, but also a little bit of wanting more. Oh, look, as we said earlier, these are the, these are the best women triathletes in the world. They are the greatest that we have right now. And so, of course, all of these women, you know, they, they're going to win. And second place, brilliant result. But, yeah, absolutely she wants first. And she'll be going back, talking to the team, what do I need to do? But Ash Gentle, she is such a class act. Incredible run. She never looked flustered. Obviously, coming into T2, she would have known what that split was, Jack. I wonder if she thought, is it possible? Can I do this? But she just went, went about a business like an absolute pro. And... I didn't think she'd catch her that quickly, to be honest. I thought it would take the entire three laps. And to, so to do it as quickly as she did, but two incredible women, women right now on this finish line. One minute and 34 seconds she ended up winning by. Ash Gentle, one minute and 34 seconds ahead of Lucy Charles Barclay. That's seven minutes faster than she ran. 109.10 for Ashley Gentle, 116.18 for Lucy Charles Barclay. That is... That is as good as it gets by Ash Gentle and a brave, courageous race from Lucy, Lucy Charles Barclay. Off the front all day, she's the one who set the pace on the swim. She set the pace on the bike with Lucy Buckingham. Ash Gentle raced her own race. She found her swim group. She rode with that, that group of four, often pushing the pace, uh, sitting in no man's land, and then used her weapon on the run to, to win today at Singapore. That is, that is just a special performance by Ash Gentle and a, and a brave, typical Lucy Charles Barclay performance for second. And here we have Els Visa on screen right now, coming in to take that final spot on the podium. Brilliant racing from Els today. She reigns from the Netherlands. She's spent quite a bit of time in New Zealand earlier this year. She won at Challenge Wanaka, second at Ironman New Zealand. She then flew across to be with her coach in China where she's been training and prepping for this race but she will be extremely happy taking that final spot on the podium today. It's a little bit dark, it's a little bit out overcast out there. The humidity is still high. On the TV, you can't quite see just how brutal the conditions are out there. Als Visser, even though she probably thinks she has third pace locked up, she wouldn't be 100% certain the conditions are so hard. The race has been going on for nearly four hours. In, in your head at that time, nothing's a certainty. So she's not running like we are now. We're seeing Ash Gentle winning, Lucy Charles Barclay coming second, and we're just waiting for Al's Visser to come in, in third. She's not thinking like that, though, Belinda. No, she's not. You, you, you've nailed it, Jack. That's exactly right. You, you don't. I've been in this position many times in this heat and humidity. You are almost beside yourself and you just want to see that finish tape and she will not relax. You even saw her just before, that, that little shot of her taking a look over her shoulder just because she cannot be sure if someone's coming. And your brain does start to play tricks on you. When you're racing in this sort of conditions, your brain really starts to, you start to doubt what you think you know. So she'll be very, very happy once she hits that blue carpet. You can be told you have three minutes with a K to go and your brain doesn't process it like it does if you're watching the race. You literally still convince yourself there's ways you can lose the race and you push a little bit more than you have to and then you cross the line and you see that someone's three minutes behind you and they come in three minutes later and you look back and you're like, oh, that was a bit silly. But in the in the moment, no, you literally can... You don't trust it. You, you don't really trust don't. it and you just, you're just not thinking straight because of how hard you're working. And yeah, that's exactly what is going through Al's, Al's Visser's brain right now as we watch her. As you see, she gives another look back. She gives the look back because she's not confident that someone's not going to run up and sneak up behind her and take the place. And, and you, you sort of just tell yourself that you've got to push on and, and, and really cement the, the victory uh, or the podium. Uh, uh, that's what she's thinking in her head as she takes the sunglasses off. <laughs> I love that look, that tongue out, like, oh, one last look and look at the smile. Sunglasses come up, big smile on her face. She's like, oh, my gosh, I have done this. I am going to make it onto the podium. Almost disbelief a little bit as well. It's like this crazy, like, oh, my God, how have I done this? Is this real happiness, disbelief? Yeah, it, it, there's, there's a whole range of emotions going through Al's Visser's head. And again, she gives another look back. Just She's literally just making sure, like, wait, is this real? Have I actually come third here today? And 
that last little look back before she, she gives now the crowd she a high five. It's all about getting on that blue carpet, Jack. Once you're on that blue carpet, you almost know you're, you're at home and hosed, you're safe. But look, talking to her coach, she's been so incredibly consistent with her training over the last few years. And like you said, she's really worked on her run. And it, it, it absolutely showed today. Al's Visa, never been on a PTO podium before. Here we are at Singapore, to podium at the T100. This is a special, special day for Al's Visa. Uh, she probably can't believe it. A lot of people probably can't believe it, but that is an almighty performance and yeah. Oh, incredible. and look at that right behind and what a race. Lucy Buckingham. Oh, and we've got someone in front. We've got, oh, it's Amelia Watkinson. So she did get her. So we knew that Amelia was closer. That is Amelia Watkinson now has just managed to overtake Lucy Buckingham. We knew that Amelia Watkinson was coming through. We last saw her, she was in fifth. So coming home to take fourth and Lucy Buckingham now home in fifth. Wow. <laughs> this is what we expect to see, this sort of racing. Here's the thing. Third for Al's Visser, brilliant performance. Fourth for Amelia Watkinson, brilliant, brilliant performance. performance. Fifth for Lucy Buckingham, brilliant performances. Lucy, Al's and Amelia would all be so stoked with their races today. Well, you can see it on the finish line now. Look at them. Look at the smiles tell the story. They paint, it, paint the picture perfectly. Incredible racing. But that Amelia Watkinson on screen right now, that was a sensational run from her. And Lucy Charles Barclay would be happy with second, just like she was at Miami. She really would. She's building into her season, but she expects so much of herself that of everyone who's crossed the line so far, there's been five. She's probably the only one feeling any disappointment. I would say Amelia Watkinson, uh, Al's Visser and Lucy Buckingham all are just feeling happy and excited. And same with Anne Reichman. Sixth for Anne Reichman today. Just another athlete who has outperformed what a lot of people would have expected them to, potentially even what she would have expected herself to do in one of her, her lifetime performances well, for when her. You, when you think about where Anne Reichman was out of the water and where she is now finishing. Incredible. Unreal. Known for her bike riding. Today, Anne Reichman's run has shown that she's been working on it, the heat training's been working, and she's been strong all day. Six for Anne Reichman at the T100 Singapore. Incredible result. Just look at the results. We've got Ash Gentle with a world ranking of two, Lucy Charles Barclay with a world ranking of three, Els Visa with a world ranking of 35, Lucy Buckingham, 40. Amazing. Well, as the stars come home, we have got the two top steppers alongside Ashley and Lucy. I'm going to say many, many congratulations to you both, but with a, a dash of commiserations as well. I think the grimace says it all, but I'm going to come to you first of all. Welcome back to Singapore and back to back in Singapore. Another quiet day at the office. How was that? That was like one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It was a brutal day. It was like, yeah, it was ridiculously hard. Lucy was amazing and made it really difficult for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that run. I mean, did, did you know that that was in there or have you surprised even yourself with, with the way you've performed today? I've definitely surprised myself. Uh, I'm really not very confident. Well, most of the time, but especially at the start of the year. And there was parts of those races. I was like, maybe I should have done a race before this one because this is so brutal. But yeah. no, I um, yeah, I just tried to really stay focused. There was a few times there where I was just really, yeah, losing focus a lot and mentally had to bring myself back and, yeah, just fight um, to the very end. Uh, you looked happy all week. Like, genuinely, when I saw you around, you seemed like you were interacting. You seemed like you were in a good spot. Is that how you feel, like, over the last few weeks? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the last couple of years have probably been the most enjoyable um, of my career. And, yeah, I've been really loving these T100 series races and um, I really you know enjoy hanging out with all of the ladies and the men I think there's some really good camaraderie uh, between all of us and I think that makes a really big difference and yeah I'm loving triathlon more than I ever have um, not so much a few times during that race but just in general <laughs> it's yeah it's been amazing good camaraderie brilliant rivalry as well is it congratulations is it commiserations for you today Lucy how are you feeling off the back of that immediately yeah, I mean, I played my cards and uh, came out with second today. I think it's bittersweet being at the front all that time, but I, I felt really strong and I think I just want to build each race. I definitely felt miles better than Miami. So, 
Yeah, Ashley had me running scared though. I, I knew she was coming. She's so strong on that run. And yeah, like I said, I, I had to really push it on that bike to see what I could do. And it wasn't quite enough today, but it's definitely motivation for the next one. How did it feel going with Lucy Buckingham today? I mean, it's seldom that we see someone hold on to you at all. For a while there, when she came around, it looked like you were able to build good pace. Um, how was that? I mean, it's a new experience for you. Yeah, it's really nice. I think it's great to have a fellow Brit as well that's super strong on the bike so we could just push that pace. And as we saw the gaps getting bigger, I think it's super motivating. So, yeah, it was nice to have someone else. Normally, I'm a bit lonely when I race. So, yeah, really nice to have Lucy to ride with. Your coach, Evan, said, I think with about, I saw your, your manager, Evan, said with, I think about 8K to go, he said he's really, really proud of your performance today. How long does it take for the disappointment to, to wash out of the system and actually recognise that as far as the start of the series has gone, two second places is beginning to build quite nicely for you? Yeah, it's not bad. It's some good points on the board. But like I said, it's definitely motivation to go away and work now and definitely know what I need to work on to come back stronger for the next one. Yeah. And what about your confidence levels off the back of that run? To take five and a half minutes out. Come on in, Els. Well done to you. Um, big smile. But just to a quick word about your confidence levels now, when you can be in the scenario you were and find your way to it. I mean, you're beginning to see in the way that you're talking in the media, just a little bit more comfortable being the hunted, not, not just the hunter. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know. This week has been interesting. I'm not really sure I enjoy being... Uh, you play the role better, though, than you used to. Yeah, yeah. I guess coming here, I had there was a lot of expectation um, after winning last year. And, yeah, I just wasn't so sure how I would do. But um, I think that's part of the game. That's part of being a professional athlete. You have to lay it all out there and um, take the good with the bad. And I'm just really... Yeah, I feel very happy that I was able to put a really strong performance together today and come out with the win, but I also feel like I've got so much more to give. So I guess once I recover from this one, it'll be exciting to look ahead. Else, well done. is this the race of your lifetime? I mean, honestly, I was we were shouting for you. I mean, this is a real breakthrough, but amazing performance today. How do you feel? Yeah, I think I surprised myself and I surprised all the others as well. And for me, it's just kind of a dream to be on the podium with Lucy and as you know, it's yeah, just a dream to be on the podium with them and I never expected to finish podium. Um, my coach, he told me that if I had a good day, I was able to finish top 10 and I was already, I finished last in the, the European Open last year, I finished last here in Singapore last year. But I really like keep working hard, you know, and I know that my swim is not the strongest, but Sam Long and Lionel Sanders have been like so inspirational to me because they really showed me that you can still do super well even if you swim swim shit, you know. And I'm not a good swimmer, I know, but I just accept it. I move on, focus on myself. I try to like ride super hard and gave my all and just the whole run on the run and I made it. So yeah, I'm super proud. <laughs> Beautiful. That is, uh, I think, the best way to celebrate a podium ever. You've got me all emotional. So good for you. <laughs> the athlete is still coming out. And well done to the three of you. Utterly inspirational, remarkable performance today. We'll let you go and get ready for the uh, ceremony. Well done, Lucy. Well done, Els. Well done, Ash. Congratulations to three. We'll let you step out, grab some water and keep your uh, recovery going. Absolutely remarkable. I'm going to let everyone at home just into a little trade secret, which is when you came and you grabbed your microphone, I said, what did you make of that? And it, uh, we'll, we'll use the family version of what you said along the lines of Holy <laughs> Moses. Just sum that race up for us. Given where we were sort of three, four hours before the race, day, we weren't quite sure whether we were going to get the conditions to allow the athletes to go for it. And yet we haven't had a drop of rain. We've had some remarkable racing today, haven't we? I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And even the athletes didn't know how close it was. You know, we were within 0.1 degree of the, of the swim being changed. We were two Ks away from uh, lightning shutting down the race and all these things going on in the background, which you never appreciate as an athlete. But of course, being out here, you know, you really cross your fingers that everything comes together because there's a lot of logistics that goes into this. And these ladies, you know, they, they prepare their life uh, around this series. And it's, it's wonderful to see it all come together, even more so when you know how close it was. Let's have a little look at Ashley Gentle's day. It's been absolutely remarkable. Great to have her back here in Singapore, but obviously back doing what she does best and from the beat of bang as well in terms of her season. Just, just give us a little summation of her performance today and the way it's come together for her. Yeah, I mean, it was remarkable. You know, we were wondering after the swim, the, the gap was large. On the bike, she looked to be aggressive early, then lost a little bit of time, actually being attacked by Els. Um, and then she started running and it was like, she just left no doubt. I mean, the way she was collecting these ladies, she was running, you know, 20 seconds per kilometer faster than anyone else on the field. It's absolutely remarkable how she's put it together, the cool, 
calm headed victory that makes her the champion she is. Yeah. And they talk about the marathon, not a sprint. I mean, the levels of sympathy for Lucy, you've done 96, 97K of really good work today, and yet you don't come out with what I imagine she is so desperate for now, which is that, that top step. Yeah, absolutely. I felt like I was being a person split in half. Literally, you know, I was crying for Lucy yeah. and I was absolutely over the moon for Ash. That's the beauty and the brutalness of sport. But you have to say Ash Gentle is dedicating herself to this series and she's being rewarded for it. You know, Lucy's playing a double edged sword. She's still going for Ironman World Championships. She's going for other races. And, you know, the series is young. It's new. But we have eight races plus the grand final. And people who are dedicating themselves will see a benefit because it's a specific kind of racing. It's the ultimate mix of speed and endurance, as we've said many times. But that's what's needed right here to be a champion. And Ash Gentle is the one doing it the yeah. best at the moment. As far as Lucy is concerned, she's had some fabulous days in her career and she will again. Absolutely. But how big an itch do you think it's becoming for her? Just not quite being able to get herself over the, the finish line in first. Well, unfortunately, that is a little bit the stigma that's attached to her career, isn't it? That she is the bridesmaid. And it's, it's so hard because second place means you are the second best in the world right now. I mean, that's an amazing performance in itself. But champions get rewarded, champions get remembered. And, you know, she is an Ironman world champion. Let's not forget that. That is absolutely wonderful and it is, you know, a relief. But she's also come second five times. And, you know, with the PTO, it's starting to be a bit of a yeah. theme. When can she break the tape? And mentally, I can attest to the fact that making that step from second to first is probably the hardest adjustment I've had to make personally, because it just allows room for no error. Also, and, in your and preparation. What was, the, what was the difference for you? How did you make that leap? What was the change? For me personally, the leap was trying to forget about everyone else. Right. The leap was focusing on my own race, which arguably you could say Lucy is doing. You know, how, how else can you focus on your own race except the way she's doing? I mean, she's taking it by the scruff of the neck every single time. But there are obviously some adjustments she might have to make in her preparations. I mean, five and a half minutes, I, I, I honestly, I, I, I couldn't see it happen. I, I did not see that being in danger. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly you know, a strong sign of force by Ash Gentle here. What else today has caught your eye and, and impressed you or perhaps given you a little sort of, I suppose, the other end of the spectrum? Lucy Buckingham, let's be honest. You know, this is a, a breakthrough performance for her in terms of what she's done. She's won races across, but not of this caliber. I mean, we never used to see these kind of races. This is, used to be a, a rare occurrence, what yeah. we have every few weeks now. And to see her doing that well, Fantastic. Good stuff. We'll pick up with you in just a moment or two. But as you can see, the medal ceremony is ready. And let's hand you over now for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the medal ceremony of the 2024 T100 Singapore. Presenting medals and gifts today will be Mr. Eric Schwab, Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Community, Culture and Youth, Ministry of Social and Family Development and Miss Ong Ling Lee, Executive Director, Sports and Wellness, Singapore Tourism Board and Mr. Roy Tiap, Chief Industry Development, Technology and Innovation, Sport Singapore. Presenting champagne today will be Sam Renu, Chief Executive Officer, Professional Triathletes Organisation. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal, representing the Netherlands, Els Visser. In second place, and the winner of the silver medal, representing Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barclay. In first place, and the winner, and the gold medal in 2024, T100 Singapore, representing Australia, 
Ashley Gentle. for our athlete celebration. Congratulations to all the winners of the 2024 T100 Singapore! Well, fabulous scenes and fabulous and deserving smiles for those three alongside as well. The champagne moment here in Singapore for the women's T100. You want to make a point. You're very used to moments oh, like that, right. the what champagne. What are we, we going to pull Singapore out of that? They, they never get old, but I mean, today. they say it's the Swedish champagne that, that you'll ever taste. But the reality of this is, is that the champagne is warm. And right. the other thing is, champagne burns in your eyes very, very badly. And the way these ladies were spraying each other, you know, they just endured so much pain over the last four hours. And they just inflicted probably the worst of it. <laughs> right there at the champagne ceremony. Poor old Ashley almost had to be winched onto top step as well. Just confirmation then of a fabulous day of racing here in Singapore. And of course, we'll do it all over again tomorrow. But Ashley Gentle uh, with that quite remarkable run that takes her to top spot back to back here in Singapore. Lucy Charles Barkley with a heroic performance, but unfortunately not quite able to get her first T100 victory, but the fastest swim of the day and strong on the bike as well. And Els Visser all smiles as she crossed and she rounds off that podium. Just to finish then on, on Ashley Gentle, it's interesting how we were talking before the race about the fact that she's beginning to stand a bit stronger in those media interviews and yet afterwards she's like, crikey, I'm having to act it. But uh, just a remarkable performance from her today and as you said, specialising is beginning to, to, to give the rewards here. Absolutely, the T100 series is young, it's new, we are in the second race of the series and definitely it's, um, it, it's something that's paying off for her. Good stuff. Jan, thank you very much indeed. We'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. We are back bright and early, of course, with the men's race as well, hoping to be joined by Magnus Diplev, who won't be racing, will hopefully be in studio. We shall see you tomorrow. But Ash is back in Singapore and goes back to back. Bye-bye. <laughs>